all the way through the season. We're live on RS1, and my name's Johnny Palmer. Delighted to be joined, uh, as so often, by Bruce Jones. And it's not just you and I, Bruce, who've uh, caught sight of this championship going to be a highlight of the year because the grid is absolutely packed full of fans. Let's, let's start the year by exaggerating. It's a cast of thousands, but uh, the lights were green, the cars are starting to come out. The grid is absolutely chock-a-block. Um, but this is... Uh, Double duty, this weekend, two races. Next weekend, it's the qualifying races for the Nürburgring 24 hours. So a lot of people will sort of have their caravan down. They'll stay in between. The teams are often based just across the road in across the road in, in Moyes Path. But uh, next weekend, super, super busy. We'll come shortly to how people have... It's a different route now to get your ring permit made more simple. But that's important because the Intercontinental GT Challenge, the Nürburgring 24 hours for the first time, is a round of that. But we yeah. can talk about that through the course of the race, but it's onwards and upwards, and to start in spring sunshine, fabulous. Well, the good news is we've got just under 45 minutes of talking time before we get going at midday on the dot for a four-hour race. And if you're in a GT3 car, of which we have plenty, then you're looking at probably a 27 or 28-lap race with, when, once we get going, eight-lap stints, although the first one, awkwardly, is seven because, of course, the formation lap is so long around here. Uh, it's the 64th edition of the ADAC ACAS Cup. And also we should mention that normally these are Saturday races, have been predominantly in previous years, but this is a double weekend. So not only a four-hour race today, but also, once again live on the Radio Show Limited Network of Channels, a four-hour race to look forward to tomorrow. Again, beginning at midday all the way through till four o'clock. And it's a job just to get the cars away from their Chevron formation on the pit lane uh, apron out into the fast lane because some, some of the cars struggling with the amount of turning circle they actually have to steer safely around the fans. Qualifying happening earlier on this morning as well with hopefully 114 starters for this opening race. Tomorrow's event, by the way, is uh, the is the, I've lost my bit of paper now for tomorrow's title of the race. What's that called? Oh yeah, the 63rd ADAC Ryan Aldous Langstrecken and Renan. Typically it was the sheet of paper I was holding. I just couldn't find the relevant bit. <laughs> it's like uh, people looking for their sunglasses they are on top of their head. Precisely. But uh, delighted that uh, so many of the organising clubs are once again involved in the 2024 season. And you can't really afford to have a trying weekend this time around because, you know, a, te a technical problem or, heaven forbid, a crash today could obviously massively dent the potential for running well tomorrow and indeed qualifying for the 24-hour race later on in the year. So, as I said, qualifying for this race today, happening earlier on. Great that we've got a Glickenhaus 004 in action this weekend as well in its baby blue. We'll delve into that and potential driver lineups for the N24 later on. The number seven Lamborghini Huracan was out bright and early qualifying as well with uh, Danny Sufi and Torsten Kratz as its drivers for Conrad Motorsport. But Mercedes certainly having a strong showing as far as the HRT entry is concerned with Danny Junkadea and his teammate Frank Bird. We've got a Grello Manti Porsche in action as well for Laurence Vantor and Kevin Est. So they've really turned out the, the big guns as far as that's concerned and important for them to qualify well. And Falcon Motorsport here with a couple of cars, Alessio Picariello and Martin Ragginger. There's a second Lamborghini Huracan in the Red Bull colours, and that is the Red Bull team apt crew of Kelvin van der Linde and Jordan Pepper, who will start from third position on the grid with the Audi R8 LMS GT3. Now, Share Sport have announced some big names once again for the 24 hours of the Nürburgring, and I'm sure plenty of those will be in action next weekend for the qualifying race. But it is a Mercedes that took pole position. Remember, this isn't the full circuit that we'll be using for the 24 hours, so it's not the full Grand Prix Strecker. Instead, about half of it, and they go through the U-bend there, the cut through. So as a result, we are below the eight-minute times, 756.507 for car 14. That was a Danny Junkadea time. And alongside that Mercedes will start the Audi R8 LMS GT3 Share of Sport PHX. 
number 16 for Frank Stickler and Marcus Winkelhock. Then the Red Bull team, Lamborghini Huracan for Kelvin and Alinda and Jordan Pepper, alongside the first of the Porsches for Falcon Motorsports, Picariello and Raginger. They did an 802.0, two times beneath the eight minute marker, the other one being the Audi, which managed a 758.9. The third row, Porsche and Mercedes for Manti EMA and Lawrence Van Tor and Kevin Estra and Dennis Fetzer, Hubert Haupt and Rolf Aron in their Mercedes car number six. I'll just do the top 10 actually. So the Aston Martins number 69 for Dua Motorsport will start from seventh position for Darren Turner, Ben and Phil Dua. They're joined by another Aston GT3 car for Pro Sport Racing for Maxime Dumouray, uh, Simon Balkan and Marek Bockman. And then there's a sort of all Porsche uh, fourth, uh, fifth row, I should say, for the GT3R and also the leading GT3 Cup car. So Cup 2 will start in that lead pack for Falcon Motorsports, Joel Eriksson and Nico Menzel. And then Daniel Blickle, Tim Shearbart and David Yarn are clearly in a very quick number 120 Porsche Cup car. And Cup 2, Bruce, is always a highlight across the four hours. Always a highlight, always competitive, doesn't matter which point, how long the race is, there will be a scrap for the lead. But actually, you can become a bit accustomed when you come here and there's a race today. We had 117 cars entered, 114 uh, will be coming to play. But in fact, a couple didn't qualify. Can I just touch on that? But mm. just to say that the Cup 2 cars, sometimes we don't look at them enough, but some great names in there. And you mentioned David Yarn. He's been so quick across the last decade. I think with a bit of a push, he might get up into the, the very top class, but he's brilliant in Cup 2. Um, talk of qualifying, David Schumacher didn't qualify. Teichmann Racing, Audi R8 LMS GT4. Unfortunately, the reason he hasn't qualified that car, which is number 166, if you're looking at vln.de to check uh, the entry list, too fast for his current ring permit. So he's transferred across to... Um, a BMW M240i racing class because he's desperate to get the, the mileage that he needs to get the permit. I said earlier we'd talk about it. This year, it's been made simpler to get the permit you need to compete and trying to get ever more international crews, or more point, ever more international crews wanted to come over and compete in this and notably in a race that's not part of the championship, not part of the Nürbur ADAC Nürburgring Langstrecht and Siri but the ADAC 24 hours of Nürburgring. This year around the Intercontinental GT Challenge, previously drivers who didn't have a rig permit had to come and take part in several race weekends and behave in the, the correct fashion to get their ring permit. However, now they can come and do it all next weekend, get it done. There are three sessions and they need two good clean sessions and they will get the permit. That, those are the qualifying races and it really is qualifying. Qualifying to prove they're good enough to do it and qualifying, of course, uh, to go into the race uh, in midsummer. But a much simpler system. It's just really reacting to the market forces, I suggest, but a good one. And that's all about creating a successful championship. I suppose we, we say this a lot about the 24H series as well. It's dialogue, but it happens to happen in both directions. And if drivers and teams are unhappy about something, then there needs to be a platform where you take it to the organisers and say, what about this? And clearly, the Nürburgring Langstrecker series have thought about it, taken it on board and adjusted accordingly, which is great to see and great to hear. Well, well you know, why the clock back to um, in the early days of the pandemic and almost all motor racing was closing down, what the organising clubs involved with the NLS achieved was enormous because they enabled us to go racing again by a very, very clever tweak. Because of social distancing, it seems like the dark ages, it was only a couple of few years ago, but they decided let's lengthen the pit lane so the crews can be further apart. So we, you drive into the pit lane, you'd have to turn sharp right under the pit building as some of the, the, gar the sort of tire change areas were out of the back, then you'd snake back through into the pit lane. Same number of cars spread over a wider area, very clever. So it's it's the club sitting down and talking about things, thinking about things and reacting. And that's what you need in all forms of life. Just caught a sight of the Glickenhaus racing car, which is uh, making its way towards its starting position on the grid. Now, uh, the drivers involved today, Thomas Much, Frank Meyer and Lance David Arnold, but a certain Comb Ladegar has grabbed headlines recently. This is an SPX entry, remember? It's not eligible in the GT3 category. It's never been a GT3 car because there isn't a road going, well, I'll say that. They haven't made quite enough cars for it to be eligible in the global GT3 category. So it's SPX. It definitely competes on the same, for the same sort of times though. And Comb Ladegar for the 24 hour race is a big signing, Bruce. 
massive. You you look at Caden's record over the years, and he's got that um, ability to do things called winning championships. You know, lots of drivers can be there or thereabouts, and particularly in GT3 racing around the world, it's so competitive, so many entries. But if somehow you can still work your way to the top uh, and win titles in that, you're very good indeed. In fact, he was the uh, Intercontinental uh, GT Challenge champion back only in 2021. I think he was also the GT World Challenge Endurance champion and the Spa 24 winner. Not a bad year for him. Um, so just look out for him. But bit by bit, the news will come in. The other names that are being added to the teams that are going to come out in the 24 hours. But here we are today for the first of two races this weekend. 114 cars going out to play. Cracking field of cars but also the weather is good it's been sunshine it's bright blue sky at the moment a little bit of shadow among among the trees actually it's getting a little less sunny than it was at uh, early this morning when they went out qualifying but a good dry surface this is what all the teams and all the drivers need to get under their belt get the season launched get it launched well one name that uh, stands out for me because he he loves this circuit alex brundle he'll be racing in cup two and next weekend he'll be racing a gaggle of cars um, including as a special race, Ken Miles Cup for at the Goodwood members meeting. So he'll be out with the other 60-year-old Ford Mustangs, hating every <laughs> single second of it. <laughs> Uh, can I mention two other names that uh, will certainly draw our attention over the next four hours and probably for a number of them tomorrow as well? A certain Toyota FIA World Endurance Championship star and team principal of that initiative, Kamiri Kobayashi, but not in a GT3 car. No, you'd automatically think that, but um, there are a couple of uh, Toyota Gazoo racing Super Evo GT4s in the GT4 class, and he's driving that with a uh, fellow Japanese racer, racer uh, Kazuto uh, Kataka. It's car number 172, and Kataka has raced in um, that's Super GT in the mm. GT300. That's the secondary category. He was the Super Formula Light champion. You might go, Care? What's that? That's effectively their Formula 3 series back in 2022. And this year he's racing in Super Formula, the top single season series, and Super GT. So he's a person. But J Japanese drivers have always had a fascination. And in fact, in the sister car is another driver who competes a lot over there, Seita Nonaka. He's in 173. I've watched him over the last year racing in GT World Challenge Asia. And he's a very impressive driver. So the lure of the Nürburgring Nordschleife is still massive. But I just love the fact. I mean, it's a really hard season for Kamui Kobayashi, team principal, and in one of the two lead cars. Yeah. There are two cars in the World Endurance Championship. And if you haven't been paying attention, it is phenomenal this year. So he'll be here this weekend and then going off to play at Imola uh, coming up shortly. But I think it's fantastic. And Kamui is a driver who did a lot of his early racing in Germany. So, of course, you know, there's a certain tie there. Yep, so uh, arguably going back to his roots. Also, if you've not been paying attention to the World Endurance Championship so far, we've only had one race in fairness, but that was the 10 hours, or actually the 18, 12 kilometres of Qatar. And uh, Toyota really struggled in that, so they're certainly not going to have it all their own way this season uh, in the WEC. With uh, We're back to eight races for that championship as well. Uh, somebody else who has certainly flirted with WEC races, although is not a full season entry, is Jack Aitken as a... Cadillac works driver so again you know you would expect someone of his caliber to be slotting straight into the GT3 field no he's in a Hyundai uh, because he needs to get signatures in order to potentially race in the big one later on in the season so uh, yeah the Hyundai i30N from Falcon Horse Motorsport but you know, somebody who's into motorsport should arguably enjoy a GT3 car as much as one of these i30Ns. And it's on the best circuit in the world. So, yes, yeah, exactly. Too. Of course they should. But talking Hyundai, um, car number 831, just spotted it uh, moving in uh, past the pits. A couple of Canadian flags on the side windows there. And it's uh, Hyundai Elantra N. It's in TCR class. And it's Robert Wickens and sometime teammate Mark Wilkins. They've been doing fabulous things over the last few years. Uh, not always together, but uh, out of the same team. Brian Herter also sports uh, in the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge. And uh, Robert, of course, did a lot of his uh, racing over in Germany. Based five years in the DTM. Superstar in that one. Host of races. Um, great to have them there. So you have to look the whole way down the entry list. And when you print it out, it goes on page after page after page, which is how we like it. And sometimes it takes a second reading to pick up the ones you missed on the way through. And um, 
Ding, ring the bell. What stood out for me? Well, I tell you what, it was on the, actually the third reading I spotted. We've got a Dacia Logan all over yes. again. Of course, uh, the one we've been used to for years got uh, destroyed in last year's 24 hours, but uh, Dacia back in the pack. And if you're new to the Nürburgring Langstrecken series, we start in three different packs at the start of the race. They don't all set off together. The fastest cars go in the first group. There should be about just under 50 in that, 47, I think. Uh, the second group, intermediate pace cars, GP2, uh, sorry, not GP2, group two, 33 of those, and then 37 in the final group with a, an interval between all of them. What it does, of course, it keeps things safer rather than having 114 cars trying to get into the first turn uh, together. And it also gives uh, three different lead battles on that opening lap. So plenty to look out for. And there is a, obviously been a slight difference in the entry list today into tomorrow because there's slightly fewer cars. I haven't quite worked out who's missing yet, but certainly in previous double header weekends, one or two GT3 teams have dropped away and we never really got to the, uh, the bottom of those reasons. I mean, do you know? Have you checked? I have checked. Oh, I good man. Have... You must have done it side by side last night. This is way beyond the bounds of homework. I know, I know. Well, one of the lead cars today, the Shearer Sport PHX Audi, which is starting second, that's number 16, will not be here tomorrow. They might be watching, but they won't be competing. So Frank Stippler and uh, Marcus Finkelhock will be missing. And also the number 17, Pro Sport Racing Aston Martin, that is down only for today. And one of the drivers will be changing over in the number four Porsche from Falcon Motorsports tomorrow. Uh, Nick Mentz will step aside and Tim Heineman will step in. You can then go on down through the field and uh, quite a few others. But about six or seven are dropping out and a couple are coming in. But yeah. uh, it's still due to be, I think it's 107 on the entry list for tomorrow. It was 117 today. Looks so like we'll get away with 114 because a few dropped in, dropped out. And as I was saying earlier, David Schumacher was intending to go um, qualifying in the 166 entry from the SP10 class, which is a an Audi GT4. But that was uh, classed as too quick a car for his current uh, degree of uh, permit certification. Oh, what a mouthful that was. But anyhow, he, he is not missing the race. He's going to be in a, an M240i BMW, which has its own class. Uh, and that is always one worth watching. That will go in the second group of cars at the start of the race. The differences between between lap times as the fastest time set this morning is reasonable. You're talking very nearly two and a half seconds between the Mercedes that's on pole and the Audi that's on se in second position. But we should remember that this is a smidge over 24 kilometres, this racetrack in length, and it, ca it gets even longer next weekend for the qualifying event ahead of the Nürburgring 24 hours. And by the way, uh, both the qualifying weekend and the main race can be heard live right here again on the Radio Show Limited network of channels with the full service for the 24 hours. Much bigger team, of course, required for that to bring you uh, twice around the clock coverage. So, you know, 2.5 seconds, the gap first to second. There's then a five second gap uh, first to third. And it's about that first to fourth. But you really can read not, not too much into that because of the nature of this place. Sometimes a car will come across the line, let's say at the end of the first lap with maybe a five second lead. And by the end of the following lap, that's completely gone because they've, been, they've started to catch traffic. And also if we get some of those yellow flag areas slash code 120s, code 60s, that can be such an opportunity for the chasing car to gain back time. Yeah, in, in, Johnny, in many ways qualifying is only important to a certain degree. Yeah, you might get the, the, the advantage of, of pole position, but uh, so many times across the uh, course of the NLS season, the weather is going to be very mixed, and uh, you could have a, a very wet track trying to dry out. You do not want to be the hero who then stuffs it into the barriers at uh, Flugplatz or somewhere. So caution is always uh, a byword for the, for the teams when they go out there. And also don't forget, when you're out on the track in qualifying, if you're in one of the fastest cars from the SP9 class, that's uh, GT3 cars, uh, in their sort of global nomenclature and you come across say the Dacia Logan or one of the lower performance cars you know you don't you'll back it off because there are certain points on the track you could overtake but then you you'll meet your good friend the barrier on the outside so you know qualifying times only have an importance to a certain degree but Danny Junker Day was saying it means everything because he put his car on pole position and um, so at least for the number 14 crew from uh, Hout Racing team they've got bragging rights he's sharing with a uh, young British driver Frankie Bird but Danny you know he is so garlanded in terms of his success in championships in recent years in GD3 you know he just did the job job done we also should remember that in a lot of the classes, specifically GT3, uh, there's no tyre 
rule as such, so it's not a spec uh, tyre manufacturer across the various cars. And I noticed that the number six Mercedes, probably should have guessed this from the paint job, that uh, that car is running on Yokohama Advance. So we'll certainly have Goodyear tyres represented in GT3 and Michelin. Yokohama often reserved for the BMWs, but uh, and don't get confused, by the way, by the event sponsor who are Falcon tyres. So every single car has Falcon across the wheel arch, but you've got to uh, pay closer attention to the sidewall of the tyre. And uh, yeah, Yoko's on the number six car that will start from sixth position and we'll try and detail other tyre manufacturers as we go. Falcon fairly obviously on their own tyres. I actually think when you've got a multi multi uh, tyre format in a championship, you should force them to have their letters written large on the side of the car. But again, looking around the world as uh, drivers come to compete here, Alessio Picariello. Does he speak German? Because it seems to be may well be in English, if not. It's pre 24 hour race at the Nurburgring, so I think the target is obvious. Testing, testing, testing. Yeah, exactly. You can take as much experience as we can to do as many laps as possible, so this is not too much risk. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's a race. We have sponsors here, so we want to perform. But yes, the first goal is for sure. Oh, keeping his cards relatively close to his chest because it's the start of a brand new season, but they are quietly confident. I think that's fair to say. In the number three car, Martin Raginger sharing with Alessio, the Belgian, and a bit further back for the sister Porsche, for Joel Eriksson and Nico Menzel. They'll be starting from ninth position. Again, Johnny, I don't think it, it matters as, as much as all that. But going back to the elements about having different tyre manufacturers, what, what I've noticed over the years, traffic and incident providing, is the fact that uh, some manufacturers, their tyres are rather better towards the end of the stint and others are quite good at the start. Yes. And Falcon, if, in my mind, they tend to have the cars tyres that come good through the course of a stint. You often think, oh, well, Falcon aren't up too much this weekend. And then suddenly, lo and behold, there they are, you know, getting up into the top six, getting up into the top three and uh, they've had many many successes here over the years but uh, I guess when people look up and down the grid if they see that bright yellow and green the grellos we call it the green and yellow uh, Manti EMA Porsche you always think it's going to be competitive whatever tyres they're running on but with um, the driver lineup they have Lawrence Van Tour and, and Kevin Estra you know there's going to be nothing left out there on the track or in fact on the grass around the track when Kevin's here and he's needing an overtaking maneuver but uh, you know, every championship, I should think, should have an iconic race livery in it. And this is the yellow and green. You know, you can pick it out in day, in night, probably from the far side of the planet, frankly. It's so bright. But, you know, it's just great to have here in yeah. the NLS. Yeah. And always fascinating to me that they adopt the English uh, colour combo, Grello, rather than, what would it be? Gelm? Or, yes. Or just Grun, I suppose. But that wouldn't work. So it works better in English. Yeah, exactly. Groom Gelp doesn't Groom work. Groom Gelp, yeah. No, you can't no. really combine them quite as quite as well. Yeah. Uh, and and I suppose globally, uh, because there are global fans of this car, I'm sure there are tens of thousands, if not more, of the model version of this. I know that they they sell them at the the, the Tankstelle down at Moyes Pat, uh, not very far away from the start of the Dottinger Hoor. It's, it's a little, yeah, it's a little petrol station, and for, for decades, that's where you go to get your race accreditation, whether it's the German Grand Prix or, or the 24 hours. But, you know, I have to literally keep my hands by my side to not come out with a load. Of, I normally end up with a couple of books, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the book from the previous well, year. that's research. Some gratuitous books to add yet more books to my bookcases. But <laughs> my policy now is to actually read them. Don't just buy them, read them. I had to rein myself in. But I think if I started going down the collecting model cars route, oh, I don't know where it would end. No, I do, actually, divorce. It's that simple. I should have mentioned, by the way, uh, Lukas Gajewski, our good friend, is doing the hard work on the grid, predominantly in German. So that's why we're not pausing for the interviews. Lukas just chatting to Kevin. Kevin Estra, who's installed in the 911 car, and Kevin's uh, German is as good as his English. He is French, bear in mind, but uh, been racing German cars for a couple of decades now. So uh, important to be fluent uh, and multilingual. Looking further ahead of where Lucas is standing, though, the Lamborghini, I noticed, has qualified really well. Kelvin van der Linde and Jordan Pepper in the Red Bull team apt 
car, so 27 could go well in the opening stint. It'll be chasing the number 16 Audi R8 from Scherer Sport and the Mercedes number 14 of Daniel Junkader and Frank Bird. We're on shore on some of the starting drivers at this stage, but that will be made much clearer by the end of the first racing lap. We've talked about tyres. Crucial, of course, as to how they adhere to the road surface, and you would expect it to be even better turning right at Arenberg and heading down into the foxhole because that's recently been resurfaced. Not short in speed, in fairness, most of the time, but could be even quicker now. You know, it's, it's when you look over the winter, what's happened? How dramatic can resurfacing be? It can be very, <laughs> to very watch, dramatic. To watch, it's not really uh, no, 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 a spectator sport. Driver, but what I'm about to say is the NLS will provide every single weather format you could possibly have through the course of the championship. The fact we've not started with the... Is that man building a snowman on the pit wall? You know, that, that's unusual. But how do surfaces work with moisture on them. There, that will be yeah. the big, big question. And when you go to a circuit that has had a little bit of modification, you get to the point where you go from, let's say, the old tarmac to the new or the new to the old, and suddenly you've got either a lot more grip or a lot less. I do remember decades ago when Donington, they sort of stopped it just before the crane curve. So you're coming down and didn't have much grip to start with with all the aviation fuel from East Midlands Airport, and then suddenly you had a whole lot less. But again, these are pro drivers at the front of the field. People more likely to have a problem would be those at the back. But actually, the beauty, one of the many beauties about the NLS is the fact that uh, drivers compete in it, for not just years, for decades. Why not? They make their point of racing on the Nürburgring Nordschleife, best bit of racing tarmac, whether new or old, in the world. And uh, they learn every time, because no time will the track be the same as the time before. And often it's those transitional bits which, in the the bad weather can really catch you out but yeah you, you do well to resurface all of this place in one afternoon so that's the reason why you get different ages of asphalt and the drivers need to weave that into their circuit knowledge as well as if there wasn't enough going on in the first place the green flag is waved on the dots with 19 minutes to go to race start time and yes folks it really does take the best part of 20 minutes to do a formation lap around here this is the site of that much more crucial in those inclement weather conditions but will be very useful nevertheless because it might be that some drivers weren't actually sent out in the qualifying session perhaps not for a quick lap at the very least so start group of eights or the the red group wrought it sets off now and this is where we find the gt3s so Mercedes and Audi leading Lamborghini and Porsche, but also in this group are the Porsche, no, not, not the Cup 2 cars, but the GT4 uh, machinery is also as part of this. And Cup, Cup two. 2 is Cup two is in there. Yeah, I thought yeah. I wasn't, they thought I wasn't any, misthinking yeah. that. So Cup 2 is a bit further back within this first start group. Yeah, they, they tuck in behind the SP class cars. So you've got the SP, SPX class, which is the, the pale blue Glickenhaus. Well, sky blue. And in fact, it, I could grieve. It's exactly the same Pantone colour as the sky above the Nürburgring. That would have been a very ambitious guess when they were getting that painted. But uh, yeah, that's tucked in behind. And then the Cup 2s come a little back, a bit further back in this lead group, which I would suggest, I think we're reckoning for 47 cars. That's not enough for us. We have a couple, couple more groups, add another 70 cars to the mix. And part of the reason that this is done is to make sure that if you're heading onto the main start finish straight, you can actually have any hope of seeing the lights going out. Because bear in mind, if we put all 114 cars, yes, two by two in a grid, but in one long line, the back of that would still be coming towards the end of the Dottingal Hoor and into Tiergarten and the chicane there. So you would not know when the start of the race was about to happen. So it's split into three groups two minutes apart roughly and we will be able to commentate on the start of each of those groups of course because the green group start group three starts so much further back from the gt3s that's the reason why they start to catch the traffic sooner than you would expect really because they're already lost four minutes or so and it's only an eight minute lap yeah and, and actually for the first the first race of the season is one they're going to have to be most careful when they cut the front runners catch the tail enders of the back of the third group because a lot of drivers are still settling into a new car for the new season maybe they've never um you know competed in the type of car they're driving you know looking at the performance looking at the visibility that question that, that factor that gets so often overlooked a driver suddenly sitting low in the car doesn't see as much as one who's sitting a little bit higher up but anyhow uh, over the years 
it's laid, made absolutely clear in the driver's briefing where the slower cars should place themselves. It's up to the faster cars to find a way round. Uh, the other cars are not supposed to deviate from their line. Occasionally you can be a little bit helpful and go, I'm indicating right, I'm pulling that side, you can come past the left. But it's made crystal clear because uh, the format of the Mercury Nordschleifer is unforgiving. And if you want, you can put it all in capital letters. You have very, very little space beyond the track. The track twists and turns. How many turns? Is it 172? That's the number of people like to pin on it. But what's a turn? What's a kink? More than enough to be going on, plus gradient change. And even this morning, it's dry now and it was sunny, but it was still slightly damp towards the edge of the circuit. Again, as the sun comes through and a bit of wind, it does dry it out. Now we're looking at a, a track that visually perfectly dry, but still maybe at the edge of the circuit where the cars don't normally run. It could be a little bit greasy but really we'll take these conditions in early April every single time. Start group one led by the white 911 turbo and if you count up all the classes we reckon we're just shy of 25. I think it's 24 classes in total that are, have all been incorporated into this race and the GT3s uh, will provide obviously the the main attraction to this race but we will try and keep you tuned into what's going on in cup two and it was cup three that i was thinking of that will lead start group of spy because that is a, a thoroughly entertaining division as well with uh, the we've got uh, chris rink involved with that and also dominic bauman uh, the eichenberg and grosser car but it will be bednarski and dogard who will start from pole position in their number 962 car. They're all three digit uh, numbers beginning with nine predominantly. And that, well, that's what tells us they're in the 718 Cayman GT4 class. It's a great class, always well supported. 14 cars in that and um, just one more than you've got in Cup 2 for the rather more powerful Porsche 911 GT3 Cup cars that will start at the back of the front group. But uh, certainly when the third group gets its start, those Cup 3 cars. Um, Sorry, they're in the second group. What am I talking about? Cup two in first group, cup three in second group, but uh, they get their moment in the sun. And then you don't have to have a contemporary racing car to go out and compete here. Starting group three is led away by BMW M3 E46. Yes. It doesn't hide its light under a bushel. It's a very purposeful looking car. Massive great wing on the back. So much, much success. And it's one of those rare cars that has been competitive and able to run at the front of groups ever since time began, <laughs> ever since it went out as a competitive racing car. Now it looks ancient, but it looks fabulous. And you have to remember, the Nürburgring Langstrecken series, the ADAC 24 hours of Nürburgring, the people who attend are massive car fans. Seems obvious, but when you look at the cars in the paddock, in the fields, a lot of people come here with a lot of bolt-on extras as well. So, you know, they, they very much look to see what sort of car they want. And they've always got an eye to history. Great circuit for historic racing. And, of course, over the years, every year, brilliant historic meeting here in, in high summer. So the fans are very well educated in the sport. And the drivers in that number, 605 M3 from Hoffer Racing, Michael Kroll, Chantal Prinz, uh, Alex Prinz and Thomas Mullens. So at least three of the four of those drivers were involved in the Mugello 12 hours a couple of weekends ago and uh, getting stuck right back in again with action around the Nürburgring Nordschleife. And that BMW has seen plenty of work around this particular venue as well. But uh, again, prepped with all the newest bits possible, but it's wonderful to have that silhouette still, still represented on a grid such as this. No, entirely so. I, I also love the fact you were just mentioning that just a few weeks ago they were competing at Mugello. As, as someone who can race a GT-type car, the world really is your oyster now. You've got fabulous events. If you so cho chose, I'm sure a lot of these cars would go out and do the Bathurst 12 hours, the mm -hmm. Bathurst 6 hours last weekend. You know, you can pick and choose your circuits. And I think if you spent decades racing, you then go, where haven't I raced? Where would I want to race? But because your car is eligible, because there's a class for it, Happy days, really, really good days. But if you want to race at the very top level, you can go to GT3, and then you really can race everywhere. So the start of Group 3, now heading towards the end of the Grand Prix lap, through the Vidal chicane, and the exit of that can be a bit tricky, particularly if you're side-by-side side with somebody else, because you've both got to head from the left-hand side of the track to the right-hand side of the track for Sabina Schmidt's curve and the run onto Hatzenbach. And that's the bit, really, where you start to pull the belts tight and think, OK, I'm not going to be home again for the best part of six minutes. So this car 
and I better behave at my, ourselves throughout because, you know, any slight error, the barrier's calling you in, particularly on the really fast stuff through Klostertal and Kesselschen. And you've got the carousel immediately after that as well. But hats and back for me is almost like the point of no return. Oh, I, I agree. In every single race I commentate on here or attend at the Nürburgring, I almost forget how absolutely brilliant it is. And uh, last year, in the lead up to 24 hours of the Nürburgring, we got to walk out through those early corners, hats and back, keep on going past the crazy, crazy camps. People have the most amazing setups with their trucks, with the sides open, they've got dry ice, they've got a hot tub on board. You know, the setup, the, the effort the fans put in to come and watch at the Nürburgring. And some people watch every single race at the Ring. It's brilliant. Ein Traum vieler Rennfans, der für die allermeisten nie Realität wird, mit dem neuen Gran Turismo 7 aber ein ganzes Stück realistischer. Mit der neuesten Auflage des Kultspiels für die Konsole fahren wir zu den wichtigsten Streckenabschnitten der grünen Hölle. Die AMG Arena. Erstes Nadelöhr nach dem Start und durch die unterschiedlichen Linien ein toller Ort für Positionskämpfe auf der Grand Prix Strecke. Auffahrt Nordschleife. Nach der Vidol Schikane biegen wir ab vom Grand Prix Kurs. Hier beginnt der 20 Kilometer lange Ritt durch die grüne Hölle so richtig. Fuchsröhre. Mit Vollgas bergab, durch die Kompression und den Berg wieder rauf. Wie so oft auf der Nordschleife, kein Platz für Film. Breitscheid. Der tiefste Punkt der Nordschleife. Die Brücke über die Hauptstraße von Adenau ist ein Zuschauermagnet. Das Karussell. Benannt nach Rudolf Caracciola, einem der ersten Heroen des Rings. Die alten Betonplatten der Stallkurve sind Kult. Brünnchen, der Zuschauerhotspot. Ob beim Rennen oder bei Touristenfahrten, ob bei brütender Hitze oder im strömenden Regen, hier ist immer etwas los. Die Döttinger Höhe. Windschattenschlacht bei 270 km/h und die Überholmöglichkeit schlechthin am Ende der Nordschleifenrunde mit dem neuen Gran Turismo 7. Und damit von der virtuellen wieder zur realen Nordschleife. Fans. Besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. to see how many uh, campsites are 
almost fit to bursting in places. Clearly, people setting up for the weekend and every more reason to do it at the start of the 2024 season because there are two races to take in across two days. So this is a nice rare treat. Heading then through the highest part of the circuit a little bit later on, so through uh, the carousel and up towards Hoa Act, and then the descent, Flatsgarten, where the cars leave the road, Brutchen, and through the ice curver as well, which can be very treacherous if we've had some moisture in the air. There should be a fair bit of grip, though, in the opening laps today. One thing that really differentiates the 24 hours from these NLS races, that these, particularly the early season one, you have slightly fewer fans, but a lot of them are very clever. They don't just watch at one corner, they watch at one corner for a bit, they just go out of the car park, they'll drive round to another point, and it's every corner is a gem here, but you can watch one where the cars are below you, one where they're almost going above you, you can work your way around the outside. And we've got one of the best things about uh, the NLS is they have a fantastic helicam that goes around. And, and when you look down, is that the track? Is that a road? It's certainly a forest, but yes, the, the track is going through the forest and you suddenly see these pockets of people. You can't watch the whole way round, but with a little bit of knowledge and the fact there might be a very nice stand selling, you know, sent mid burst and, uh, you know, just lovely, lovely to partake around the day and uh, probably a you know, glass or two of beer to go with it. It's no. just such a brilliant circuit. But on a spring day, I think it helps push you into the air as it unfolds. We've all had a very, very wet winter in the Northern Hemisphere and it's sunny today and it's the Nürburgring, not two things you often get to combine, so we'll take it. The other amazing thing is that uh, if you're allowed to stand on the outside of the swallow's tail, the Schwabenschwanz, and look away from the track, you actually can't see the other bit of the circuit, the outgoing leg, because it's fields and fields away. And it's only then you get an idea of the footprint of this venue. Yes, there's elevation change. Yes, there are many different corners, but it literally goes from town to village to town. Uh, then uh, through Moispat, which has become its own sort of city, really, of car development, and then down the massively long straight to, to finish things off. But uh, the, the sheer size of this place can often be forgotten about. It really has, and Johnny's timing, impeccable as ever. As he mentions Moispat, it comes into view from the helicam because the field of cars is coming on to that long, long run along Dossinger Her, then getting towards Tiergarten Brent's curve end of the lap but don't forget this race will start not just the NLS se season but it will start in the three start groups with the fastest cars at the very front and the fastest in qualifying by two and a half seconds was Danny Juncker there, the number 14 out racing team Mercedes but uh, the industry on the other side of the main road that runs alongside uh, the Dossinger Hoa, the, the return leg to the pits 20 years ago, it was farmland. Now, it most certainly isn't. Manufacturers are embedded there. We have uh, tyre companies and all the service industries that go with it. And bear in mind, the whole point of this circuit being built in the 1920s was to bring some employment to a very, very agricultural area. Mm. It's worked. Finally, it's worked. And it's a huge complex. And even now, they're putting up other factories and other buildings alongside. So it's, it's just permanent, permanent uh, employment here for this region and well-deserved too. There is a significant Hyundai facility uh, I've just noticed as well, which seems to have increased at least by a story since I last checked. And uh, I think I've just spotted my own personal parking place at the Tankstelle, where I uh, often leave the car for a bit just to go uh, model shopping. And as you say, come back with several books. Uh, so that's always the first place to visit, not least because you need to sign on there for your media accreditation. So down the Dottinger Hoor and towards Antonius Bucher, it's, I think, by accident that this is the last part of the circuit, but it makes for an ideal finish to each and every lap because you've got this long, long straight where you can draft fellow cars that maybe you've been tracking for the best part of 18 or 19 kilometers. And to the line then, sometimes to the end of the race, your best over overtaking opportunity is through this section. It most certainly is. And a bit like Monza in the early slipstreaming days before, you know, 1971 and earlier, you actually don't want to make your move too soon because you can draft past someone who will then tuck in behind you and draft past you as you get to the final twisters. And it's worth pointing out the last three or four corners, it snaps, it goes into compression, it snaps to the left, it snaps to the right, and then left again. If you can get to all of those, and not all of the drivers have over the years, you've got a chance. But it's a brilliant, brilliant circuit. We're about to start the season for us of racing up ahead. So many eyes then peering to the screens that are mounted in the roofs of the garages. 
Uh, they're hoping that they won't see their cars for the next five or six or certainly seven laps. If they go beyond that, then there's been a problem. It's Mercedes on pole and a Lamborghini trying to sneak into second position. Now the green light is shown on the gantry and the Mercedes does get away well. But was that the second of them threading its way through? We've got two similarly liveried Mercedes AMG cars. Absolutely everybody for second place. And the Lamborghini, which tried to slide to second at the start, has actually fallen down to about eighth position. The Manti Grello Porsche around the outside being driven by Kevin Estrick. Got to be careful there. He was very nearly pincered by both an Aston Martin to his left and one of the Falcon Porsches to his right. And Kevin Estrick just trying to box clever here as the Audi slips to fourth position. It's almost Mercedes first and third. In fact, it is. And it is the 14 car from pole position, which has lost two places. So the next of the Mercedes, you have to look all the way back to sixth place. And it's been an absolutely killer start for either Dennis Fetz or Hubert Haupt or Ralph Aron. We'll find out in a moment. Certainly has. I don't think I've ever seen four, maybe five abreast into the first corner with three abreast right in behind, but uh, certainly a real, real scramble. But you know what? These are ultra professional drives. They've kept it clean, kept it tidy, but uh, certainly the Mercedes was escaping at the front of the field. What a brilliant job. But again, two black and red Mercedes heading down towards the camera at the first corner, trying to work out which is which, but the eye was just drawn to that racing action. But now we've got clear lead of just about coming up a second as they go through chicane they're soon going to be getting out towards of course the point where you say johnny you draw your breath in you're getting towards uh the cut sabine schmidt's curves and then hats and bag lies beyond the track narrows they're going over the two left handers of the sabine Sp schmidt's curves over the bridge and they drop onto what is now officially the start of the nordschleife my only concern about the start of the, for the number six Mercedes was did it start to overtake cars before the red lights had been extinguished or before they turned to a block of green on the starting gantry. That may well be looked at again by race control, but it is the Mercedes with the yellow rear wing or certainly yellow writing on it that is out front and the pole sitting Merck of Danny Junkadea or Frank Bird slipping from first back to third position. Here comes the yellow group, Startgruppe 2 with Cup 3 at the front of it. So these are all Porsche Cayman uh, club sports the 718 Caymans and again they're starting to spread their way across the road. 962 from pole position, Bednarski and Dalgard versus Eichenberg and Grosser in their 959 car and the first to make it oh but not make the first corner completely outbreaking itself is the 962 and then it gets a tap and a spin at the start of a four hour race two cars absolutely stranded in the middle of the road are they going to get missed by everybody else yes just about that started so well for 962 from pole position leading into the first corner then it seemed like the car forgot to break and then it barely made turn one, and after that got a biff, which nerfed it into a spin, and only now will it limp away from the scene, stone last of start group two. You know, sometimes when a driver makes a mistake into the first corner, it's because someone's right on their rear, but they had about a three car length advantage, but maybe they had that advantage, and it was so big because they hadn't got around to the braking part, but anyhow, it's now snaking around the 962 uh, Porsche after its uh, off-track moment, coming back on, being clipped, but the car that clipped it, I think, has crept to the side of the track and may be out of the race already. What a dreadful way to start their season. Hopefully, I'm not right, hopefully they will get back to the pits and something could be repaired, but uh, for 9.62, that was um, unfortunate. Believe it or not, though, you wouldn't necessarily say race over because there's still four hours to go. And yes, Cup 3 is highly competitive, but if it takes a slightly earlier stop or a later stop compared to everybody else, then uh, this may be the time to go off strategy and uh, win the race that way because uh, four hours offers you much different opportunities. Uh, and you might well be forced into now slicing the cake in a slightly different way. Meanwhile, the runners in the start group one are heading now down towards the lowest part of the circuit at Brightshide and then up the other side. And in the meantime, start group three heading its way towards the start of the lap. This is the green group headed by the E46 BMW of the Krolls and Princes and Mulner. But we've also got the Porsche Cayman S 981 starting alongside, which is car number 396. And then the first of the Hyundai i30 Ns. Now that's not the 
Jack Aitken won the Mertens and Hislop machine starting from third position alongside Daniel Zills and Philip Lysons BMW 330i. So the Hyundai is definitely there. In fact, there are two of them, three of them in this uh, leading pack, but the BMW E30, E46, sorry, E46 rather, getting away well ahead of that white and purple. There's another spinner, and that's one of the BMWs, car number 64 or 04, might have been the 504 car for Bloom and Orms. Everybody else, though, safely through that part of the circuit. I don't think it's particularly greasy at the first corner, but cold tyres, probably, even though they've had 24 kilometres to try and heat them up, there's nothing compared to pure race pace. Yeah, I think the tyres might have got a bit of heat, but I think maybe just a little bit of a cool brain at that point, unfortunately. But uh, rejoin the circuit, looked like a 325i. But again, looking at these groups of cars, I think the, cup, the group with the most diversity is the final group of cars, Group 3, 37 of them took... Uh, set off together with that incredible mixture of Porsches, BMWs, Hyundais, uh, and much, much more. I did among them uh, the Toyota Supras that look fantastic in that. A couple of uh, dark blue ones uh, running in their Toyo tyres, and they've been big supporters of the ring over the years. Neat, tidy, one little rotation, no damage done. But uh, waiting really now, probably three quarters of the way around the lap is our lead group, the SP9 cars, the GT3 runners uh, being followed by the cameras out around the circuit and um, just looking for any warnings about uh, misdemeanors out on the circuit. The only one we have to consider at the moment is the investigation of car number six under investigation for the start of the race. That's the car uh, in the need of the race. How did it get there? The car uh, qualified by Ralph Aron was uh, sixth on the grid, but uh, certainly first into the first corner. So that is being looked at at the moment. Yeah, uh, unsurprisingly, because uh, I, I did rather puzzle me as to how that Mercedes had managed to get itself wedged between the first and second placed cars just after the red lights disappeared. So they'll be looking at that and precisely when the pedal was hit in car number six. But at the moment, it leads on the road from the best of the Falcon Motorsport Porsches, which is car number three, I reckon. And car three started from fourth place. Yeah, that would make sense. The number four car was further back on row five. So it's Mercedes, Porsche, Audi, and then the pole sitting Mercedes in fourth, being chased all the way by Kevin Estra's Grello Manti Porsche. But the way the story is unfolding is the fact that the cars in second and third places are certainly catching the race leader. Now they're getting the toe along the dotting of her, and certainly that number six being uh, Mercedes, the one under investigation for a possible jump start. is probably two car lengths clear but of course it's a long long run along long straight so incrementally with that bit of slipstream the number three Porsche is getting closer and closer and in turn the Shearer Sport PHX Audi if there's a rear mirror will be tucked in behind in third place there should be no tell no three car lengths back to the Audi but certainly the attack is coming on from the Falker Motorsport Porsche not going to make it stick as they go up into Tiergarten but certainly is starting to find its form maybe the message has got through to number six you, you might have actually um, gone clearly dear boy well, if you any sense, not going to go anywhere uh, before the decision is made. There may well be a penalty, of course, to be incorporated into the next pit stop. Uh, there's confirmation of it. Car six under investigation for a jump start as Picariello from a long way back will slice his way up the inside of Hubert Haupt, who has started the number six car. Of course, they've now crossed the line, so we know who is taking the opening stint. And the Audi gets them in a second as well. So Haupt could not only, he couldn't hold back Picariello, he couldn't hold back Marcus Winkelhock either in the number 16 uh, Audi so Audi second Porsche now lead and the Mercedes running third and fifth so there's been a change for fourth as well with Estra now in front of Frank Bird uh, although Bird fighting back is a contact yes the mirror is the brushes and for a second time as well over the rear wheel rear right wheel arch of Kevin Estra got to be careful not to bend that in too much because they'll start to get a bit of tire rub so Frank Bird making his intentions felt there into the horseshoe cut through on the Grand Prix lap putting his beak in, one would say. Very a good. A couple of times, pecking away there, but certainly uh, the Manti Porsche, the one in the Grello livery, has been making up ground. Likewise, Finkelhoff up into second place, but through the, group, the part of the Grand Prix circuit that they use, our race leader is pulling further clear, which is Alessio Picariello, just, just took the lead 
uh, towards uh, the start of this lap and is getting clear. Hubert Hout falling back, but at least he's the team chief. He's the one who's made the uh, jump start. He's gone from leading this race back to second, back to third behind Finkelhock. Now he's got the Grenoble Porsche tucked in behind. Kevin Estra looking very busy indeed. Has now made just enough of an advantage over Frank Bird to uh, sort of stem that attack and in sixth place and seventh they're very close indeed it's uh, Joel Erickson in the second of the Falker Motorsport cars and Jordan Pepper South African racer in the best of the Lamborghinis down in seventh but that was a car that went a good initial start and then got swapped by those including the number six uh, Mercedes that maybe went a little bit early it did go a little bit early because there has now been a decision made. It's going to be a drive-through penalty for Hubert Hout because of the start that he made. The Lamborghini very nearly went too early. Car 27 for Jordan Pepper. And then through goes Hubert Hout. The light's only just changing. And he was already on the second row and very nearly in between the first and second placed cars. So... That wasn't the most difficult decision to make, I have to say. Yeah, it wasn't really, but it also should prove to me why, why, why the uh, Lamborghini, the Abt Lamborghini in the Red Bull livery, uh, lost ground. Because he had to absolutely check. Everybody else had the momentum to come past because uh, it was Frank Bird who was in the car was starting on pole, number 14. He hesitated. That held back the Lamborghini. Nothing held back Hubert Hout in the number six car, the sister car of the pole starting car, thus taking the lead. But I'd like to see that replay again because I sort of fancied there were two sets of starting lights and one seems still to be red. I'll have to have a look at that. It might have been something red on the hauling, but certainly uh, there was a question, but the answer has been provided. A drive-through penalty for the number six uh, Mercedes, and that will be falling back down the order one field. But uh, they get to a slow zone just uh, early on, the, on their second run through through onto the Nordschleife. I'm trying to pick up exactly where that has been thrown. It is heading into Adenau Force, yes. I think, isn't it? So yep. this is the clearing at the base of the Vauxhall, recently resurfaced uh, Fuchsrohre. So into, into Adenau Forest, then you can start getting going. And Kevin Estra tried to draw alongside Hubert out there, but he was only shown the outside line. And Hout, who's presumably been told about his drive-through penalty now, did not want to relinquish any further position. So despite Kevin Estra's best efforts, and that's the key, yes, you've got to be aware where the Code 60 starts, but where's the green flag? Because you've got to get the hammer down, ideally, ahead of those cars immediately in front of you. Praising the form of Marcus Winkelhock, working his way forward for Shira Sport PHX in the, in the Audi, but uh, mm, under investigation for pushing another car. We know Marcus is forceful, we know he's quick, but we'll, we'll keep an eye out on that one. But uh, <laughs> it goes to show at the very front of the field, it's very, very busy indeed. Just want to point out uh, that uh, it's not just about the top class, it's not just about SP9, but running in the top 10, that's always a good sign in Cup 2 in the Porsche Cup class uh, for 911 GT3s, if you can do that. Tim Shearbart is uh, doing that very job, leading the class ninth overall, next best in class is down in 12th, which is... Uh, uh, Jans, but Tim Shearbart, Avia, w &S Motorsport, leading that class. He's just ahead of American racer Danny Sufi, who's in the Conrad Motorsport Evo 1 Lamborghini, that is. Um, not the other ones are Evo 2s. By and large, so the older Lamborghini for Conrad Motorsport, completing the top 10. And then comes, in every place, the Glickenhaus. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on uh, how the Glickenhaus gets on throughout the course of the race, of course. Just hearing that now... The number 16 Audi is under investigation for potentially pushing another car. I'm not sure I remember that happening, but it may well have been out of our vision, of course. But that's Marcus Winkelhock who's potentially in the crosshair there for uh, another penalty, maybe a drive-through. Yeah, it could, could, certainly could be uh, plenty of um, provocation and opportunity around the opening lap. Because as we said, they were very, very close indeed uh, through, through the early stages of that opening lap, as they will always will be here but uh, right now it's uh, again just doubly checking out around the circuit how many stop start periods we got not stop but slow right down we've had that slow zone they negotiated it well you do gain and others lose but mm -hmm. uh, certainly at the head of the field first couple of cars starting to make good their escape yeah so Marshall post 44 which is known as Jaguar is now clear and there was briefly a slow zone at Brunchen as well but that's also now been withdrawn so it looks like the track is clear everywhere including at Aremberg but as I say that now Ho Heiken 
has a yellow flag out and, and you'll get a flavour if you've never experienced the Nürburgring Langstrecker series before you'll get a flavour of how rare a fully green track can be because no sooner have the track staff and hard-working marshals cleared up an incident than the next one strikes and possibly at the very next post uh, well indeed and, and many a time uh, the fastest lap of the race is, uh, can be set on the first lap but more likely the second or third lap when you've got a little bit of a gap between the cars but it's before not just so much they, they catch the tail enders in the third group of cars, that certainly helps, but it's incidents can start to occur. But uh, if the weather's good, your tyres are good, you've got them up to temperature, you've got a bit of space in front of behind you, those laps can come in. They mean you get bragging rights, but then thereafter, the amount of overtaking, the number of overtaking manoeuvres that each of these front running drivers has to do is mind boggling if you've never watched a four hour race. Think what a 24 hour race is like here around <laughs> yes. with Life. You're passing, passing, passing. And of course, you've got your own competitors. Rivals tucked in behind you, plus the fact the circuit, you go a little bit offline going past someone and you might just find some dust that's been brought off the grass at the side of the circuit in high summer. We do have dust. You have safety vehicles on the car, <laughs> on the track. And one, with, oh my word, just suddenly had a couple of the SB9 front runners, including the Grello Lamborghini going through. Number four, Porsche. Ericsson is a little bit up and down the order, just being passed by the Ad Lamborghini. So Jordan Pepper going past uh, Joel Ericsson and uh, going through. It's about jockeying for position. When you've got yeah. the front group of cars, you realise you can really work off your rivals. And uh, it's the very best of them are doing that. And Jordan Pepper knows it very well. He just picked off one. He's got another one in his sights. I was just about to say that Joel Eriksson probably reasonably pleased with the start of his race because he started in ninth and had been running in sixth. But as you say, Jordan Pepper slipping by for that position now. So Ericsson back a spot too, but it's been a real snakes and ladders opening few laps for the Swede. Yeah, but Meanwhile, one, one, nose to tail here because the Pepper, uh, Port, uh, Pepper Huracan is being caught by the Porsche Brews. Well, it's a, it's a double toe. They're right behind yes. the Grello uh, Porsche, which is absolutely taking the inside line. And uh, well, actually that has slightly stymied. Mean, there's a Sirocco going around the outside of the circuit rather slowly. So they all had to back off. But just as Ericsson had lost position to the Lamborghini of uh, Jordan Pepper, he got right under its rear wing, but then got interrupted by what the Lamborghini was doing with the tow it was receiving from the Grenoble Porsche. And a couple of front runners coming into the pits looks like, is that both of the Hout Racing uh, Mercedes? One's coming in because it's got a drive through penalty, but it uh, looks like the number 14 came in as well. And that was the car that started on pole. Down the inside goes Jordan Pepper with an overtake attempt, at least, on Kevin Estra. That's at turn one. So Lamborghini from Red Bull apt, battling with the Manti EMA Porsche. Joel Ericsson, of course, in their shadow, but ready to pick up any pieces that might come his way. And again, Kevin Estra's going to feel like the, uh, the main target man here because it was Frank Bird having a nibble on his rear right only a couple of laps ago. And that time, Jordan Pepper was very close to the rear left wheel arch of the Frenchman's car. Through the cut through they will go. Aston Martin not very far away from being involved in this battle either. So it's for third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. That's Marek Bockman in the green and white Aston Martin. It's an SP9 Pro Am car, but there's nothing to stop that doing very, very well in the overall positions if they carry good consistency across the race. So it was not the best qualified Pro-Am car. That was actually the number six, the Hubert Haupt machine that had to come in for a drive-through penalty. So now that has put the Bachmann-driven Aston Martin into the lead of the subcategory. Yeah, so just, just to reiterate, it was both the Haupt racing team, the Yokohama, the really black and red Mercedes AMGs that came in. One for the reason to have a drive-through penalty, the other because... <sighs> Who knows? It just simply could, but that is very, very early. You're beginning to wonder, has it picked up a slow puncture or something? Because, you know, normally you divide this race, it's four hours. It should be metronomically at the top of the hour, at the top of the hour, at the top of the hour. Three pit stops. We talked before the race, Johnny, about how you can bring yours forward a little bit, which means you... The pit stops are timed according to when you come in. You, you would end up with a longer first pit stop, but a shorter final pit stop. It's how you want to do it. Now, one thing you don't want to do is um, go around... I thought that yeah, the, one of the cars just spotted a very strange angle. One, two, one, in the heat of the battle in the Porsche Cup 2 class. It's Kate Kramer racing, always competitive. A couple of, it's obviously had a little bit of front end contact because some of its bodywork in front of the driver, the front of the bonnet, if you will, has doubled back. So it's got an air brake. Very, very handy, not at all. So the drive through was indeed that for Hubert Haupt, timed at. 
16 seconds, which is, yeah, is that about right? I would have thought it'd be slightly longer than that. So, mm. okay, we'll take that with a pinch of salt. But it was a short stop. He won't have visited the team. Frank Bird clearly did in the number 14 car. Um, but again, not for an extended period of time. So I might go with your theory that it was a slow puncture. Didn't want to spend too long in the pits. Uh, and yes, there is a minimum pit stop reference time. But when you're doing emergency service, as in repairing a, a damaged or punctured tire, I'm sure the regulations allow for that, much like in the ACO rules type of racing as well. So in and relatively quickly out, but Frank Bird, of course, has lost his top three running order and instead slips down to what it's shown as eighth place at the moment, but will allow the, the rest of this lap to be completed because it'll be worse than that, I reckon. The Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini will certainly have slipped by. And yes, uh, he will be outside of the top 20 now, that number 14 Frank Bird car, only just now going through the first sector and whereas most people, it took a minute and six seconds, Frank Bird took two and a half minutes. So he stopped with the team for probably a minute and 20 odd seconds before rejoining. Hubert Hout, that was much more like a 30 second delay in order to serve his drive through and return to the racetrack. So Hubert Hout also clearly dropping positions, but rightfully so, because he got a, a, a much too good a start. Uh, at midday today when we got underway. Jordan Pepper giving Kevin Estra absolutely no peace whatsoever and two wheels on the grass briefly there from the Red Bull apt Lamborghini Huracan. The Huracan for me looks the quicker car of these two. Kevin Estra is uh, putting the car in the right positions on the road. It's not often you get to watch Kevin Estra having to be defensive. He's normally, you know, one of the arch attacking drivers. But Jordan Pepper had a little look down the inside at the start of this lap into the first corner. No way, said Kevin Estra. But since then, he's kept his car smooth and clean, but on the racing line and a little bit to provide no option whatsoever. But certainly Jordan Pepper, you're right, John. He does appear to be a little bit quicker, works the slipstream very well. And it's also how they work the traffic. Oh. And as I say that, it's talk about thread in the eye of the needle, a go between a couple of Porsche Caymans from the third starting group. <laughs> it looks super easy. And when you look at the, the pace of the cars at the back, you think, God, they're going so slowly. They're not. If you look at them without the SP9 cars coming through, you think they're doing a fantastic job, really getting this fabulous flow and carrying their speed to the bottom of the hill. They're going to come up towards the, the carousel. No problem at all for the SP9 class cars. But there is a problem for Audi number 311 being pushed back into the pit garage. So that clearly at this early stage in this four-hour race is uh, not what the doctor ordered ordered the bonnets up, that's uh, MSC Motorsport Club Sinzig, and um, for Wolfgang Haug, Rudi Speich and uh, Roland Vashgal, that's not what they want, but still time to get back out there all over again. That's true, Roland Vashgal it was who's brought that car in and the bonnet immediately lifted. That suggests the team have a rough idea as to which part of the car to attack first in an effort to repair it. But uh, a shame that for the SP3 T car to be out of the running or out of the reckoning so early on. SP3 T, uh, that is the only entry, but they will have picked other cars within other categories that they can race with. And unfortunately, those, it's those competitors that are getting the firm advantage whilst that Audi sits in the garage. Now, what do you do if you're trying to get your ring permit or just as much as anything want to have race experience here? You need to go around and round. And I was just checking on the progress of Toyota Gazoo Racing and uh, sound the fanfare. Kamui Kobayashi into the top 50 in 50th place. He's one position behind Hibiki Tara, Tara in the sister car, but then ninth and 10th in the SP10 class. So work in progress, but it's today. It's all about getting experience the track. They're going to go out all over again tomorrow, hopefully in decent weather like this, but uh, it's good to have them here. But again, there are so many drivers to look at. Well, there would be 114 cars starting this race. You would just keep an eye on that class. And if you want to know who's leading SP10, you actually have to look all the way up to 25 positions further up. And for Dura Motorsport, with their Aston Martin Vantage, going well, leading the class, car number 169. And at the wheel at the moment is Oscar Sandberg. So he's doing a very good job. He's got an advantage of about six seconds over the best of the rest which is car number 164 avia wns motorsport team that's leading in cup two but back in sp10 three positions further back and um, 164 hill is the driver listed there and i don't know who that is because it could be janine hill who races under that name sometimes it's phil hill 
Phil Hill. Oh, is it Phil in versus Commerce Hill? Mm, no. I mean, there was a Phil Hill, obviously. Oh, indeed, yes. But uh, this is the current Phil Hill, as far as I know, but there are no inverted commas around his name. Very good. But uh, who knows, eh? Uh, but that's the 164 car. You were bang on with the number 14 problem. Frank Bird, that has been officially reported as a slow puncture. So have to come in for that emergency service at the end of only two laps. And the other difficulty is for Kenneth Ostvold, who drives the 801 Audi RS3 in the TCR class. That car's also been pinged for a jump start. So it'll be a drive through just like Hubert Haupt. Meanwhile, at the head of the order, Alessio Picardiello under pressure from the number 16 Audi of Marcus Winkelhock. Of course, Winkelhock is under investigation for potential contact. And speaking of which, there was a, just the merest of taps there on the rear as well. I think that's just about allowed if rubbing is racing. It certainly didn't pitch Alessio Picariello's car into a squirm. But nevertheless, under braking there for the second part of the Mercedes arena. If you consider the first right-hander as the first part, and then there's two left-handers. It was through the first of the left-handers that there was nose-to-tail contact between Winkelhock's Audi and the race-leading Porsche of Picariello. Yeah, well, two seconds were gained by Winkelhock there. He closed the gap down to next to nothing. Fastest lap of the race, 8 minutes, 6.9 seconds, and has uh, clearly got some uh, more targets in his sight. I have to have to look quite a long way back to the, the Grello Porsche, which is six seconds back in third place. They've really opened a tidy gap, looking to see what sort of cars they're going to be catching uh, next. Looks like a pair of uh, BMW 325i, so in the production class, so you can imagine. Here we have the front runners for SP9, huge wings, lots of aero, lots of grunt, brilliant tyres. Then, of course, if you're running in the production class, which has always been a feature, of Nürburgring Langstrecker series races. One of them could go nowhere. The track, we've always talked about the Shabin Smith's curves being very, very narrow, but they're both effectively, well, particularly the second one is a 90 degree corner that drops you to the left, downhill. There is nowhere else to go if you're trying to take the corner. And unfortunately for Picariello, he was blocked by the BMW, but it then came back across and slightly delayed in the sense of fairness, uh, yes. Marco Swinkelhock as well. So, in fact, Winkelhock probably lost about a few tenths of a second, but they got through. But you can just see you're trying to find your form. You're the race leader, Alessio Picaria. Hold on, he was two seconds back. Now he's right under my tail. He's, he's pushing me through the Mercedes arena. But then, if you, you're given a little bit of breathing space, you take it. In fact, the traffic is being worked very well by Picariello. He's almost out to two seconds clear again. That was a bizarre moment for Marcus Winkelhock. Obviously, you're committing to the second left-hander that takes you onto the hats and back proper, and you're committing to that without seeing the exit. So he's expected to be able to use the curb way up onto the right there. All of a sudden, there's a back marker. And it was like he initiated some sort of rear wheel steering from the car because it rotated from absolutely nowhere to avoid contact. So that's terrific car control and the ability to sort of get out of the throttle, but also the same time accelerate out of the moment so that he avoided a back marker which he did successfully and they're now onto the resurfaced part of the road which looks glorious actually very very dark asphalt into the foxhole which hits the dip the base point and then slightly rises into the quicker sweepers before you properly stop into Adenau Forest corner itself plenty of runoff here which is a rare rare thing on the Nordschleife so if you do make an error we've seen cars careening off in the wet there and thankfully, there's quite a large grassy patch for you to recover at that moment. But the leading duo are safely through. And the gap is widening now between Picariello in Porsche 3 from Audi number 16, Marcus Winkelhock. Now, a, they've just passed a car that's limping home slowly. There's a safety car tucked in behind it to protect it. And it was as though they were walking where a couple of runners were sprinting past in 100 metres pace. The front runners observed everything, kept the right way, but you just get this closing speed, and bear in mind, Johnny, there are a lot of points around the circuit where you don't have a long line of sight, because it's either going over, you're approaching a crest, you can't see over the other side, or a tight corner, so drivers have to be on their toes, they might suddenly come up on a safety vehicle, the marshals here are absolutely stunningly good, because they have to be sort of doubly aware that the drivers don't have this long long vision around the circuit, and therefore they have to be their eyes, they have to be the ones bringing out the flags, the second they possibly can to bring out a warning and uh, don't forget as well you've for the drivers who are in, in the towards the rear of the, the lower class of cars the slower cars they're looking in their mirrors as well to see if they're about to be passed by front runners so it's such a busy place to be but it does help when it's spring it's sunshine and the track is dry thankfully the leaders got through hats and back as it remained green because there is now 
there are now two slow zones in place along the hats and back and i'm intrigued as to the sector three times now on this lap to see who's going to be the first to be slowed by that marek bockman's got through as well because that's two minutes only about three seconds slower than race leader alessio picariello but it may well be the conrad lamborghini which will be heavily delayed that's been started by danny sufi and Torsten Kratz also part of that lineup for Conrad Motorsport. Yeah, very slightly slower for the seven Lamborghini and the Hubert Hound Mercedes. I don't expect even more time to be ebbing away though from cars a little further down, maybe in the Cup 2 area that are delayed by whatever has happened on Hats and Back. Bring you more news on that in a moment as Kenneth Ostwald in the 801 Audi from the TCR class will now head into the pits to serve his early race drive-through penalty. So the start of the lap, the gap between Picariello and Vinkelhock, 0.3 of a second, certainly by working the traffic rather better. Picariello, as often is the case for the race leader, has a little bit of an advantage and has opened it out. But uh, don't forget, the previous lap, Vinkelhock found two seconds to get right on the tail of that Falker Motorsport Porsche with his Chira Sport PHX Audi. Can he do it all over again? But Picariello is, uh, well, he's in shot and at the moment, ah, oh, right. Two and a half, three seconds back now is Winkelhock. So it's been very, very good for the Belgian as he uh, pulls a little bit more little bit clear. But don't forget, traffic, uh, we often say gibbeth and it taketh. But uh, at the moment, it's certainly gibbeth to the Belgian because he's making good his escape. And if he can stay three seconds in front when they get to the dotting her, he doesn't have to worry too much uh, about being slipstreamed. And uh, certainly, it's a factor that really can just draw the whole thing together. Now, what has happened to one of the K Kramer Racing Porsches? Because it's Michele Di Martino who's not appeared at the end of Sector 3. So is Martino in the wall or certainly in strife somewhere along the hats and back? He was possibly a little slow through Sector 2, but now just has not appeared at the end of Sector 3. I'll keep my eyes peeled there. SP10 is led by the 169 car. 169 is the Aston Martin GT4 of Oscar Sandberg as the 311 Audi looks like it's going to return to the racetrack. So that's been a, a fair delay, maybe losing about a lap because of that difficulty for the MSC Sinsig AV TT, the Audi TT, but at least the our only SP3T runner will return to competition now. Right, just uh, want to fill you in on, on how much ground was lost by the number 14 Mercedes with that uh, stop for a pit uh, for a tyre change. It fell to 24th at the start of the last lap. It will pick off those in front of it, but uh, really to be up among its class runners, it needs to be, well, run down to SP9 class cars, go down five pro entries, then three pro-ams. That takes you down to number six. That's the sister car. Don't forget, that was a drive-through penalty for them. That was uh, Hubert Hout who jumped the start and then some had the drive-through penalty. He's running around in eighth place. His next target is Danny Sufi. You wondered if Danny Sufi had slowed at some point on that lap, but uh, certainly for the car that started on pole position, the sister car from the Hout Racing team, car number 14, a lot of ground needs to be made up. But Frank Bird, well, he, he'll enjoy the overtaking, just be a little bit frustrated. Down in 24th position at the moment. We're actually hearing that it's the 730 BMW 390L which is stuck on hats and back. The entry from Plus Line Racing Team. And Rudy Speich of the 311 crew reporting to Lucas Gajewski that it, this is a misfire problem for the Audi TT and for MSC Sinsig. So they're obviously trying to cure that during a relatively quick pit stop. But these. Ignition problems, misfires can be so difficult to, to sort out, particularly once the race has started and you're trying to get the car turned around in a hurry. Yeah, but the good news is uh, Rudy Spike was uh, spying, spying as he was talking there. And uh, so, of course, MSC Syndic have been running cars in this series on the Nürburgring and Nordschleife for forever and a day. He would have seen it all as the team chief. He'll have sort of had the frustration, but he was smiling, so I think that's a good thing. So they, they lost a lap, a lap and a bit more, but uh, there's a race today, same again tomorrow, another four hours, and the weather conditions are, are very, very good. So these are really important uh, moments for them at the start of the season. Get a decent start. Now 480 is the car that's being pushed back into the garage. This was travelling quite slowly, a white uh, VW Sirocco uh, in the, one of the production classes, and uh, hazard lamps uh, are flashing, but uh, bon it up, so maybe a similar problem for them as the Audi TT just suffered, but the 311 Audi back in the race, but for the 
BMW number 480. It's in the garage, on it up. Early season frustrations. Hopefully something that can be solved. And that's uh, for Christian Kerger, Thomas Alpiger, and uh, Bastian Arend. If it is the 7.30 car, which is causing those slow zones on the hats and back, then it's Dennis Surrace, or Suracha. Not entirely sure, to be honest, but uh, he competed in LNS last year for MSC uh, Kempenich in the V4 category and the number 730 car, which is also a V4 entry, the 390L BMW causing a lot of cars. Ah, oh, yes, he's found the tyre wall on driver's left partway along hats and back and the tyres are deliberately put there because it's very easy to straight line the section of grass beforehand and pile straight into the tyres. Hopefully there's not been, done, been too much damage done to that car because it's not pushed the tyres back by a great deal, but clearly too damaged for the car to continue. Yeah, I think we are probably talking of you know, broken steering link or something from the, the clipping it, but so many times at Hats and Back, you actually start your accident at one corner, <laughs> and you're several twisters later when it comes to an end, but uh, it almost got through that sort of stricture, wonderful twisting section of the track, but for him, I think he went wrong about two corners before that, and the nose of that Porsche just in against the tarball. All the cars going past had to slow right down code 60 at that area, and that was including, um, actually, Joel Erickson got quite close to the, the battling third and fourth place runners of Kevin Estra and Jordan Pepper, the Grello Porsche ahead of the uh, Lamborghini in the Red Bull race livery. And then the second of the two Forker Motorsports Porsches got very close, but the Swede managed to back out of it. So he's running fifth. But luckily for Forker Motorsports, that their other car is running first. And that uh, is, of course, Alessio Picariello, three and a bit seconds clear of Marcus Finkhoff. And the BMW that we mentioned remaining in the pit lane, unfortunately. So that car still being worked on. Meanwhile, Alessio Picariello has just set the fastest lap of the race, which is an 8 minutes, 0.123. We'll call that eight flat. Might as well, eh? Yeah. But the 1.23 is quite easy to remember, too. Share a sport Audi 3.1 seconds away, then, from Marcus Winkelhock. And even though Marcus was able to take the pace to Alessio Picariello in the early stages, Picariello now just finding his stride, possibly landing upon the code 60s at the right point as well. And that's forcing a bit more of a wedge between the top two cars. It's another Porsche in third for Kevin Estra, Manti EMA. And again, he's weathered a storm. In the early phase of that stint, Jordan Pepper was all over him. And there's now a three-second lead. Does this go to your point about certain tyre manufacturers making their tyres, or at least the cars, being set up to be stronger in the second half of a stint? Pause. Possibly. Possibly. Is the reply to that. But, Only uh, because it's both, it's two yeah. Porsches, but from different entry, you know, Falcon yeah. and Manti are as competitive as Audi versus Porsche uh, versus Mercedes. You know, that yes, they both run the same type of car, but there are no ties between those two teams. No, it's being a bit obscure there, but I mean, the, the, the hardest thing through the course of these four hour races, but think what it's like multiplied by six, the 24 hours, is to gauge the actual pace of the car. Because yeah. there are so many slower cars that can um, just, you, you lose momentum, it, but it's not just into one corner, it often the next three corners you're affected. Um, but, but certainly that lap of eight minutes flat, bear in mind the, the pole lap this morning, they go out and effectively do two laps. It was seven minutes, well I've lost it now, seven minutes 56.5 seconds, but you know, that's without too much traffic and stuff. But so few laps in the race, a run with a, without a code 60, a warning, a gaggle of traffic, that it's always very, very, excuse me, hard to tell exactly who is at what pace. But what I can tell you at the moment is Alessio Picariello has started this three, lap three seconds clear. I dare say if I flip through various timing screens, I'll see if he's extending it. But in fact, around this lap, quite the reverse. Marcus Winkelhock is closing in all over again in second place. In the first sector, he, he took uh, a tenth. The second sector, he took, oh, an entire second. The following sector, he took another six, seven tenths of a second. So it looks so first to second is coming down. But what traffic lies ahead? That's the eternal question. Well, it's a relentless pace being run. I, I couldn't quite believe it when I looked at the clock to discover we've had nearly 40 minutes of this. And we're well through our fifth lap of what should be a seven-lap stint, although it will be interesting to see whether anyone does peel off at the end of this circuit to pit road because it's going to be quieter in the pit lane, theoretically, and you can take a shorter pit stop because you will have only done five laps as opposed to those that push it to the very edge of the envelope and to seven, eight later, because the fuel mileage will allow 
uh, eight in total, and therefore, once you total, when, once you add all the laps up, uh, we should be around about the 28 lap marker at the end of four hours, depending, of course, how many code 60, how many slow zones there are between now and then. Yeah, just, just to sort of paraphrase, the earlier you make your first pit stop, that necessarily brings all your other pit stops forward in the sequence. The, Still eight um, laps, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. The start point is earlier in the race. Exactly, but bear in mind, if you come in, say, for example, you pit at the end of this lap, your pit stop will have to be 306 seconds. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what, if you come in the next time round, it has to be another 22 seconds longer. So you gain an advantage by coming in early, but the counterbalance comes at the other end of the race. Because yeah. you'll be making your final pit stop more laps before the end, yeah. sooner, and therefore that will be, by hopefully a requisite amount, a similar amount, uh, will be uh, a longer pit stop then. So you sort of pay your money, you take your choice, but uh, certainly what I can see at the moment is the fact that Marcus Finkelhoff, I said he was gaining, well he was three and a bit seconds down, he's now about, oh, not even 0.3 of a second down, right under the tail of Alessio Picariello. So it's Porsche from Audi, Porsche in third place, which is uh, Kevin Estra, Matt Taieme, Lamborghini from uh, Red Bull Team Abt, Jordan Pepper, and in fourth and fifth, the last of the pro runners in the top five is Joel Eriksson in the second of the Porsches from Falcon Motorsport. But uh, down the Dossinger Her go, or along the Dossinger Her, when you say down, it always suggests it's running downhill. It does have a little dip and then it rises, but it's largely a flat stretch of tarmac. But interesting there, coming out of Straubenschwanz, better exit for the Porsche leading the race. I really thought that uh, Winkelhoff would think, all I need to do is get under his tail as we come out of the corner onto that long drag back towards the pit, but he hasn't been able to do so, find any advantage. So, Alessio Picariello going through the final sort of left right, left right sequence. He just got the left hand on to start finish straight. It'll be half a second clear, but a much, much better lap for Marcus Winkelhoff. And of course the question is, why? Why was it so much better? Was it traffic? Are the tyres coming good on the Shearer Sport PHX Audi? Hmm. Let's find out. I wonder whether the sector times will offer a bit of a clue as to that because they were even Stevens around the Grand Prix lap at the start of this, but about a second gained through sector two, the run through Hatson back and on towards Schwedenkreutz and Arenberg, and an absolute best middle sector, so probably clear air as opposed to maybe Alessio Picariello, he was catching the odd bit of traffic. The thing is, the leader has to find a way through, and that could often pay dividends, do a massive favour to the car in behind. So a second gained through sector two on the previous lap, so about just over half a second gained through the middle sector, and then another full second in the very long sector, which takes just over three minutes. So it was nip and tuck here and there, but the accumulative result is that the three seconds gained by Marcus Winkelhock in the blue and white share a sport Audi with the day glow door mirrors, day glow yellow door mirrors, and now heading through the kink and up towards the Vidal chicane, first and second, absolutely together. And just to make it, things confusing, with that slow zone, their laps were about 20, 21 seconds slower than the previous lap, but the, that's why it's always hard to judge unless you can look at every single split time. Now to the high side of BMW 651 goes the race leader as the lead battle continues.
dein Online-Shop für Simracing-Hardware und Zubehör. www.simraceshop.de Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social-Media-Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. and second dice as we reach the end of the first three quarters of an hour of this four-hour race the Nürburgring Langstrecker Series opener for the 64th edition of the ADAC ACAS Cup live right here on RS1 part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels it's Lucas Gajewski bringing us occasional English interviews from the pit lane Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer in the Global Broadcast Center thoroughly enjoying Alessio Picardiello up against Marcus Winkelhock. So Falcon Motorsports, Shearer Sports, and as Bruce Jones called him a moment or two ago, Kevin Manti, which I kind of like actually, because then you could call uh, you could call Alessio Falcon and uh, Marcus Shearer. It's that also, sort of it dovetails the names and the team names together. It's not so good if your team has a long, long name there. It wouldn't True. Be Tim, Tim Shearer, but it would be... Um, <laughs> Tim Avia W and S Motorsport. You know, it sort of falls away. Did all I call right, him yeah. that? But it's a family team. They all take on the family name. You know, when you're racing for Manti, you've got to do the only thing they don't stipulate. You don't have to have such an extravagant moustache as the wonderful Olaf, the team boss in days of old. Huge, bushy, curly at the ends. Couldn't be more Germanic and such a character as well. Very, very well suited to all forms of racing in the Eiffel Forest. And Marcus Finkelhock takes a look up the inside there at the bottom of the hill before they go up to the carousel. He's not giving Alessio Picariano a moment's rest, but they're about five or six seconds behind a car that they should pick off quite easily, but it's how they do it. Oh, Winkelhock coming out of the carousel pulls almost alongside, but the track then turns to the to the right, and Picariano's got just enough now, just enough momentum out of the corner. Corner, or built the momentum to pull across the nose of the Audi. So Winkelhock is not not enjoying himself. Two abreast up the hill out of the uh, out of the carousel and towards Hoa Act would certainly be breathe in and hold it for two minutes really because it could very easily have been side by side then all the way through the next sections as well at Vipperman and Eisbach, which they're just heading to now. Eisbach, in fact, there's side-by-side -side contact for the race leader. And here is Marco, Marcus Winkelhock's opportunity. Picariello trying to defend. He slapped the side of a back marker, did Picariello. That massively slowed him down, not only because of the tag, but also, obviously, Alessio Picariello getting out of the throttle to avoid any further contact. And Winkelhock didn't need another indication to say, this is your chance as at Brunchen now. Winkelhock pulls out of the draft of the Belgian, but there's no no way through there, again blocked off by a back marker, but this is how close they are to absolute peril with every turn of this racetrack. I mean, that's the thing. This was supreme racing between two of the very, very top uh, runners in SP9 in Global GT3 racing. On their metal, top of their craft, Winkelock having a look at the bottom of the hill before they go up towards the carousel. Doesn't make it work, nearly does on the exit. And Picario, who had just done enough to move back across the thing. It's OK, I've got the lead. The back marker seen me. The back marker is uh, rubbing the paint off the side of my car. I'm going to be over the edge of the curbing and into the barriers on the outside, but uh, managed to get past. Couldn't see what it was. I thought it was white. I thought for a second it was a Hyundai. I worried for a second it might be the um, car we talked about earlier in the race, the, the, the Canadian duo but, uh, of uh, Wilkins and, uh, oh, and yes. uh, Vickens, but I don't think it was. But uh, certainly that was a moment in which Alessio Picariello had been thinking, oh, my God, at least it was fully cleanly side on. I breathe in again because there was a car virtually stopped on the right hander at Galgenkopf there, heading onto the Dottinger Hoor in its own drama, probably with a puncture, at least one. And it, what it was doing was limping down the curb, but on driver's right. And you head into Galgenkopf fully committed. First of all, let's try and identify the car then that Alessio Picariello slapped the side of a moment or two ago. It is a touring car based machine. It, it's not one of the Hyundais, I'm fairly confident in saying. Is it, a, is it an Astra? Might be an Opel Astra, black and white. Difficult to tell from overhead. But nevertheless, that was Marcus Winkelhock's big opportunity. What do we think? 
Well, I did, I did question whether it was In eight. comes Winkelhoff. Sorry to cut right across you, but that's a key stop as well. So the end of lap six and Marcus Winkelhock deciding probably he's losing too much time behind Alessio Picariello. So get the pit stop done now and hope to jump him if he's fed back into clear air. Absolutely so. Now, we're just trying to work out which car it was. And I did question whether it might be the, the Canadian's car, the 831, the target entered uh, Hyundai Elantra NTCR. And uh, Tim Gray suggests it may well be. And uh, that was the car with uh, Rob Wickens and Mark Wilkins on board. Mind its own business, but it unfortunately left a bit of an inside line, and that's it precisely where our race leader, Alessio Picariello, tried to go. And then it, it started moving across on the right-hander, but already... Uh, our race leader was going there, so um, we'll keep an eye on that, just try and work out exactly if that was the case, but we do think it possibly was 831. Yeah, getting that confirmed now, so uh, my ability to identify Hyundai Elantras from their roofs... And it was Robert Wickens on board. ...need some work. And it was Robbie William, Robbie Wickens, not Robbie Williams, <laughs> Robbie Wickens driving the car in 831. So here's the stop for Shearer Sport PHX as... Marcus Winkelhock will get out and hand the car over to Frank Stippler. I think this is what they call, in the modern era, an undercut, Bruce. As in, you're deliberately stopping early to then go back into clear air and potentially leapfrog Alessio Picariello without him even being there by posting quicker laps. And then by the time Picariello pits, he'll rejoin behind you. That's the theory. Very modern. Let's hope it works. But... Um... <laughs> So clearly, Picariello stayed out. Must be going, gosh, it's quite nice now. No one on my tail. But Frank Stippler yeah. taking over from Marcus Winkelhock. And um, I've said this so many times. If anybody can make an Audi R8 LMS fly around the Nord Triper, it's your man, Stippler. And uh, so we'll see what he can do. And he's certainly, over the years, he's always competitive here. But he's been able to nurse some cars with problems. Not saying his car's got a problem at all. Uh, uh, towards very, very quick lap times and great positions. But just remember this one thing, unless if Picario had that side-by-side -side contact with Robert Wickens' uh, Hyundai, and uh, let's hope it's not feeling untoward, no potential slow punctures on there, but certainly Picariello has decided it's uh, good enough for another lap. But uh, we expected almost all of the top runners to come in after seven laps, and then thereafter they should do eight lap stints. But uh, certainly... The Belgian keeps on going, whereas the Audi that was giving chase, the Shearer Sport PHX, pale blue and white car, uh, down on the deck now, about to rejoin the race with Marcus Fingelhock walking to the garage and Frank Stippler heading out on the track he knows oh so well. Tim Shearbart just crossed the line as the Cup 2 leader. Nico Otto not far away in the number 100 car. So the 100 machine is the Max Cruiser racing entry for Nico Otto and Benjamin Lauchter. So they are not far away from one another, and you would expect that in Cup 2 in these early stages. The car that was limping through Galgenkopf that I talked about at the time that was very nearly cleaned up by the race leader is the Black Falcon Cup 2 car, which would have been right with Tim Shearbar, I'm sure, before this problem hit. So this is Tobias Muller, and it's a rear left that's gone down. And this is just a horrible place to be on the dotting of her. Yes, there'll be white flags. But I have to say, the, the race leader at the time coming through the right-hander onto the dotting of her a couple of minutes ago didn't show any signs of letting up. I suppose he couldn't afford to with Marcus Winkelhock so close to him. But that speed differential, a Porsche doing slightly more than walking pace versus two GT3 cars leading the race, going as fast as they can onto well, one of the quickest corners of the circuit at Galgenkopf that leads onto the long straight. And, and with every fibre in his body, Tobias Muller would want to go faster in that uh, gold black falcon Porsche. But knowing it's a long, long run back, where on the circuit, this 25 kilometre circuit, did that puncture start to come into effect? He's, it's clearly wasn't just a slow puncture, it's a no. proper puncture do not want that to sort of delaminate, rip the bodywork off the car and cause far more damage. Two corners to go, then he'll be into the pits, but he tumbled, tumbled down the order. And uh, in fact, you have to keep scrolling your screen to find out he's 71st and falling, I think we can say. So instead of being in that cup two battle, that's normally just out, just at the tail of the top 10, he has taken a drop. It's the cruelest of things. If you get a puncher, get it as you're coming into the pits, not just as you've gone past. As one of our directors refers to it, Oliver, thank you for this, flat tyre is probably a better description than a puncture. It is absolutely virtually off the rim and no air in it whatsoever. 
So he has done a good job in getting it back as quickly but as safely as possible so as not to further damage to Porsche number 103. Resplendent in a gold livery for 2024. Meanwhile, Nico Otto in the 100 Cut 2 car looking to try and eat into... Actually, is he still behind? Yes, he is, the Avia WNS Motorsport car. That was 0.7 of a second as they started this lap. It's possibly stretched out to about a second now between Team Sheerbart and Nico Otto. Steve Jans, the Luxembourgish driver, now up to third in the 148. As Hubert Haupt, I'm sure, has plenty of tales to tell to Lukas Gajewski after he was pinged for a fairly obvious, fairly obvious jump start in the number six Mercedes. They're always told, drivers in the briefing at the start of a race weekend, that as you come through for a rolling start, it's the pole-sitting car that must govern the pace. And until they go, you might well see the lights, well, the lights will be on red. But until the lights go out and the race leader starts to pick up speed, you can't start to overtake. And quite clearly, the six Mercedes rather uh, did that in an uninvited fashion. And one of the things that's always amusing, if, if you can see an interview but you can't hear it, is um, driver's body language. I was waiting mm. to see, would there be a hint of a smile on Hubert Hout's face, knowing no one can tell him off, he's the team owner. But uh, yes, hold up my hand, I did it. And uh, the glint was there. You know, Hubert been racing for a very, very long time, sort of leapt from nowhere when he was young into DTM, but his empire has expanded and expanded and uh, certainly hugely entrusted by Mercedes, but uh, they will have to take this one on the chin. He's doing, doing so right now, but, you know, just frustration, really, but sometimes there was that slight hesitation, ironically, from the sister car, ironically, from Frank Burley, the number 14, at the starting on pole, and maybe it just bunched the field at the point where, naturally, if they'd all accelerated at the right pace, this wouldn't happen. I have a feeling that might be what Hubert's saying at the moment, but anyhow. He'll live to fight another day, but that yes. car was brought in, not just on lap two for the drive-through, but also on lap six. So next time around, we'll have a lot of the others coming in, but on lap six, we had... The number four uh, Falcon Motorsport Porsche, that was the one less well placed with Joel Ericsson on board, that came in. Number six Mercedes, as we've just mentioned, and of course, number 16, the Audi from Shearer Sport PHX, and that was handed over from Marcus Finkelhock to young Frank Stippler to see what he can do, <laughs> get some experience around the ring. And there were driver changes in the other two cars you mentioned too, so the number four Falcon Motorsport car is now being driven by Nico Menzel, and Dennis Fetzer taking charge of the number six Team Advan by HRT car, so helped out Fetzer in. Now hearing about two further cars stationary uh, in different places. So the 502 is stuck at Hoare Act. Have a look at which car that is for you. 502 is a BMW F30 from GT Tire Motorsport, part of the VT2 for rear wheel and four wheel drive cars. And also at Bergwerk, there's a stranded car, which is the Four Motors Bio Concept Porsche 718 Cayman. So one of the alternatively fueled cars, which has stopped at Bergwerk corner. Right, our front runners are about to come in, and it's two Porsches that head the race. They come in together, and that's because an SUV Picariello has lost about five seconds on that lap to Kevin Estra for Mantai Iamarok. Kevin Mantai from Estra Racing or something, but anyhow, into the pits he comes, but uh, nose to tail, so a really, really good in-lap from Estra. You know how team chiefs always say, maximise your in-lap. Yeah. If you can maximise a 25-kilometre in-lap, as he has, and take back five seconds, you, you definitely get a bit of chocolate on your ice cream. 99 for you, sir. And you can come back again tomorrow, assuming that is one of the cars that's on the end list for tomorrow. I've forgotten which one's... Uh, yes, it is. Says, OK, good. Bruce did the side-by-side comparison ahead of the weekend to find out uh, that we have a slight alteration to the entry list for tomorrow's uh, version. Meanwhile, the 172 Toyota Supra is currently negotiating the latter portion of the lap. This is Kamui Kobayashi, current Toyota hypercar driver and team principal. So taking a weekend away from the FIA World Endurance Championship. And is this with a view to driving perhaps a Lexus in future around this circuit? Or, uh, you know, other, other related machinery? I mean, these GT4 cars are thoroughly entertaining. I'm sure he's done a bit of mileage behind the wheel of one of these Supras before, but 
Whether he's ever done it on the Nordschleife, who knows? Yeah, but with uh, Lexus really now pushing in the, in the GT3 categories around the world, I'm sure he just wants to get experience. I know he's in a GT4 class car now. I think as the team principal of Toyota Gazoo Racing, he really just, you know, he's a racing driver, wants to experience everything, see if he can pass on advice, but uh, great to have him here. Up to 46th position. Remember last time he was uh, in... Uh, 50th position. In fact, he's vaulted a few positions while I've been waiting because obviously we've had a couple of cars hitting trouble, so he's uh, moved on up the charts a little bit. But uh, it's all about experience. He's coming back again tomorrow to gain more time on this circuit. A lot of drivers, they're also planning things for their posterity as well. So Kamui Kobayashi, I'm sure, is just taking that opportunity. And he had to breathe in there coming through Galgenkopf because absolutely whipping by on his right hand side, both Tim Shearbart and Nico Otto for the lead of Cup 2. They're up to 10th and 11th overall, but Nico Otto, having been trailing by the best part of a second earlier on in this lap, is now right with the Arvia car. These two should be able to stay out for quite a few more laps. Sometimes Cup 2 cars can sneak into the top six, let's say, at the end of the stint. In fact, we have had laps led by, going back far enough, Cup 7 cars, or sorry, SP7 cars, which have now subsequently become Cup 2. But, yeah, they have slightly better fuel mileage. They cut through the air far more efficiently, so they're sometimes faster down the Dottinger Hoor than a GT3 car, which carries much more aero. These Cup 2 cars, basically based on a Carrera Cup uh, one-make machine, and extending the race distance significantly to four, six, and in the case of the 24-hour race later on in the year, twice around the clock as the Audi of Frank Stippler arrives at turn one. I was beginning to think where on earth is the Falcon Porsche, but of course they've become split because the Porsche didn't pit at the end of six laps, whereas the Audi has done, and Picariello is now in at the end of lap seven. So that's as far as they could push it. In fact, Martin Raginger has already brought that car back out again, and he's being hunted down by an already truly warmed up Kevin Est. So Est did not get out and hand over to his teammate, Lawrence Vantor, whereas there's been a driver change in the number three Falcon Porsche. Yes, and don't get confused. How could they possibly put a driver in if it's just a tyre change, etc., etc.? But of course, they have a mandatory minimum time. So that's normally generous enough for because you don't have a lot of mechanics working on the cars here to keep the cost down um, and so on and so forth. But uh, within that timing, Ragginger took over. Kevin Estra stayed on board. So he came in right under the tail of the driver who started the Ragginger Porsche, the number three Porsche from Falker Motorsports. Uh, that was, uh, of course, Alessio Picariello. So it's no change there. It stayed exactly as the same. The Lamborghini is just uh, not too far behind. That's still in the hands of Jordan Pepper. They've all served that first pit stop. Don't forget, of course, the number the number six Mercedes enjoyed it so much. It's now being driven by Dennis Fetzer, but it came in twice. Once for a drive-through penalty after two laps, and then pitting after six, and that's fallen down to just outside the top 20. That will work its way up. It's SP9 class car, so of course it get past the Cup 2 cars in time. And we haven't talked too much about the car that uh, came into pit from fifth position. It's the Glickenhaus, the uh, fan favourite over the last decade or so here. Of course, competed in the World Endurance Championship until it was just decided as a private individual, a lone individual who's gone racing out of passion. Jim Glickenhaus could not continue to try and take on the manufacturer teams. He did a valiant, valiant job for several years in the World Endurance Championship. Loves his racing, loves his off-road racing as well, Johnny, building those Baja buggies as well. That is big business for Jim and the gang, but the fans here in Germany always love the Glickenhaus, going well. But its fastest lap is, yeah, it's still 20 seconds off the pace, the best of the SP9 cars, and it's still the fastest lap held by Alessio Picariello, and eight minutes flat, 0.123 seconds. There we go. I was talking about the possibility of getting a Cup 2 car into the lead of the race. Well, we've actually got two of them there now, I reckon, because neither Tim Shearbart nor Nico Otto have actually pitted yet, and they are already into the third sector on this, their eighth lap, whereas Martin Ragginger and Kevin Estra are only just doing so now, heading down the hill into the Fuchsrohre and yeah, approaching Adenau Forest with this whole newly resurfaced section looking resplendent in the sunshine and still the slightly brown trees on this spring day uh, meanwhile a brand new 
rather than the resurrected, I believe, Dacia Logan has been brought back to the Nürburgring Nordschleife in H4 category. But unfortunately, the Logan is going no further at this point. It's in the garage and by the looks of things, going to be there for a little while yet. Yeah, let's hope it's not an official retirement so far, but brought in a few moments ago. Lukas Gajewski just catching up now with one or two of its drivers. And I would assume, yes, it was Oliver Kreiser who brought the car in after it qualified in 112th position this morning. Janet Lachmeyer is the other driver. Uh, they'll just be hoping that they can get the car to the finish line. Um, oh, the brakes are too hot on the car we're hearing from Oliver Kreiser. So they are actually just changing the pads. Hopefully not the rotors as well, but just the brake pads changing. And then hopefully it can be sent back out again. Yeah, and Oliver was saying, if you, if you really squint, it looks like a TCR class car, but it doesn't. That's really. true. It looks as standard as you can imagine, running on its own in the H4 class. And the good news is, a little bit of push and shove, it's not the lightest car in the world. It will be going back out of the pit garage, across that sort of squeaky garage floor paint they have, and uh, into the pit lane again. So always popular this time is the sedan, the saloon model. Uh, that's uh, going out to race. Let's hope they can carry on going. But the interview is still going on because Olivia Creese is obviously having a, a really good time. Glad to be at back out. And it always gets acknowledged. Racing something unusual catches the eyes of these fans. Of course, they appreciate the, the Porsches, the Mercedes, the Lamborghinis, the Aston Martins at the front of the field and the Audis as well. But always something different catches their eye, makes them smile. Here goes Nico Otto for the race leading Cup 2. He got the hammer down slightly earlier than Tim Shearbart and all over the grass. That's not going to get you any traction whatsoever. He had the road position, but the problem is he was driving on turf and weeds. And Tim Shearbart, in the more conventional racetrack, is able to retain the lead and actually open up about half a second gap now. Yes, accelerating on grass isn't always a given, but it was grass and dust. It was pulling away under his, uh, let's think about this, left-hand tyres. I just couldn't get the traction, but it wasn't for it wasn't for want of trying. But uh, of course, only a third of the way around the uh, full Nordschleife, but you know that it's not much width for the rest of it until you get to the dotting of hurt. So you really want to try and make your move at the restart. It didn't work, but it's very very entertaining at the front of the field because the number four Porsche is now uh, pushing very hard indeed. That's the Joel Ericsson car. Is it in the hands of Mensel now? I'm yes. trying to work out. Of course it is because uh, they changed changed over. But when you get the cars coming in on, on out of sequence with the others, you suddenly get these scenarios. You think they're fighting for position? Yes, they are. But one of them knows their final pit stop. The one that pitted earlier is going to be a longer final pit stop. So yes, they might be on the tail. They might even be 10 seconds ahead. But if their final pit stop is 20 seconds slower or longer, mandatory pit stop time for them if you come in earlier before, further before the end of the race then you you've got to get in front you've got to pull away but right now it's looking quite good must be said for the Audi that uh, Winklehock did such a good deal in of course it's now in the hands of Frank Stippler who's not exactly going to let the side down but you get these little moments where the field looks really close but it may not be as close as you think because it's a, a seesawing race in terms of the, the pit stop time you go in early for your first pit stop you gain position you go in early for your final pit stop, you'll lose position. I think it's about as simple as that, really. Well explained. Um, one of the Cup 2 cars with a very snazzy livery may well be the Klick Versicherung team for Czerzanowski. And the 119 car has just been overtaken by Frank Stippler and Nico Menzel. That's for position, remember, because none of the Cup 2 cars, none of the meaningful Cup 2 cars, have actually stopped yet. They don't need to stop for fuel until probably the end of lap 8, which will actually be their ninth lap, with the formation lap included. So I'm expecting Ting Shearbart and Nico Otto probably to arrive side by side in the pit lane, such as being the extent of their opening stint. They're also running ahead of the Equipe Vitesse Audi from SP9 Am. And it is that car that leads a fellow Audi R8, the Uta Racing SP9 Am entry. So number 50 ahead of number eight in that subcategory within GT3. Still the order untangling itself on the timing screen. But Martin Raginger is in the longest sector now of the five times. Sometimes we get as many as nine sectors timed around the Nordschleife. It appears to be only five this weekend, though, for a sort of standard NLS race. As they're now heading for Galgenkopf, and as the road will straighten up in front of Nico Menzel, he hits the Dottinger Hoer now. 
still with very much company because around the outside, I think Kevin Estra has just gone for, on Martin Raginger. So this is not actually for the race lead as we speak, but it will become the race lead just as soon as the as the Cup 2 cars pit in front. And a key overtaking manoeuvre, I only caught the back end of that, that looked to be Kevin Estra going right around the outside of Martin Raginger. No particular corner, just Schwalbens front. You always want to get a good position coming onto the dotting her. However, getting it too soon can count against you. As I said at the start of the race, Martin Raginger gets straight in the slipstream of the Grelo Porsche and pulls his Forca Motorsport car around the outside. But that was a brilliant move from Esther. Go where it's not expected. And just as you could just imagine, the Raginger was thinking, I'll just stay in front, stay in front, make sure he doesn't get. Up. But no, no, you're not supposed to pass sort of before we've got to the straight. But anyhow, <laughs> at least he's got it back. He's, he's got his pride intact. And they will be assuming the lead of the race because those Cup 2 cars of Shearbart and Otto in that particular order. 120 ahead of 100. Shearbart ahead of Otto. Peel off into the pits. Eight laps completed. And now, at the front end of the race, it's uh, all clear again. Yes, a number of cars pulling off in front for pit stops, including Alex Brundle for Mulner Motorsport in their number 122 car. Tim Shearbard and Nico Watto timed as the race leaders, though, at the end of lap eight and separated by only 1.7 seconds as they hit pit road. Kevin Estra not happy with having take, had the lead taken away from him. Remember, he led the opening bit of dotting the hoar. Then partway into Antonius Bucher, there was a lead change again, and it's still just about the Falcon car in front. Yeah, and just, just need to clarify, Johnny, this is the battle for effective... Well, it is now for third place, because Frank Stippler is leading the race for Shearer Sport PHX, ahead of the number four Porsche from Falcon Motorsport. Hold on, how come they're ahead of these two? Because they made their first pit stop sooner. Yeah. And that first pit stop was uh, about 20 seconds short. They're in front, so we've got these duos. The first two, Stippler from Menzel, separated by nine-tenths of a second. It's a quarter of a second between third and fourth, but they are back by about 10 seconds. In fact, let's do the maths a bit better. About ten and a half seconds. Third and fourth. Ten and a half seconds down oh, on the first two. Oh, oh the side of the, That was always going to be a big question mark as to which side they were going to go of the GT Motorsport BMW. And it was Raginger who decided the left-hand side, but the back marker went precisely that side of the racetrack. And because Estra had a few extra seconds to make his decision, he said, thank you very much, round the outside or the inside of the exit of the Vidal chicane and takes third position. We don't joke about gaff, trap it, give it and taking away if. It's quite hard to say, isn't it? Um, but uh, it really, really does. Because at that point, you can just imagine Martin Ragging up, running in third position, was thinking, I just need to get onto the Nord Schleifer, get off the Grand Prix loop, onto the Nord Schleifer in front, <laughs> and then Kevin Estra will have to work. And unfortunately, it was then presented to Estra on a plate. Meanwhile, as I say, at the front of the race, it's the other Falcon Motorsport Porsche that's doing the attacking this time. Instead of being the hunted, it's the hunter. And this one with uh, Nico Mensel is right on the tail of Frank Stippler. Fairly clear line of sight. The Audi still leading the race, but it's down from nine tenths of a second to next to nothing. Maybe half a second, maybe slightly less. How will they work the traffic up ahead? Looks as though drawing breath. An Audi TCR car stays out of the way of the outside of the circuit. So that was good. It let the first two through, but wonderful battle. Spring, sunshine, dry circuit. But as we know, just around any corner, pretty much anything can happen. And don't forget, of course, we had the sister car with the side-by-side -side contact, Alessio Piccariello being, uh, having a brush with uh, Robert Wickens and uh, Hyundai, Hyundai Lantra. Don't think there was any damage done because Piccariello stayed out for a further lap, so clearly no concern about punctures. Of course, that's had its pit stop since then and is continuing on its way, but uh, these moments, they can just happen. Marcus Winkelhock brought his Audi in to hand over to Frank Stippler after five laps. And Joel Eriksson likewise to Nico Menzel in his number four Falcon Motorsport Porsche. So that enabled these two cars to be slightly quicker in the pits and they are first and second. Therefore, it was six lap stints for the number three Falcon Motorsport car. So interestingly, in one garage of the Falcon crew, they've gone in one direction, five laps as an opening stint, the other car Six laps. Nobody's gone seven, though, to be out front in the S in the GT3 category. I think I'm right in saying, yeah, no, not the key runners deciding to go as far as they potentially could to the seven lap marker. I also looked up a moment or two ago to see a relatively small hatchback type car tucked into the grass on the right hand side. It didn't seem to be going anywhere fast, so uh, there are still some 
slow zones out on the racetrack. In fact, a total of nine code 60s currently, including at Exmuller and at Bergwerk. But Stylestrecker, which is the approach to the carousel, is still affected by something too. So lots for engineers, team managers to be on the radio to their drivers too, to say, look out for these corners because you could be caught out. Now, under investigation, just before the pit stops, they went up into first and second place, cut two cars right at the front of the field. But Nico Otto, car number 100, who was in second, remember on the restart, he tried, got on the grass, under investigation for a dangerous manoeuvre, but it's moved on. It's black and white flag for dangerous manoeuvre. There's the warning. Any more of that from you? And all will not be good, but uh, entertained us, but uh, clearly a judged to be a little too feisty taking. It was on the restart from a slow zone coming out of Hats and Back, where trying to be ambitious, trying to get, get the, the jump on Tim Shearbart didn't quite happen. But anyhow, no damp, no, no punishment except the black and white flag. That's the warning, and they've got to. Uh, plenty of time to think about behaving very well indeed through to the end of this four-hour race it is an absolute game of patience now for kevin est and the chasing martin ragginger restricted to 60 kilometers per hour as is the audi up ahead as well from one of the lower categories still 60 kilometers per hour in the Callenhard area, Kesselschen, Klostertal. This is normally such a fast part of the circuit. Now they get to the greens and they're able to lap the car in front of them, which is the 801 Audi that's already been pinged for a jump start. That's one of the cars that had to take a drive through penalty. And all of a sudden, you're heading uphill through a part of the racetrack, which normally you would be at much greater speed. So how late do you leave your braking into style strecker now? Because all of a sudden you're arriving at a slower pace, you should be able to hit the brake slightly later. That is the thing. Once you get into the race, you frequently, you've gone through your mental preparation or your mental procedures for going through a slow zone. Dum, dum, dum. Now you know, you've got a car up ahead, right, we're released, we're green, green, and then they come three corners later, around the corner, oom, to another slow zone, and you've got to be on your metal. You cannot just uh, close the brain off and just think about your, your task in this stint. Your task will include many, many moments you hadn't predicted, but you've got to be able to uh, react to them, and the very top drivers can do that. Uh, with equanimity. Now, car stops at this station at Klostertal. This might be the one you were talking about. Yeah. 949. It's the SRS Team Saw Grand Sport Porsche 718 Cayman. This is in the Porsche Cup 3 class. Well, it could have been that car. It I honestly be. thought it was more of a, a sort of hatchback style of car. But again, at speed, it is tricky to tell some of uh, the various manufacturers apart. As now into pit road will come the Cup 3 race leader, which is the SRS Team Zorg Rensport 718 Cayman. So a good opening stint as it's turned out for 959. And into pit lane will come Fabio Grossa, sharing with Heiko Eichenberg and Patrick Gruter in their Zorg Rensport run car. So three drivers getting plenty of track time ahead of the longer and arguably more key races as far as the trophies are concerned. But everyone loves to, to, to win the opening Nürburgring Langstrecken Series race, of course. And if you perform well today, then you could back it up with a double tomorrow as well. Opportunity for good early championship points in 2024 as now nose to tail will go the audi versus porsche battle which is for the lead of the race remember frank stippler and nico menzel still only displayed in third and fourth but they have managed to leapfrog the cup two porsches who pitted at the end of lap eight and there were driver changes in both of those incidentally so tim shearbart getting out and daniel blickle taking over there and it's Benji Leuchter taking charge of the earlier driven number 100 Max Cruiser car of Nico Otto. So Otto out and Leuchter in, and I'm sure they're still only separated by a hair's breadth as it has been for much of the opening stint. Uh, actually, that's written into the rule book. It has to remain like that. We talked about it before the start of the race. I said it doesn't matter when the cameras uh, look for the Cup 2 battle, they, they, they will find one at the front. And there it is, living up to the reckoning. 
the Nürburgring Nordschleife, I think it looks magnificent in any weather. I prefer it if it's not thick fog and rain, but it yeah. still has a certain majesty. But to be spring sunshine here, leaves not yet on all the trees, in fact, possibly far from it. Don't forget that uh, the Eiffel Forest is up high, so it's going to take a little longer for all, all the the foliage to, to come out to, to make the wonderful setting, but it's still a wonderful setting as the cars go along, the dotting of her, and certainly the... <laughs> it's so super close, and Nico Menzel is making a push, going side by side, around the outside, through the left hand King. Has he made it stick? Yes, he has, around the Shearer Sport PHX Audi. The job is done. And don't forget, so many times, Johnny, we've seen an overtake onto the start, for, onto the dotting of her, and then it all changes over. And then if you get a good exit, the final corner. There's plenty of width when you head down into the first corner of the following lap. Go past the pits now. About a car's length advantage uh, for the number four. Falker Motorsport Porsche in the lead of the race. Frank Stippler tucks in behind. Listed as one second in arrears. Nine laps completed. Down to turn one they go. And uh, Falker Motorsport into the corner first. Out of the corner first. And what is catching them? A Grello Porsche tucks in behind. In fact, it was four tenths of a second. Then one second flat back to third place. And fourth place Three and a third seconds back is the second of the four commodity sport uh, Porsches, car number three. But bear in mind, 9, 11 and 3 came in for their first pit stop later than the two cars ahead of them, so they should have an advantage as the race stagger unfolds. Yeah, but it's gone, because if you look at the last lap times, Kevin Estra has shaved 10 seconds away. I reckon in the long sector, that normally takes three minutes. It's still taking north of four minutes. But Estra was able to find eight seconds in Sector 4. Clearly one of the Code 60s cleared just before he arrived on the scene, whereas the two in front had to go through it at the 60 kilometres per hour. So that's been a massive win for Kevin Estra. He took the later stop, so had to have a longer pit stop. But this is what I mean about various things changing, even between the car in front going through and then you arriving on the scene. That's 10 seconds he's gained back on both the leading cars. Look, and, and also for the man anti-EMA crew and its drivers Kevin Estra and Lawrence Van Tour will do the second half of the race it's just easy now in terms of visual the two cars in front of you well overtake them if you will but uh, bear in mind their final pit stop will be 20 seconds longer than yours make it uh, make it clean and simple Robert Wickens and Mark Wilkins their, their Hyundai Elantra in the pits at the moment no damage on this side of the car I'd love to see around the other side because bear in mind it had that little side on side clash can't see any notable damage with the number three. Oh yes we can <laughs> who did you hit the car that left the sort of turquoise uh, paint on your, your rear hit. arch oh Falcon Motorsport front end of their cars are turquoise so there we are there is the it's being taped up now but actually it's only as far as we can see the rear the spat effectively around the rear rear wheel so Lucas Gajewski eager to get the story on that Robert Wickens and Mark Wilkins driving together and this car clearly having to be adapted for Robert and the, the hand controls that he requires and meanwhile there'll be a change of driver I think between the two Canadians looks so actually Robert's is he staying board. on board okay you know that, that moment where you say with great confidence when you can just about see an eyebrow an eye in the side of a nose yeah driver sitting on board looking through the netting I'm making enough excuses here but I do think it is still Robert Wickens on board I, I tend to agree with you there so and they would have got the driver change done as early as possible well also they wouldn't do two driver changes they'll just do one halfway through the race because obviously Robert getting in and out will necessarily be slower yes uh, so they don't want to be in and out and in and out. Yeah, and I don't know what the whether there's an adjustment needed then within the cockpit and how long that takes, but I would imagine they've designed it all, whatever changes they have to make, to be within the time-limited pit stop or the time-affected uh, pit stop, governing how long the car needs to be on pit road. It's done this way because a few years ago now, and even to this point, that the officials, the organisers of the race, can't necessarily guarantee that the fuel flow in each of the fairly bog standard pumps is the same up and down the pit, pit lane. So rather than regulate the fuel flow and then that potentially become becoming an argument from the teams, if you just say to them, right, well, there's a minimum pit stop requirement according to how many laps you've just completed, that's time from pit in to pit out, then it takes any argument arguing away. So nice and simplified. I know we talk about Nürburgring Nordschleife racing as being, being rather complicated, but that is a rule that I understand to make it fair for all. And uh, good as well that you've got this varying scale. So that there is the scope for some strategy here and there. And 
it's all the stops leading up to the last 70 minutes that are dictated by the stop you've by the stint you've just done slightly distracted by i think just fuel overfill trailing from the exhaust of the elantra as it leaves pit road that does seem to have stopped now but there was leaving a, a little trail on the road behind it a little something for your friends to collect yeah, indeed, yeah. their, their stints but actually good thing for robert wickens came back out into clear traffic just going back to the, the way they do the driver change of course robert and mark, w mark wilkins had uh, raced together a couple of years ago 2022 uh, they, they were teammates in the IMSA, uh, michelin pilot challenge came sick that year so they as a pair are accustomed to in and out of the car to get that and every yeah. little bit helps because he's got to be technical clean and tidy and um, almost from the moment his rehabilitation started uh, robert wickens was working on his fitness and getting his core strength back and put up some you know incredible footage onto youtube about the sort of odyssey it took but the determination was there from the very very moment loves his racing it's just fantastic to have him back in the cockpit you know he was such a promising driver i watched him a lot in a1 gp when mm. he came and raced those big single seaters but then he came back and just absolutely shone in dtm you know when it was at a, a really fierce point in its in its time and took six wins across a handful of years and was always a factor and uh, it's just great to have him here and also for german fans who have seen a lot of him in dtm you know he was always a, a favorite because he, he's just such an affable guy you know some drivers are just doesn't matter if they can't speak your language and i dare say he picked some up as he went but it was all about his personality and you know he's just a lovely lovely guy so great to have him here really really good addition and obviously racing Hyundai Elantra in the TCR class. He's not going to be pitching for victory in this race, but the victory in many ways is being out here on the Nordschleife in the spring sunshine, building towards, you know, maybe in years to come, try and see if he can go and compete in the 24 hours in Nürburgring. Because I do think as you go through your career, you then have a list of races you yeah, want yeah. to do. And clearly this would be one that would really uh, tickle his fancy. Yeah, and we talked a lot about the, the ring permit and the licenses required. Well, uh, this is certainly gaining initial signatures for that. And I'm sure he's ne not necessarily going to stop at the Hyundai Elantra, but it's a great place to start and uh, very much a welcome to the race as well, but getting smashed from the side by the race yeah. leader. But Meet thankfully, the leader. Oh, not like that. Yeah, no, indeed. <laughs> uh, not intentional on either part, I'm sure. And thankfully, both cars are still able to run. One with visible damage. I haven't actually caught the side of the uh, the left side of the Porsche of uh, Picariello now being driven by Martin Raginger, but I'm sure it's got similar scuffage. I was slightly concerned on the, the lower part of the Grand Prix track that uh, somebody had been off the road and left, left a lot of tyre smoke, but I think that's barbecue smoke in yeah, actual fact from the fans and the grandstands. Every time I see that, just, you just think, no, I don't want to see that. Fabulous day. Thought of a barbecue? Yes, please. No, no. When you're in the commentary booth, you have to eschew all things. Now, one of the cars that seemed to tumble down the order, you picked it up very early on, was uh, Danny Sufi, the American driver. Must have had an issue, a problem of some sort in the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini. Well, yeah, clearly. The car's best lap is about a dozen seconds off the ultimate pace in terms of best laps, but it's a lot of it has been down in traffic. It's down in 63rd position. Wow. Uh, and um, just trying to work out why it is so far down. It's had two pit stops, and I can't tell you why it's had the bonus pit stop. Well, not a bonus, quite the, quite the opposite, a demerit pit stop. Clearly for work to be done. It's lap pace at the moment. Always hard to tell because of the slow zones. In fact, almost everybody was very, very slow last time around. Their best lap in the number seven Lamborghini was nine minutes 53, but that's only six seconds down on the uh, pace of the race leading Nico Menzel. So clearly slow zones not making it easy to find a picture, but uh, they will fight away. How far up they, the field they can come remains to be seen, but we've got still oh, just over two and a half hours of this opening round of the Nürburgring Langstrecken series. This year's now, of course, with the title sponsor, the ADAC, as they make it very serious indeed. Of course, ADAC, uh, well, the German organising clubs are going to be big with the Nürburgring 24 hours coming up soon. But of course, next weekend, Johnny, it's two days of uh, qualifying races uh, to, to sort of work towards the sharp end of the field, heading to the 24 hours this summer. As far as I can tell, Danny pitted after four laps and did a stop for about two and a half minutes, which is slightly longer than you would want, but nevertheless, it's okay. But then the problem was he rejoined only for a lap and then came in for nearly a 12-minute pit stop. Uh, Hannah's only got going again just after one o'clock at about seven minutes past the top of this current hour. So, so just over 20 minutes ago back into the race. Yes, uh, and clearly 
at Conrad Motorsport, as is so often the case. They're great at qualifying that car, but it rarely has the consistency. Sometimes in the 24-hour race, actually, did it have a good result last year in the 24-hour in the race? It, the reliability is slowly getting there, but more often than not, for about three seasons, it would do about two laps, and that's all we would see of it. Yeah, but it would be challenging to be top three. Yeah. Axel, oh, yeah, yeah. Axel Jeffries, Michele Di Martino, and, and then, because don't forget, you know, the TV director in this will be looking around for gaggles of cars, and with 100, sometimes 150 starters, you don't always have the camera on the cars at the front of the field. You think it must be. Where is it? But you then start scrolling down your very, very long a table of 150 cars to find out what's gone wrong. Bear in mind, it's also an Evo 1 Lamborghini Huracan, and uh, for example, the Red Bull team app, they've got Evo 2, necessarily a better car. So it, it is slightly older machinery. Great to have it here, though. Yeah, and still eligible, of course, for uh, GT3 competition. They have a something between a, an eight or a 10 year life uh, in terms of them being uh, part of the regulations homologated. But obviously, new cars are coming out nearly all the time. So that was Evoed a couple of years ago. But the Lamborghini Huracan Evo 2 first released at the end of 2022. So it was last year that it was its first year of competition. The previous iteration of the Huracan still eligible uh, till the, well, I make it to the end of last year, actually. So I'm not sure whether you can run an Evo uh, an initial evo car in any of the big global categories, probably still within, just about within the rules on the Nür Nürburgring Nordschleife for NLS races. As to whether that still runs in the Nürburgring 24 hours is another thing, because of course that's now part of a bigger championship. It, it, it is indeed part of the Intercontinental GT Challenge. Now, no one likes making mistakes. They, ha they happen in life, but uh, I fell for this one last year. I, I seem to recall talking about uh, barbecue smoke. You mentioned it there, so I went along with sort of Pavlovian dog tactics. Sorry. Uh, it's a drift, drift oh, play. Oh, is it? And they do drifting competitions. Thank you very much, John. Yes. off watching over our shoulders to uh, pick us up on that one. So let's put all further thoughts or mention of any barbecued food out of our minds for now. And it's the, it's the drifting area, of course it is. And again, that just reiterates how you come to the Nürburgring for a day out, see the cars in spring sunshine, but there are many things you can do within that time. The brilliant chance to get on the grid before the start of uh, rounds of the ADAC, Nürburgring Langstrecken Series. Certainly we saw what we joked about, the cast of thousands on the grid, but you can do that, get the feeling, you can work your way around the circuit, drive from uh, some of the greatest corners to the other greatest corners, but you can also go and there is the drift competition to watch as well. So, you know, the, this is a very, very well-polished and developed concept mm -hmm. for the NLS, but there are so many sideshows. And you know what? We know this, Johnny. It draws in all sorts of fans and sort of cements them in the sport for life. You know, it's not just about the cars on the track, and uh, the organisers have got that very well under control. I mean, that crossed my mind that if that was a barbecue, it would be of monstrous pro uh, proportions. That's but, why I was getting excited. But the thing is, that's what's done around here. Because, you know, in the night time of the 24-hour race, there are very often is smoke billowing across the track from a nearby burger bar in the darkness. So no, no, got... better, better than that, it's not normally a burger bar. It's, it's a, a group of friends from Dusseldorf who've got an entire boar on a spit. Yeah, a spit. You know, that you don't yeah. go small here. <laughs> And then yeah. they go to that. It's not a beer counter. It's one with proper, compre you know, compressed beer. You know, beer pumps that works. Pretz fresh pretzels in the morning. They do things well. They camp properly. And a, a speaker stack similar to the height of a four-story building that's been brought on an articulated lorry as well. That they just park up and have a mini music festival along with the racing. I, I get the feeling sometimes in the middle of the night somebody taps the shoulder and say, "Why are we here again? Oh, it's a motor race. Completely forgotten about that." And a lot of the a lot of the fans who have been there all week, they're all almost checking out on Sunday morning, even before the race has finished, because I suppose the highlight of the weekend for them has been and gotten them Saturday night, and they're nursing the hangovers already. We'll keep you up to date, of course, though, when we get to the big one later on in the year on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. It's the qualifying weekend next weekend, and we are stuck slap bang in the middle of a double header for the Nürburgring Langstrecken series. And now Nico Menzel finds yet more double wave yellow flags. It's a code 120, it's a code 60 for the race leader, car number four for Porsche. It's for barrier repairs on the left and possibly even on the right of the track, but certainly on the left as they go up the rise, just cross Adenauer Bridge as you start to climb and then you're kinking to the right, to the right, to the right. Then, you know, as is so often the case, 
you've got bright sunshine which is fabulous but one side of the track is still in the shade of the trees so it's actually much harder luckily for the drivers their natural line around that corner is on the left hand side of the track but the, on the right under cover of imaginary darkness or seeming darkness was another truck but it was parked hard on the grass on the right hand side but it's still slow and uh, for the cars out there on the track but the number three Porsche Martin Ragginger is now right on the tail of the car in third place which is the Manti EMA Porsche Kevin Estra on board remember that Kevin got past a couple of interesting laps got past Ragging got in front then the positions were reversed now one of the cars that went missing very very early on um, was one of the SP9 class cars, it was the Dura Motorsport Aston Martin and it got caught up on the opening lap, didn't come round again and that was the car share that was due to be shared by two Dura brothers, Phil and Ben and Darren Turner but alas it didn't get to complete a full racing lap so it doesn't even feature at the bottom of the timing screens. So problems are there. Well, we're talking about Lamborghini Huracans not too long ago. One of the cup cars from that division heading over the line now. So we've got... It's actually, that's the, the one that's uh, in SP9. That's the new, new racing team, Renatso Motorsport team. If it's Thank 786. Right, yes. yes, it is. 786, bright yellow with the uh, black up over the roof and onto the rear wing. It was the 786 that confused me because normally yeah. numbers with uh, seven, starting with seven, three digits, are for classes elsewhere. But no, exactly. Right. Right. It's a curveball. It was started by Kiki Saknana, a uh, tie racer. And uh, I think it's probably Christopher Bro. I'm trying to see where that is in the overall running. It's down a little bit. It, it tumbled down. It, yes, it is indeed Christoph Breuer. And third driver is Dieter Sch uh, Schmidtman. But uh, running in, I've found it, I've lost it. 22nd position. Let's have a look and see what sort of pace it's lapping at. I know I've fallen for this trick many, many times. Now there's proper smoke across the track from the drift competition. And the, lab, the yellow Lamborghini goes through that. That's on the Grand Prix loop. They're about to turn right, drop down the hill towards the Vidal Chicane. Good to have another car in the top class, but Renato Race uh, Motorsport team, new to me. So um, we'll see how they progress in this ultra competitive level at the top of the pile here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife in the ADAC. NLS, the Nürburgring Langstrecken Series, launched in sunshine. And Johnny, I haven't been able to say that for every year of the NLS um, and the VLN, its predecessor beforehand, so many times. Will the opening round happen? What have we got? Fog. We can't fly the medical helicopters. Can't start. We've got snow. Lovely day in the snow in the mountains, but alas, we want to go racing. So there have been many a time where we've been poised, waiting, and then you get the message the race is not happening or it's going to be foreshortened. But today, here, starting 2024, we're smiling. The other issue with the visibility is that marshal posts need to see the next marshal post both down the track and uh, before them too. So it's not just about uh, medical helicopters being able to navigate as well, but just being able to see the next portion of the racetrack is, uh, can be so trying around this region as now over the line. Aston Martin versus BMW. The BMW was very wayward indeed through Tiergarten. And that final jinking of left and right onto the main start finish straight. In fact, that BMW number 150 is moving around on the road quite a bit, actually. It seems to be an incredibly potent car, the Team Bilstein by Black Falcon entry. And this is for Steve Brown, for the man known simply by his social media handle, it would seem. So at MG Charudin. Manuel Metzger and uh, member of the RSL Collective and also, of course, key man in the sim racing world. Jimmy Broadbent is uh, driving this car this weekend, the M4 GT4. And it's uh, just crossed the line to begin another lap. Yeah, it certainly was being worked uh, for position around the circuit. I didn't know if it just come out of the pit because I'm just trying to get some heat into the tyres. But... Uh... Again, at least you've got the luxury of a width circuit to go go around here. And it's running, yeah, leading the SP8 T-Class, 25th position overall. So that's very, very good indeed. And what's not to enjoy? Spring sunshine, dry track, plenty of competition. Talking of competition, Grello's on the move. The Manti EMA Porsche is now right under the rear wing of Frank Stippler. This is the battle for second place. The number 16 Shearer Sport PHX Audi holds on for now and in the background is Martin Ragging. he's about three seconds further back in fourth but up front and it's going to be probably about six seconds clear is Nico Mensel it really is a very very good day for Falcon Motorsport 
with their Porsches running first and fourth. In fact, we've got three Porsches in the top four positions, just with that second place Audi spoiling their fun. Remember, Frank Stippen now 10 and a half seconds down on Nico Menzel, necessarily being slowed slightly as he tries to hold on to second place. And as before, Kevin Estra shows he quite likes the inside line down into the first corner. But then, then again, don't, don't forget Marcus Winkelhop when he's driving the Audi that's now in second place with Frank Stippler liked it as well Don't, and he also got uh, warned for a little bit of a um, push and shove as well so again we quite enjoy watching that but it's certainly very close second, third and fourth now nose to tail as they go through the Mercedes arena Got to make sure you get the wheels on the right way around on that Audi R8 yellow on the front red on the rear on the rims and possibly on the hubs as well as now Estra tries to the left tries to the right on the cut through you bend but there's no opportunity to get by there. And as these two squabble, they're obviously not going through the Grand Prix track as fast as they might have done in qualifying this morning. So Martin Raginger is latching himself onto the back of this and might well be, well, the, the car that they, neither of them spot to potentially gain one or even two positions as Estra is almost pushing Frank Stippler through the right-hand kink that leads into the Vidal chicane. Better hope they don't encounter a back marker on the exit of this left-right swoop. And once again, bolted to the left-hand side of the circuit is Stippler, Ragginger, showing his nose on the inside of the Frenchman's Grello Porsche. Still the same order, but I have no idea how they've managed that. Sometimes you just need to sit back and, and listen to the sound of these cars as they accelerate down the hill. Just imagine the G-forces, they're, they're feeling the fact that the hats and backs come at them thick and fast. And then as they come around the corner, what's in the middle of the track? Well, a car running in one of the junior classes round the outside. They go kicking up the dust. Kevin Estra goes to the edge. They've gone past the point at which the uh, tire wall had the BMW in it for a while. And now they're unleashed to go to what really start uh, stretching their legs but it's staying second third and fourth in the same order Frank Stippler in the Shearer Sport Audi Mantai EMA Porsche with Kevin Estra in third he'll be handing over at the halfway point in the race to Lawrence Van Tour and trying to hang on the back is uh, Falker Motorsport Porsche number three in the hands of Martin Ragging he's fallen back a little bit uh, but closes up they go around a flatbed truck yes a flatbed truck on the track but uh, the drivers are warned the marshals are fantastic put all the signs all the flags out to the let them know what's happening but don't forget when you've got a circuit that's 25 kilometers around it's not easy to get cars off the circuit and uh, certainly if you clang into the barriers you do need to be removed because uh, it's not like you've just got an infield and a, a grand prix loop they've got so much more to give this lap its length and frankly johnny its majesty yeah the uh, this place just can never be mastered if you like uh, uh, they talk about the perfect lap around maybe a five and six kilometer race circuit you'll be struggling to get a perfect sector here five of them timed this weekend down the hill then out of Arenberg as you duck underneath the road bridge and then into the foxhole properly called as such because of the trees that wrap around the racetrack and it feels like you're plunging down into well the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland perhaps but co coined as the foxhole and then all of a sudden the trees clear at ironically called Adenauer Forst where you should be in the denseness of the trees but you get that brief respite and the chance to catch the fans up on the high bank there on the left before then heading to Metzgersfeld the double left-hander second of those very very tricky particularly in the wet I remember Alexander Sims having a moment in the darkness and the the wet conditions a couple of years ago in his BMW so absolutely full throttle you might be able to hear in the background for that gaggle of cars for second third and fourth positions Jordan Peppers still in the top five in his Lamborghini Huracan GT3 Red Bull team at car with a very smart livery on that Huracan Evo 2 I think what we need to really paint in here is, you, you touched on it, Johnny, was the, the pace of uh, a one lap of Kevin Estra when he gained about, what do you reckon, about 10 seconds yeah. on the cars ahead. And the two cars ahead had pitted a lap earlier for their first pit stop. And in fact, that being the case, it's getting towards where the second pit stop for some of these top runners are going to have to happen. And normally, say you come in after six laps, then you'll come in after six plus eight, 14 laps, but your rivals will come in maybe on a lap. Uh, 15 because their first pit stop was earlier at the opening stint of the race but uh, for now Nico Menzel stretching his lead 10 and a half seconds to start of this lap that's 11 laps on the board they're going around lap 12 
So Falkland Motorsport Porsche number four leading the race. Number three, the sister car, is down in fourth place, but uh, that has got a different pit stop sequence. That made its first pit stop a lap later, as did the car in third place, which is Grillo, which is the Manti Motorsport Porsche. Now, a camouflage livery VW Golf going rather slowly, but some other cars are as well. So just checking the code 60s, there doesn't appear to be anything on the Grand Prix track. So I think it's two cars with similar problems, not abiding by a code 60 that's in place on the Grand Prix track, but instead suffering from punctures. Now this is the place to suffer a puncture on the Grand Prix track because at least then no, it's more severe, actually, I think, for the BMW in question, but at least then you can hope to limp back to the pit lane. You don't have to do a full lap. You can nip in via the back door into pit road at the very end of the Grand Prix circuit, but I don't think the 700 BMW is going to make it even that far. The Saugmeister-driven 325i from the V4 category. V4 is a, a production glass for two to two and a half litres, and it looks as though someone's driven out the car park and put 700 on the wheel. Fans besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. still trying to hunt down Kevin Esch in the third position and he is much closer to Frank Stippler for Share of Sports and the Audi so yeah Ragginger in danger here of waving goodbye to second and third positions but probably only until the next code 60 affected area which they're just heading on to the Dottinger Hoor now so they will have been through all of them in fact the next hope for Ragingar is that some of these cars up front get slowed by back markers, but because the Dottinger Hoor section is so wide, as long as there are no yellow flags being displayed, which there aren't currently, there might be the odd white flag here and there, but that doesn't prevent you from overtaking and indeed from going at top speed. Lights flashing from Frank Stippler to warn some of this slower moving traffic that they want to slice their way through, probably between Antonius Bucher and Tiergarten, which is where they are now. I really do think we should we should have a vote and put it out there to the World Motorsport Council that every circuit should have a really long straight on the way back towards the end of the lap because <laughs> we can see the top four cars all in shot, all together, albeit covered by just waiting for the last car to cross the line. All inside. I mean, it was a sizable amount of time. It was, let me see, eight seconds. But the advantage for Nico Menzel in the lead of the race has come down by about six seconds, no, five seconds on that lap. That's why they were all in shot. But even if it had stayed as it was, where the gap was about 12 seconds, first through to fourth place, we'd have still had them 
all in shot, but uh, anyhow, there we have it. But the closest uh, margin between any, uh, smallest margin between any of those top four runners is between second and third. It's still Frank Slipper holding down second place in the Shearer Sport PHX Audi. Still Kevin Estra tucked in behind. We've got uh, two hours and 10 minutes remaining in this race. Therefore, we're pretty much at the halfway halfway point in this opening four hour race. But the traffic slows right up as you go through the smoke from the drift zone. Oh, what a delight for all the drivers as they're making their way around the Grand Prix loop to have a face full of that. But uh, slow zone, so everybody on tiptoes waiting, asking no doubt where are we going to be released? At what point can we put the hammer down? Because certainly race leader Nico Menzel must be waiting for it. They're out of the slow zone now, now accelerating down the slope towards the Vidal chicane with the track sort of flips up a little bit to the right and certainly up a, a short incline then over the curbs left then right continue climbing up towards where the track flattens out you took the double left and then oh my word i'm on the nordschleifer through those two shabim smith's curves but uh no place changing for second place the audi just being put where it needs to be by frank stippler but uh oh, kevin estra almost looking up the inside as they go into the second of the two shabim smith's curves but he stays in third place and if uh Martin Ragging can get a bit of a move on. He lost out in traffic at the end of the previous lap. He will be able to watch this battle royal unfold in front of him for second place. But all along, you could say Nico Menzel sitting pretty, but he did have his lead halved on that previous lap. Yeah. Ten and a half seconds down to 5.6. So maybe his tyres are just starting to go a little bit. But uh, the first two cars, four and 16, the number four Falcon Motorsport Porsche and number 16 Shiro Sport PHX Audi are probably going to come in at the end of this lap where it's two cars giving chase the Manti EMA uh, Porsche that's kind of a 911 and the number three Falcon Motorsport Porsche should stay out for a further lap and then they can make hay when the sun is shining difficult to tell where that five seconds was made up whether it is just on pure pace as you suggest tyre wear or whether there was a a small section of Code 60, which again cleared in time for Frank Stippler to find his way through. But there wasn't much of a gap for that to happen. Ten seconds, which has now been halved, as you mentioned. 0.3 of a second separates Stippler from Estra. So Frank Stippler certainly having to keep his concentration at all times. And Martin Ragginger, have, having been able to pull closer to the two cars in front, four, second and third he in fourth but that gap is again opening back up again there seems to be very little that, that ragging can do about it the good news for him is that there's no immediate distraction from behind because jordan pepper is a full half a minute further back in the red bull at huracan and the best of the mercedes now dennis fetzer who took over from hubert Hout in the first pit stop for the sp9 pro-am entry there car number six and fetzer has just, I was about to say, just made another stop. No, he hasn't quite yet. We're on lap 13 now. And remember, those there was that collection of cars that pitted after... Five. It was five laps, wasn't it? Yes. I thought it was six, but you, you said five, and I um, think I'll probably go with that. Yeah, no, no. I've misled you because I'm missing, a, I'm missing the opening lap, so I think it was six it was laps. Six. And that's... Uh, that's the Nico Menzel car that pitted after six laps and Marcus Winkelhock, now Frank Stippler, after six laps. And we should therefore be able to now make 14 laps before those cars come back in again. So you can also convert the 911 Manti opening stint to a seven lap stint. Yeah. I'm basically a lap behind for all of them. And yes. apologies for that. I, I redid my notes, but then Good. I, I reread so my notes. Change the, the five about... to a six and change the six to a seven and we should be okay. Yeah, but what you'd really need to know in this four car lead back and effectively is the cars that are running first and second will be pitting a lap before the two that are giving chase. So that should put the 911 back into the lead of the race for Kevin Estra and Martin Ragging and the number three Porsche from Falcon Motorsport up into second place. Now, of course, when we get to their final pit stop, they'll also be making them a, a lap after their rivals, number four and 16, the Shearer Sport Audi and the other Falcon Motorsport car. And that will have an effect in that their final pit stop will be shorter. We'll get to that later. But anyhow, I would say at the moment, it's advantage. The 9 head from Porsche from Mante Motorsport and the number three Porsche from Falcon Motorsport. So it's looking very good for Porsche today. Three of the top four runners 
Lamborghini for Jordan Pepper, some distance back, about another almost a half a minute back in fifth place. Best of the Lamborghinis. And Mercedes, the fact we've only got one in sixth place uh, shows the problem because uh, that one had to serve a drive through penalty. That's why the number six car is down there after the jump start. And the sister car, number 14, is down in eighth place, but that was slowed with an extra pit stop with a slow puncture. So, really, Mercedes guns were spiked. And between them, in seventh, is uh, Dumaray, car number 17. That's this pro sport racing. Aston Martin, so uh, for Maxime Dumaray, going there or thereabouts, but for Aston fans, I'm sure they'd like to see their cars a little closer to the very front of the field. Much better for Emir Asari in the Max Cruiser Racing VW Golf, Mark 7. Very easy to lose this car in the landscape because it's painted in uh, or wrapped in that traditional camouflage livery where new cars are turned out and uh, you know the, the designers don't want viewers to see their lines as such i think i know a golf mark 7 fairly well these days but nevertheless they want it to be under wraps if you pardon the pun and that car which not too long ago was suffering from a puncture is back to full speed now car 10. but in a sort of funny way that's a tr now a traditional nurburgring livery because yes. so many so many prototypes are driven around or cars about to be launched are driven around the circuit endlessly as the manufacturers uh, test their capabilities it's hard to underestimate sorry to overestimate just how many cars are driven around here as the manufacturers try and sort them out you know not so long ago only a handful were but now it's just de rigueur mm. and certainly the japanese manufacturers aren't shy in coming over here as well we've got plenty of brilliant circuits over there but nothing provides the challenge of of the nord Schleife. and it is also the fact the weather can be challenging too so that's definitely part of the mix when you're trying to develop a car to the very very highest level right we're waiting to see who's going to twitch who's going to come in next time around and start that second run of pit stops Sven Market in his number 650 BMW 240i just heading through the Mercedes arena and down towards the cut through section leading 240i's indeed so 42nd overall but this is the best of those and it's normally a very well subscribed uh, category we reckon 24 classes in action this weekend and of the 240i's I reckon there's 12 cars and they've had uh, differing amounts of luck so far this is the best of them uh, just shy of half distance but Nico Menzel leading on lap 13 now by 5.6 seconds over Frank Stippler and we would expect therefore that well, actually, Menzel and Stippler are working lap seven, aren't they, of their current stint? They'll be in then, not the end of this one, but the one after that, we would expect, for, again, a dice on pit road. Top two pitting on the same lap, then the next three cars, i.e. Manti, Falcon, the other car, number three, and the Red Bull Lamborghini, all pitting after seven laps, so they can go another two and a bit. The Nürburgring Nordschleife just provides every challenge imaginable. So imagine you're the team chief. Your driver survived everything out on the circuit, behaved beautifully. As a, as a crew, they've done a great job. Then they get done for speeding in the pit lane. Makes you furious. One thing that makes you even more furious, perhaps, is if you fall below your minimum pit stop time. And unfortunately, car 117 has done just that. That's a uh, Halder Motorsport running the Porsche Cup 2 class, so they will get a stop and go penalty. You just think about all that work. In fact, it's a stop and go plus 19 seconds. Mm. Stop and stand. No oh, dearie me. Anyhow, the sun is shining. Try and look on the positive side. You can do it all over again, apart from the um, problem with the pit stop. Don't, yeah. do, don't do that again. Yeah, do all the, the fast bits again. Cop, uh, cop, copy those and then remove the mistake or the, the, yeah, the error that caused the penalty. Easier said than done, as away in the background, the Bilstein BMW darts its way into the pits. It is for driver known as uh, their social media handle, in fact, so MG Charadin in, no, leader... Michael to his mother. OK, thank you. And uh, leader of the SP8T class, got up to 26th overall just before that pit stop. I, or Mikhail actually, if I look at my notes properly, I was expecting our race leader to dive into the pits, which would be the number four Porsche, but Nico Menzel has done no such thing. So he's going to take it out to 14 laps duration. 
So a six lap stint followed by an eight lap stint, which is what we commented on a short, short while ago. I just didn't know if they're going to do a seven, but obviously on a day like this, on dry track conditions, you should be getting eight laps out of each of the stints. But they did that short first stint of six laps, as did the Shearer Sport PHX Audi, car number 16. But next time around, they should come in, and the time after that should be when Kevin Estra in the Manti EMA Porsche, the bright green and yellow, the Grello livery car. That can go a lap further, and can the second of the Falker Motorsport uh, Porsches. That's car number three, which is just staying a little distance, nearly four seconds off their tail in fourth place overall. There was a moment uh, in traffic and with slow zones that the number three Porsche got up onto the tail of the Manti Porsche, but uh, as I said, four seconds in arrears now, falling away very slightly indeed. And uh, we saw a couple of cars limping in, and uh, certainly on the Grand Prix loop, there's a, a safety vehicle following a, a pickup truck that's basically putting quick dry down, a, a sort of bright orange dust that goes down, and the dust gets kicked up, but that's to dry up whatever was dropped, and certainly there was a fair bit of lubrication. We had those two cars limping around the Grand Prix loop, and so better safe than sorry, so that's being tidied up as that goes through the Mercedes arena. So still got a fair bit of the Grand Prix loop to uh, tuck it up and clear, clear up the track. But there was also a, a concern for a sh very short period when Robert Wickens rejoined in his Elantra and it was trailing fluid. I thought it was fuel, maybe just a very slight leak or overfill coming out of the rear of the car. And it was in that sort of area of the track. So maybe uh, there's been various problems there that they're hoping to deal with in one fell swoop. I'll tell you what, the amount of fuel uh, liquid that was coming out of the back of Wickens' car through the first ride, then the left, if that was oil, that car would not still be running. Because no. the amount that was coming up, that it was a visual sort of spray rather than a sort of Indeed. invisible dribble. No, I think it was fuel, but uh, again, that's not going to help the outside line through the Mercedes arena. Very hard charging into Arenberg now for Martin Raginger. He's got I was about to say, a clear road in front of him. Partway round Arenberg, that was true. But then into the foxhole, various cars come into vision. The one he's still trying to hang on to the coattails of is the day glow yellow, green and yellow, Kevin Estra driven Porsche, which is becoming a slightly smaller speck on the horizon with every turn of the wheel. He can, he's still got visuals on it just about, but it's disappearing into the distance now. Uh, at Metzgersfeld and they're heading into Callenhard in a moment or two as well which is the right hander following this double left which is where Martin Raginger is arriving providing a brilliant viewpoint though on that fight up ahead between Frank Stippler and Kevin Estra Stippler having to keep the elbows out and use every bit of the width of this Nürburgring Nordschleife racetrack to keep the rapid Frenchman behind. Alessio Picariello looking very cool, calm and collected. It's been a fair while I suppose since he was at the wheel of the number four Porsche. About an hour or so ago he would have stepped out because we're at a minute past two now and officially halfway through this first race of the season. Gosh, there we have it. So for Alessio he'll be very busy. He'll be back here next weekend for the qualifying races and then following one he'll be opening the Fanatec GT World Challenge Asia. He's racing with last year's champion, Anthony Liu, who's crossed over to Absolute Racing. If you've ever been watching racing in the Far East, Absolute started about 2010, I think. They have grown and grown and grown. They run all sorts of manufacturers. They're based at Sepang and at Shanghai. It's a whole new industry, industry out there that you just have such a cosmopolitan uh, group of people doing their business. But for Alessio, he actually took his racing career out to the Far East, had several years over here trying to make it work as a single-seater driver. And sort of maybe it was the last roll of the dice, went out and raced in Formula Masters in China. And that's obviously done quite well, because certainly Porsche like him an awful lot indeed, and uh, have him in all sorts of uh, cars, all sorts of uh, places around the planet. So, you know, some drivers take an unusual route in their career. Mm. You could say they're very lucky, but increasingly these days it's the very wealthy are able to go the, the straightest route, which is up the FIA formulae. But um, certainly for Alessio Picari, I'm just doubling back to see what year. Yes, 2013, he went over, went over there, having done the ADAC Formula Masters Series in Europe, largely in Germany. He went the next year, 2013, and won... Sorry, 2013, he won the ADAC Masters Championship. 2015, he, uh, he... No, he didn't. When did he go over? Yes, he did. He went over to China in 2015. So it was a, a right-hand turn, and he's made it work for him. But right now, his car's going very, very well indeed. Thank you very much.
running in fourth place overall, but that and the Grello Porsche are up in front for Manti Racing. Third and fourth at the moment, but they have the advantage. They took that later first pit stop, and it really does yield rewards as you work your way through the race. Yeah, they may not be immediate because, of course, you head away from the first pit stop if you pitted later with not necessarily the race lead, but it's a game of patience because that will pay back, assuming everything remains equal in the meantime, but that will pay back, as you've said, in the final stint because that final stint is mapped to the end of the race in that final 70 minutes and uh, how many how many minutes you've got to go bruce has got the official table governs how long you've got to spend in the pits just to give you an idea it might seem there are, there are myriad rules but this one is quite simple except it takes an entirety of a, a page of a4 for all, all the figures if you stop with one minute remaining in the race, which is probably fairly unlikely for your final pit stop, it'll only have to be at just under three minutes, 178 seconds, but let's be more realistic. Say you stop with 50 minutes to go before the end of the race, so th you've made three hours and 10 minutes from the start of the race, before our race, your pit stop will be 307 seconds. If you make come in, let's say, a lap earlier than that, laps at eight, sec eight minutes, so you're gonna come in at 42, 286. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a time, advantage of 21 seconds effectively yeah. a lap later and your final pit stop will be about 20 21 seconds shorter so that's done on every minute every is it? minute from from one minute from the end of the four hours or end of the race to in fact my chart gives me to 69 minutes 69 minutes yeah so it's before the end so the, the, the closing chart, the final hour, there or the there final hour effectively and the, the, the difference between minute to minute is about three seconds by and large okay not always, but... Uh, no, some are two, some are three. I think it's on average. It, it sort of rotates around there. But what you need to know, with a good clean lap of just over eight minutes, eight minutes, ten, you, it's about 20, 21 seconds difference. Yeah. Advantage, if you've made that first pit stop later. Slow intervention vehicle, well, obviously, because they don't go that fast, funnily enough, down the Dottinger Hoor, uh, trying to stay as far to the right as possible. I think already having dealt with an incident and now trying to get back to where that vehicle is normally parked during the race as both the second and the third place cars will come in together. The race leader, I reckon, is pitted on this lap as well. So we possibly were not expecting them all in. Wasn't at expecting the, end of that the Manti lap. car. I was expecting the first two, four and 16. So they've come in after another eight, eight laps, which would make it, yeah, 14 laps on the board. But also to have the number 911 in as well. That means into the lead of the race we go Martin Raginger in the number three Porsche. Now, I don't know if he's going to do two stints in a row because not long ago we saw his teammate uh, sitting there looking cool and calm but doing an interview, which was an SEO Picari Yellow. So he could have time because don't forget he's got eight eight minutes or eight minutes and change. Or if there's a slow zone, nine minutes around the lap. Let's see. Last, yeah, the last laps were 8, 12, 8, 13. Yeah, so he's got plenty of time. But I think they might keep ragging here and for, do stints two and three. And Picariello the lead, the first stint and the final one. Uh, nothing against Martin Ragnier, but I would think they will favour Picariello to do the opening and the final stints as they are the sort of most important. I'm sure we're only talking about the odd hundredth of a second here and there, but on average times, if Picariello can be more consistent, then they'd sooner him to be in at the end with the potential to win the race and yep. also to, to make up for any code 60s that might be creeping in. So let's keep ragging her in the car until we learn any different. But there'll definitely a driver change in the sister Falcon Motorsports car with Menzel out and Ericsson back in again. Uh, the way Manti seem to be running it then is that they're gonna, just going to do seven laps throughout, which is another way of, uh, you know, we've seen that done from teams previously too. If it's a 28-lap race, then that's fine. Four lots of seven. Yeah, well look at Manti's record across the year and they clearly know what they're doing quite well <laughs> around here but uh, you know for, for Falcon Motorsport it made absolute sense the cars were separated by a lap first of the first round of pit stops and will be again this time around Jordan Pepper did be mentioned is also coming on this lap I hadn't quite got him into my little notebook of pit stops and the third pit stop for the number six Mercedes as well don't forget they had to come in for a drive through after lap two and they did a four laps to their first proper pit stop, then eight laps to the second one. But uh, the outrider in that is the number three 
Falcon Motorsport Porsche moved into the lead of the race. It was fourth in the hands of Martin Ragging. It will go into the lead, but next time around, that will be calling to what will maybe be quite a quiet pit lane. New set of Falcon tyres on board. And just to increase the challenge as uh, Falcon tyre brand uses the races in the NLS to develop their, their rubber for towards their road range as well, also making performance tyres, but uh, to make it difficult for themselves, or in fact more of a challenge. A couple of years ago, they ran a Porsche and a BMW M6 as well. That's true. In the SP9 class, so they could develop, uh, you know, for two different manufacturers. And, uh, right now, Grello back onto the track. I presume it'll flip over from Kevin Estrick. He's been very kind. He's letting his teammate Lawrence Van Tor have a go in the second half of the race. And certainly Kevin was busy every single lap of that, but uh, they've got the jump on some of those around them, as it should be, because Joel Oaks back out onto the track. He came in, remember, it was about five, just under six seconds clear of the best of the rest. The Shira Sport uh, Audi back in the hands of Marcus Winkelhock, and then tucked in behind is Lawrence Van Tor. They're still in the top four, but the order's been shuffled because that number three Falcon Motorsport Porsche did not pit, but it should be next time around. And we wait to see whether there is a driver change. I suppose Picariello has had all of this time to get the race suit back on again, and uh, ragging and not yet through the third sector of this, his 15th lap. Frank Meyer has just gone on a very quick one for the Glickenhaus. That's its best lap of the race so far. Remember, not running as a GT3 car, but instead uh, SPX. So rather than SP9, where the GT3s slot in and in three different subcategories, Pro, Pro-Am and Am, then SPX is where that one can be found. And that is the only SPX car in today's race, the Glickenhaus. SCG 004C to give it its full name and Frank Meyer has just done a an 816.1 which is decent considering we've still got yellow flags at Hohenrein right at the end of the lap but otherwise the code 60s have all been lifted now and around the outside of one of the slower hatchback cars goes race little former race leader Joel Erickson remember it's Ragginger who should now lead the race and depending on how they slotted in it does appear that the Lamborghini got the best stop there now of course the Porsche of Estra could spend less time in the pits because it only a seven lap stint and of course Pepper as well so Jordan Pepper Kevin Estra doing seven laps can spend less time on the pit lane than Nico Menzel slash Joel Erickson and Frank Stippler now Marcus Winkelhock did so that will swing the pendulum again, back in the direction of those cars that have just completed seven laps. OK, I, th I think really Manti Racing are going, we're bottled up behind the Shira Sport Audi. We could stay out and hope we don't have a slow zone on, on the lap, we're due to come in a lap later, but, um, you know, you've got sort of basically three middle pit stops, no strictures on them, and so, yeah, less fuel goes into that car, because it didn't require it, had an extra extra laps worth it, and I think that would be big difference right I've got, you know, I sometimes set little challenges see what happens when someone takes over a car down in 13th place the car that started on pole position Frank Bird has been running it Danny Junkadea has taken over and the best lap for that car so far is 8 minutes 11 I just want to see how low the Flying Spaniard can get that down to because I think that car is capable of getting down given a clear lap to the pace of the very quickest cars it's, why not in his hands so let's see if he can shave a mere 10 seconds off that and get to a competitive time. In fact, the fastest lap is still uh, 8 minutes 0 0.123 seconds, still set by uh, the number three Porsche from Falcon Motorsport. That was Alessio Picariello on about what, lap three, lap two? Lap three, I think it was, yeah, this okay. time around. Also noting that uh, the third of the Lamborghini Huracans is going rather well now in the hands of Christoph Breuer. So, Danny. Kubasic and uh, Sak Nana are the drivers in the Renato race, uh, Renato Motorsport Team Evo 2. As perhaps somebody getting a late call there to head to the front of the garage with the car imminently expected in pit lane. So the order should be something like this. Martin Ragginger leading from now Laurence Vantor moving up to second place by virtue of he 
that car being uh, needing to spend less time on the pit lane compared to the two, or compared to one Falcon Motorsport Porsche and the Shearer Sport Audi. And the Joel Erickson pit stop was about a second faster than the Audi. Then they came in. It wasn't those two cars that came in together, was it? Because the Ericsson or the, the number four Porsche had a slightly better lead or a bigger lead over the Manti car anyway. So even though one or two seconds were gained here and there, it should still mean that Ericsson has a better position on the road than the Shearer Sport Audi. But it's Ragginger who should be pitting at the end of this lap, 14 in total who will govern the speed in a moment or two, and that's who they're all looking to chase, but it will help that he's parked up for the best part of two and a half minutes in a moment or two. Somewhere in that long fourth sector, which takes just over three minutes and is now fully green. In fact, the, the whole of the racetrack is green, which is a rare treat for everyone. The Conrad Motorsport car arriving into Tiergarten and Hohenrein now just behind one of the Aston Martins, which is the 179. Not up to race pace, is it? No, it's, no, it's doing okay. It's looked uh, slightly slower than normal, but it it's not did. in the pit. It looked as though it might have just had a little mistake. Still a motorsport running, obviously, uh, one, uh, one in the SP9 class, but that's uh, class below the GT4. Yeah, this is a GT4 car, car, in fairness. So. It would be slightly slow, but it did look as though there may be a little bit of outbreaking and it was a driver gathering himself t together all over again. And through, through that quick dry, it runs around the Mercedes arena through to the double right, which is the first hander through the long, long left. You can still see the line. The driver's very wisely actually running a little bit downhill from there and uh, just trying to stay off. You don't want anything extra on your tyres. It certainly helps dry up the whatever liquid was down. And in fact, they did pretty much put it down to the point at which we saw uh, the uh, Robert Wickens driven Hyundai Elantra that we saw you know, pouring liquid out of the back, but it did seem to suddenly stop before it got to the two-thirds point in the Mercedes arena, so maybe that was the offending. Or maybe it's just a case of playing it safe, Johnny. Just thinking, let's not have it. I'm just going to keep an eye now. I want to see what pace we're getting from Danny Juncker there. I'm itching to see if he can improve from 8 minutes 11 in the number 14 out racing team Mercedes, because I certainly think he should be able to make that car fly. But, of course, it's a very long lap. So I have to wait a very long time for him to get, get around to... Uh, see if I'm right or wrong, but the fact we've got green flag laps is great. But no one's lapped at all fast recently. They've all been either just coming out, getting their tyres up to speed, they're on full fuel loads as well. That's not True. to be um, forgotten in the early stage of this race. But then again, of, of this stint, but bear in mind that the fastest lap of the race, I think it was lap three, might have been lap two. They were still on pretty heavy fuel loads from the start of the race. Now the Dottinger Hoare is affected by uh, either one incident or multiple problems because various marshal posts waving the yellow flags, Tiergarten and the early part of Dottinger Hoare uh, could be potentially slow. Just heading through that section a moment or two ago, one or two cars now just getting to the pit lane, including one of the two Sirocco's in the entry. We've got the... Danny Brink driven uh, 476 car and where's the other Sirocco that is the VT2 front wheel drive category one number 480 so this is lap it will be lap 16 for the race leader Martin Ragginger but he's just come into pit lane and that's what we expected so at the end of lap uh, 16 Will they do the switch? Is it lap 15? Lap okay. 15, yeah, it's yeah. 15. So he did first pit stop after seven, add eight laps to that. He's absolutely Fine. doing the textbook run. The one who swerved away from that, having been on that first stint of coming in after seven laps, was the Manti Porsche. It did seven lap stint, followed by a seven lap stint. Has it helped it gain position on the track? Yes, it has, Has it? because what it needed to do, 911 needed to get ahead of the Shearer Sport Audi that had been sitting in front of it and frustrating and I'm clear absolutely sure that's precisely why they said okay actually yeah you might gain the advantage of staying, but just just come in now come in now yeah, we'll yeah. have a shorter pit stop and it's been a done deal and it was well yeah there's always been an argument that four lots of seven 
can be better. Again, it depends when you're catching code sixties and when there's traffic here and there as well, but keeping it consistent, therefore you're in the pit lane for the same amount of time, certainly in the early part of the race, seven laps, seven laps, seven laps, seven laps, and then hope the checker comes out at the end of 28 laps in total. But others deciding to do seven and then eight to the finish, presumably. And then we've had the scenario for John Erickson, Nico Menzel doing six laps in the opener, and then they'll do eight to the finish. So I like this. There's sort of three different routes to the checkered flag, and one of them is going to be the winner. But we don't quite know which yet. And there was a driver change in the number three Porsche because Raginger's got out, and Picariello, fleet of foot, was able to get suited and booted after his interview with with uh, Lucas Gajewski and uh, Picariello. Alessio Picariello now in the number three car. Now, another factor that gives team more scope today is the fact they look at the sky and it's the same color as the flanks of the, the Glickenhaus. It's uh, sky blue and therefore they're not having to sort of bring their pit stop stops forward thinking they might have to uh, rush in to get to wet weather tires. We look as though we're set fair for this race. It's been a fabulous way to start the 2024 ADAC Nürburgring Langstrecken Series let the track do the talking rather than having to constantly think is it going to rain and it, we know johnny any circuit if you leave it a lap too long to change onto wet weather tires could be crucial but if it's a 25 kilometer lap oh my word if you just think no no it's fine and then you're just going out onto the north life you go actually it's not fine it, it's very much not fine and i've got to tiptoe around on my slick tires and get to the end of the lap when everybody else has been able to change so yes we talk about traffic giving and taking, but uh, the weather can do it in a much, much bigger way. Excellent sector two time from Picardi Yellow. So um, I was banging on about the fact that uh, Falcon would want to hold him back to the uh, crucial closing stint. Not a bit of that. I suppose what they're trying to do is keep their drivers as fresh as possible. And Picariello reclining in the garage in the hour or so between his stints. So he's just done a 103.7 through the second sector on brand new Falcon tyres. The only other car driver equivalent to that, Marcus Winkelhock in his Audi down in the 103s through sector two. Other cars, Vantor lost about two and a half seconds in comparison in his Grello, Grello Manti Porsche. And the sister Falcon car did a 105, nearly a 106 through the second sector. These are minor fluctuations, but they could well have a ripple effect through to the end of the lap. We'll see how Picariello carries that speed through on lap 16 of the race. It came in, of course, car number three as the race leader, but will have dropped places now. Right. Again, you just have so many screens you have to look at, but uh, one of the important ones was a, 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 a yellow flag at... Uh, Fair siphon that's been upgraded to <laughs> code 60, slow zone. Slow zone becomes up to code 60. Then, as soon as I've said it, it's cleared. How about that? <laughs> Horrible clouds, or oh, they're gone. Yes. Well, that can so easily happen as well. And uh, important not to react too much, I suppose, to things going on around you. They feel very damaging at the time. And then the car that you're racing also then has to deal with a code 60 or three abreast. Uh, Astras, let's say, in front and have to get out the throttle of the result and then you gain all that time back again. So, yes, this place can be punishing at times, but it can also benefit you massively on just a single lap sometimes. I've got to stop you there. It's gone back to code 60 at uh, the Versailles. There you go. So, go. as soon as they wave, get the message across, they go, either there's something more we need to clear up or someone else has, has a moment there. But uh, the, the officials running these races, they just have to be so supremely on their toes and it's a formula they've worked on for years and it really worked but it is come what may even after a four hour round you can imagine the race director goes oh thank you I'll sit down for a bit now I will just uh, <laughs> unwind because you know yeah. in a regular circuit a four hour race with a hundred and something cars A they wouldn't fit but I mean you know you're going to be on your toes but this is far from a regular circuit down through the gears you might be able to hear the engine note in the background that's uh no doubt a car heading to one of the slower portions of the circuit at Aremberg or into the carousel and yes acceleration's got to be good out of the slower speed corners and often uphill as well through Klostertal and Kesselschen and the run up towards Hoa Act but you need a car that's good on the brakes as well so so important again 
talk about race officials and those organising an event like this. They've got to be very quick in making their decisions when we're actually in the race, but prior to that, getting the balance of performance uh, correct, so crucial too. And there will be adjustments to that, I'm sure, through the course of the year. So these are qualifying events, yes, for the 24 hours of the Nürburgring, but also important to get lots of data on board from a BOP perspective to make sure that uh, all the various key manufacturers start as even as possible. Just been taking a look, Johnny, at uh, how the SPX class is going, because there's only one car in it, but it's the Glickenhaus racing car, and Lance David Arnold's taken over, because... Uh, car kicked off the race started by Thomas Much, then it went in the hands of Frank Meyer. Two drivers who know that click in house really well, but Lance David Arnold does not. It's great to have him on board, huge success here at the Nürburgring over the years, but his career recently has sort of fallen back a little bit, but it's uh, good to have the German racer here. And don't forget, he, he's had good results, came second in the Nürburgring 24 hours back in 2014 in the Black Fork and Porsche with Jeroen Blakemolen, Christian Menzel and Andreas Siemensen and uh, he was third the following year so really successful round here but you know sometimes you back the wrong horse or whatever but you know if I was running Glickenhaus racing he's exactly the sort of driver I'd get on board as we said earlier in the in the race that uh, Cove Lederga is going to come over mm. and join them to make a quartet for the Nürburgring 24 hours so we will have to uh, come here next weekend because it's the qualifying races for this year's 24 hours of the Nürburgring and all going to be covered as you said live on radio show limited network of channels and uh, we'll see who slots in but I'm particularly pleased because I've always been a big fan of Lance Davids because I think he's done a fantastic job over the years but you know sometimes you just aren't in the top teams anymore but it's good to see Glick and House Racing you've got him on board see what he can do great run from Joel Erickson now onto the Dottinger Hoare on Lawrence Van Tor Porsche's nose to tail and Joel Erickson does not want to move a muscle in the cockpit just gently coaxing the car to the right then to the left but principally wants to stay stay in the wheel tracks they've also caught a cup two car I think which is the 133 maybe I saw the number as it whipped by let's just have a look there we have got a 133 so it can't be that anyway they were able to use that as effectively a double toe certainly for the case of Joel Erickson he was and did Erickson get in front of Laurence Vantor I wonder only the order that they reappear at Hohenrein will provide the answer so Picariello who led the previous lap but remember he led from the pit lane so he drops back who's going to be crossing the line very shortly indeed to then to now be the new race leader will it be Vantor will it be Ericsson as we concentrate on the 3-1-1 Audi TT which had those difficulties earlier on in the race and uh, yellow flags back at Tiergarten and the end of the Dottinger Hall now did that happen after the race leaders got through yes it did because it is still Vantor just ahead of Joel Ericsson but they're only separated by 0 0.351 of a second and Ericsson I'm sure all over the back of Vantor as they break for the first corner right top five positions covered by just under 14 seconds the car that I think is the effective race leader is the car in fifth position it's the number three Falker Motorsport Porsche Alessio Picariello has just taken it back over from Martin Raginger but if he's just 13.794 seconds behind our race leader just remember the final pit stop the third and final pit stop they've done two so far he will gain an advantage if we worked out 20 to 21 seconds yes there's a clear lap but if we have a slow zone that will actually stretch his advantage even more so uh, certainly looking good for Falker Motorsports on the one hand and their sister car is running second at the moment but that is effective third place uh, for Joel Ericsson so it's like there's a little trump card in the hand of the number three Falker Motorsport Porsche because it was the, the last of the front runners to make the second of its three planned pit stops and that has bought it an advantage bought it they've worked for it they paid for it early on by having the longer first pit stop than those that pitted early but uh, it's coming back and certainly traffic's been quite good for them too but i'd say the two cars that have really been the pace setting cars in this race are the 911 manti racing porsche and that number three falcon motorsport car don't forget the number three had that side-by-side -side contact with a hyundai elantra uh, tcr class car of robert wickens we saw the damage light damage 
on the right hand flank of the sort of Rob Wickens's car, but didn't see if there was any damage for the number three Porsche. But we must say the pace it's been able to run whenever we've been able to judge it clearly, whenever there's been a clear lap, has been very strong indeed. But every time we get a yellow, a slow zone created, it means it's another lap in which it's very hard to see the ultimate pace of the car. So it's slightly masked, but in terms of their separation from the lead of the race, certainly the number three. Picaro Yellow driven number three Falcon Motorsport Porsche has the advantage. Just under 14 seconds down, that final pit stop should be 20, 21, 22 seconds faster. So by my maths, that's good. And as Van Tor and Ericsson now head along the hats and back for the 17th time, uh, really, again, nothing separating them. They were nose to tail heading through Sabina Schmidt's curve as the number 150 Bilstein sponsored SP8T BMW M4 heads around the Grand Prix circuit and ticks off another lap within SP8. Still leading, still leading the class. It's Simon Steve Brown, Brown, Steve Brown. Who's Sorry, yeah. driving right now, yes. So uh, I'm not sure whether Jimmy Broadbent's done a stint yet. They're into a code 60 on the Grand Prix track. I'm sure I saw a message earlier saying he had a bit of a bad back, so maybe he wanted a bit more of the day to go past. So Jimmy, could, you mean? Jimmy, yeah, mm -hmm. so he could um, recover, get himself comfortable. We've got a BMW being towed around the Grand Prix loop, and we'll go the back way into the pits. It's just on the ascent towards the Vidal chicane, so of course you can sort of slightly go around the outside of that without too much... Uh, obstruction but it clear line of sight for those uh, giving chase but good to see that number 150 bmw being backed off sufficiently by steve brown just uh, acknowledging the flags not not overtaking the course vehicle yeah and uh, anticipating things well there so yeah there are, there is a yellow flag at the vidal chicane it's yet to be uprated to a a code 60 tiergarten affected by the speed limited section, as is Hohenrein immediately after it. Ver Siphon has a code 60 as well. And the Advan Arch restricted too. So there are various different places and spots where the marshals are dealing at the moment. It's exactly 2.30 in the afternoon. Fans besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS.
last hour and a half now of the first Nürburgring Langstrecken Series race of the year. It's all live here on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. Bruce Jones and Johnny Palmer taking you through it with uh, occasional interviews with Lucas Gajewski as well. And if we have English speakers winning the race, of course, we will pause to hear their thoughts. Manti EMA in the Grello Racing Porsche now uh, shown as the race leaders, they were able to take that lead because of a pit stop that was done slightly out of sequence from the Manti and one of the Falcon Motorsport Porsches. That on on that occasion, it was Martin Raginger handing back to Alessio Picariello, and they have slipped to fifth place as a result of that pit stop after eight laps. So Lawrence Vantor now leading by a very slim margin. They started this lap. By, separated by just over a quarter of a second and it's ebbing and flowing really perhaps but it, perhaps in the favor of the Belgian rather than the chasing Swede but it's nip and tuck on this lap and actually the Swede gains back about three tenths of a second through the long sector four so we will get a true value at the end of lap 17 in fact don't really need the stopwatch because here comes Joel Eriksson in the slipstream but now is he going to get out of the gas because of the Sirocco not really showing its intentions. Ah, oh, that's because we're going into double wave yellows and then the code 60 at the end of the lap. So thankfully, Ericsson saw that happening. It would have been brave anyway to stay on the right-hand side of Lawrence Van Tour and try and thread the needle between a much slower Volkswagen Sirocco. And in the end, that was uh, the better decision for me. Joel Ericsson deciding, I'm just going to get out of this and stay right in behind Van Tour. Could have been a whole heap of penalties, couldn't it? He, he could have got one, two, three penalties there. In fact, I tell you what, sir, take your helmet off. Uh, you're over for the day. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, right thing, tucked in behind. So Mantor lives with a 9.11 from Manti EMA to fight another day, leading 16 laps about to go on, 17 laps about to go on the board. And uh, certainly Falcon Motorsport, don't forget, they've got two bullets in their gun because they've got the number four in second place, Joel Erickson, and number three down in fifth, that's Alessio Picariello. And uh, bear in mind that... Uh, the Picari yellow car, number three, will be making its final pit stop a lap later. So it's got about a 20-plus second advantage in its pocket at the moment. And in terms of uh, the time on the clock, it's only four and a half seconds down in fourth. Just, no, sorry, a bit more than that. Just waiting for that to come up on my screen. Wait a second, sorry. Flip over. It was about uh, 14 seconds. Oh, got a car. Uh, Left-hand wheels on the left-hand side of the track as the cars go across dotting her. It's about to make the climb. Oh, dear, it's the car that uh, Jack Aitken was hoping to get lots of mileage in. So did Micah Stanley. It's 4.66. It's uh, the car, as you said, Johnny, early in the broadcast. Not one you'd expect a driver who's racing at the top level in the WBC to have under his under himself. It's that the Hyundai Jack, I-30i. I think. And it uh, just, yeah, scrolling down shared with uh, Joseph Warhurst and, uh, Joe Warhurst and uh, Micah Stanley. But that is unlimping and it's not going where they want it. Getting it back towards the pit, but it's one of those long, slow runs in. Has it got a puncture? Certainly looks that way. Yeah, Jack Aitken shown at the wheel in the 466, 70th position in the overall standings and second place for the front wheel drive VT2 cars. So competitive because there were 12 starters in that class. Yeah. So, you know, it was going well and he'd be gaining experience, but uh, alas, it's, this bit of experience isn't the bit he particularly wanted to gain, it must be said. And have we also now got another problem for the Max Cruiser Racing VW Golf, the alternatively fueled car? which is shown in the final sector. And in fact, it did that penultimate sector in a much slower time than you would expect. So this is the second puncture, I reckon, for the number 10 camouflage liveried VW Golf. And uh, it's going to be a long, long run home from there. Um, it's already, of course, been delayed, as I say, in the previous sector too. So a, a game of patience for the Max Cruiser car. The other Max Cruiser racing entered machine, which is a Porsche for Benny Leuchter, has just entered the pits as the Cup 2 race leader, though. So car 100, much better placed in its relevant class. And bear in mind, that's the one that Nico Otto was fighting uh, with Tim Shearbart to take the lead in the class on a restart and uh, was... Uh given that we're watching you for your slightly robust tactics and uh, strange lines across the grass uh, manoeuvres. So they've got that warning, that sort of Damocles ha hanging over them, but obviously uh, it's been driven very well since then in terms of uh, not upsetting the race officials. But uh, let's take a look at the front of the field. 0.35 of a second or 0.349 between the, the race leader 
which is uh, Lawrence Van Tour, Manti EMA Porsche, car number 911, and Joel Eriksson giving chase in the number four Porsche from Falker Motorsports, keeping the Porsches away from having a top three. The entire top three is Shira Sport PHX, the Audi of Marcus Winkelhock. He's sharing with uh, Frank Stippler, who'll come back to take the final stint of the race in about uh, 20 plus minutes. We've got uh, an hour and 22 remains in this opening four hour race. And again, just waiting for the track to be green the whole way round, waiting to see what sort of ultimate pace can be set. So far in the race, we know it's uh, just eight minutes, zero seconds, point one, two, three. And that's Alessio Picariello early in the race. He's back into that number three Porsche, and he's now moved up ahead of uh, Kelvin van der Linde's Red Bull team, uh, excuse me, Lamborghini. So he's moved up to fourth overall, effective race leader, because we know his final pit stop will be shorter than that of his rivals. So he's going the right way, 14 seconds down. And I'd say that gives him an effective lead of about seven seconds when it comes to the final pit stops being completed. Yeah, so we'll see at what point these cars will want to pit. Manti not going the full distance that it's possible for them to do. And Lawrence Fantor having taken over on lap, the start of lap 15, should therefore, if we follow the pattern, be in at the end of lap 22 or 21. We'll see how, how things go. Uh, but Fantor happy at the moment to be just ahead of Joel Eriksson in the number four car for Falcon Motorsports, then Shera Sports Audi for Marcus Winkelhock trailing by almost six seconds from that leading duo. And Benny Leuter did really well, actually, in the Cup 2 race leading car to get up back into the top six overall. That car's now pitted, as has the 148 Cup 2 car. And that's uh, Noah Nagelsdijk, is, is it not? I seem to remember that's his first name. It's, yeah. a, it's a very familiar surname. But uh, he's just pitted in the 148 car for that car's second pit stop of the race. So 148 working its way back into contention for a good result. So, uh, yeah, Noah Nagelsdijk, Tobias Muller, uh, Steve Yance are the lineup in the Black Falcon Team 48 Losch entered car. That's a full pro lineup. And the Aston Martin, number 169, turning left now from the Grand Prix track. The Dua Motorsport car for Oscar Sandberg, Aaron uh, Venish, and Nick Wustenhagen, which qualified in the SP10 category, 28th overall a little earlier on today. 169 at the moment is the second place car in SP10 for Wustenhagen. Right, the latest car to pick up recognition, but that means punishment in this case. Car number 470, unfortunately, that has a stop and go penalty plus 30 seconds for speeding in at the pit lane. That was the Auto Thomas by Young Motorsport Cupra. They haven't seen too much of that, but unfortunately for them, the race officials did. And, uh, oh, as I say that, someone else has got a bigger penalty. A stop and go with a, a 60 seconds at a standstill. And uh, we've got a car that has uh, rather made a mess of things. They're trying to put it on a flatbed at the moment. It's uh, car number, is that 431 or is it 831? If it's 831, oh my word, that, that, that's the uh, Elantra. Hyundai Elantra, which uh, Mark Wilkins and uh, Rob Wickens were sharing. Just trying to scroll down. It's uh, at the side of the track, but it's looking a little bit, little bit battered there. So Rob Wickens is still listed in that. The car's still listed as running. Is it 831? I don't want to... But it's uh, had a clatter against the barriers. So it's left the circuit. Left though, the Bruce. circuit. I mean, it's, it's gone over the top. I it's hit the tyres that hard that it's actually flipped it over the track. And yeah, over... It's right at the end of the lap. It's the it final is. corner of the circuit. It's effectively where the barriers suddenly seem as though they're going completely across the front of the car. The cars, the, the tyres have slowed it, but it seems to have uh, gone over the top and is sitting four wheels square on the ground, albeit on a bank. Again, slight hesitation. I was trying to work out exactly where it was. Now, understandably, those pictures aren't making the, the main feed because there will be concern uh, for all involved at the end of the circuit. We have been talking about there being uh, Code 60 in place at Tiergarten and Hohenrein for a, a little while. 
and that's obviously meant, meant that tyres have been scattered all over the place but the car clearly uh, being flipped over the barrier effectively and landing uh, away from the safety zone of the racetrack this is exactly where this battling Porsche scrap is about to arrive as well. So hence the reason why there are double waved yellows, but uh, Joel Erickson getting a really good run on Lawrence Van Tor and will take the race lead, in fact, just before the single waved yellow that begins this whole section where the Code 60 is in place. Yeah, and immediately off the power. But the important thing for the Falker Motorsport is they've got the nose in front, the number four. 911 has moved ahead of the number 911, 911. So Manti Racing and Lawrence Van Thorpe back to second place. Winkelhock in third place, the Shearer Sport, Sport, excuse me, Audi in number 16. And right on his tail now is Alessio Picariello. Just remember that number three car that uh, Picariello is driving for Falcon Motorsport is the car that should make its final pit stop a lap after all three rivals. And the top five cars, four cars will be covered by 10 seconds, I reckon. <laughs> So past that scene, and uh, obviously any more news we get, we will bring that to you. Jack Aitken, meanwhile, putting a brave face on, putting a brave face on matters uh, down the Dottinger Hoor, uh, when he had his tyre let go. Driving in a slower car is a lot of fun. What happened at the recent end of the scene? I was actually scheduled to pit this lap, and then I heard a weird noise coming from the front left, front left of the car. Everything, everything felt fine, fine, so I was like, okay, I'm not sure what's happening. They slowed down a little bit, and I thought maybe that the tyres started to uh, delaminate, because it was making a, a, a noise like that. And um, I reduced the speed a bit, but then coming through the last corner, the wheel deflated completely, and uh, it actually came off the rim also, so then I had no steering anymore. Uh, luckily, the car seems fine, and uh, I just came back very, very slowly on the grass to try to keep everything okay. So... Um, Hopefully everything's okay. Obviously. We saw another TCR car limping back to the pits as well recently after you, but there was no touch, no contact, nothing. No, I didn't touch any other car. I think it was uh, two separate accidents. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Also, viele ist los draußen auf der Strecke, sagt Jack Aitken. Es war keine Berührung, hatte einfach das Gefühl, dass der Reifen Luft verliert. Und deswegen hat er das Auto schon langsam an die Box zurückgebracht. Ansonsten viel, viel So, Jack Aitken there talking uh, to Lucas Krajewski. And the first word I heard as we flipped over was him saying scary, but then he was saying and fun. So his experience yeah. around the Nürburgring. But again, for him, just for Jack, you think about where he competes, you know, racing for Cadillac in the World Endurance Championship. He's in the top class here. He's on a circuit he doesn't know terribly well. And he's in a car that is appreciably slower than the very best of the lot. He was already here last year, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think it would be great if we could come back as teammates in the future. You know, it would be a lot of fun for a team uh, like we have. But, yeah, we'll see. Do you already have an idea if we can uh, see you this year at the 24-hour race? Unfortunately uh, not, because I, there is a clash with the IMSA calendar, uh, which I know for many drivers in that paddock is a real shame. We all want to be here, so uh, hopefully in the in the next years there is a bit more cooperation there. Well, it's, it's an interesting point that Jack makes. Of course, uh, the importance for the Nürburgring, I suppose, is to not, not clash with any key European race meetings. They'd also like as many uh, ACO rules drivers as possible too. But, um, I mean, some, there was one occasion when the Nürburgring 24 hours was held on the same weekend as the Le Mans 24 hours, I think. Sometimes they've been weekends apart. Let's hear more from Jack. We are in the timing because uh, I think it was going quite well until uh, the puncture, but I had to come back very, very slowly. So for sure we lost a couple of minutes or something like this. Um, but you know, car seems fine, so we keep pushing. Maybe we're still in the top five. I don't know. I need to look. Viel Zeit verloren gegangen durch den langsamen Weg. So Jack Aitken, uh, Mika Stanley, and Joe Warhurst are the three drivers assigned to the Hyundai i30N. And a smile at the end of Jack's interview with Lucas Gajewski. Yes, they're further back now than they would have wanted to have been, but they sound like they turned the car around fairly rapidly to get it back into the race. And uh, that's the one thing that Jack can take in his stride and not let it affect him, I suppose, is uh, little, little moments like that to hopefully not affect 
their result too badly. They're still running fourth in VT2 front wheel drive, although that car's not actually crossed the line again, so it might not be a, a true representation of where they sit in the VT2 order. Give that a lap or so to settle down. And for Jack, he's only entered today. He's not down for tomorrow's race. The car okay. will be back, number 491. Uh, walk on horse motorsport Hyundai i30N, but he will not. Drivers are busy. They do have a globe to you know, trot, trot their way around. I was just looking at what was happening on this lap. The fastest second sector of anybody is uh, the driver who's been fastest overall around the circuit, which is Alessio Picariello. He's in fourth place with that sort of advantage of the final pit stop. There are slow zones, a bunch in the field, bunch in the field, but you know, you gain a little, you lose a little, but the. The fact is, at the end of the previous lap, seven and a half seconds is the gap between first to fourth. And again, I know I'm like a scratched record. The final pit stop, it'll be 20, 21, 22 seconds uh, less time spent at the standstill for Picari Yellow in his car. I'll be handing it over to Martin Ragginger. Just on a restart there, though, I just have to sort of almost interrupt myself. Marcus Winkelhock desperate to get away because he's got Picariello right on his tail. He got the tail of the Shearer Sport Audi very, very out of shape. And even now, as he's being pushed, the Audi R8 LMS running in third place overall. He's bouncing around the circuit. Marcus has got this right at the level of adhesion. And now a little more heat coming back in the tyres of approaching. It's calming down. But that was a case of he just had to try and build a tiny little gap between him and the chasing number three, four. So he's done it for now. But when I say a little bit of a gap, it's what? Two, three car lengths max. <laughs> yeah and closing in actual fact because Picariello has got slightly better momentum. He's also in the draft of the Audi as well. There'll be quite a lot of dirty air rippling its way from the rear wing of that Audi R8. The LMS GT3, sported by Shearer Sport PHX, as now Joel Eriksson is able to go around the outside of another one of the VW Golfs in this entry and actually deposit that car far sooner than Lawrence Vantor can do. So had to wait for the whole concreted section before then bursting out from around the outside of that uh, Golf, the right-hand side of it, and finally putting that Golf behind the uh, Grello Porsche. But that has cost Lawrence Vantor maybe half a second, maybe slightly more than that started the lap half a second apart it might be north of a second now for Joel Eriksson if he can maintain this advantage there now at Hoar Act on lap 19 so no pit stops due anytime soon we've got an hour and 10 minutes remaining in this race and I would expect at the end of lap 21 we've got uh, on getting to what, halfway around lap 19 at the moment we'll have all but one of the top runners coming in to make for the final pit stop. The one that's different is the one in fourth place overall. That should come in a lap later, which is the car number three, Falker Motorsports, driven by Alessio Picariello, Martin Ragginger waiting to take it over to the finish. That's the car with the advantage. That's the car in fourth place. That's the car right on the tail of the Shearer Sport PHX Audi. Up front, though, gap is definitely opening out. That was a real advantage for Joel Eriksson. Of almost all the places on the circuit where you put yourself, put a car between you and someone's chasing you, the carousel is quite useful because going on the very, very high line, it's a longer way round, it's a tougher way round. And I think he found almost a second in that little run past the uh, the white one of the white golfs. Might be car number 10, could quite tell, heli shot up high. But the big question is where is the next slow zone? Because certainly between the uh, uh, carousel and what lies ahead, uh, Lawrence Van Torre is closing in all over again for Manti EMA, but I think there's a slow zone up in front of them. The uh, Grello fan base, evident in the main grandstand on the start-finish straight, by the way, as it uh, so often is whenever the green and yellow car is in attendance. By the way, if you're wanting the dates for your diary for the 24 hours of the Nürburgring this year, it's around the Corpus Christi bank holiday, which is Thursday the 30th of May. So it's that weekend, and so often it is arranged around that, so you can make it a, basically a four-day weekend if you can get Friday off work as well. So the 30th and the 31st of May, leading into the 1st and 2nd of June, which is the Saturday and the Sunday. The very next Sunday after that, of course, we're into the Le Mans Test Day, again live here on the Radio Show Limited network of channels, followed by the 24 hours of Le Mans over the 15th and 16th. 
uh, the Saturday and Sunday, but obviously three days in the week prior to that as well. So uh, set for sort of three weekends on the spin, really, of high class and top notch sports car 24 hour type racing at the end of May, start of June. You know, I look back through the, the record book sometimes and what was happening in that year, and you just have to appreciate what an amazing time it is to be a sports car racing fan. GT racing all around the globe, top level prototype racing back at its very, very best. I mean, the, the racing in the IMSA WeatherTech Challenge, absolutely fantastic. Winded up by a factor of two, at least, for the World Endurance Championship, with more interest to come. You know, Aston Martin coming to play next year. It is and, and, and. And I just think it's brilliant, and I just think you have to grasp these days and enjoy them as much as you can. We know motor racing is cyclical. We've been down. We had the pandemic. We're definitely back up. But the point is, looking back over history, you think, oh, someone, how did they manage to finish, you know, sixth in the Daytona 24 hours? And you realise that was at a time when the racing was really, really thin in that championship. And likewise, the Nürburgring 24 hours, the Spa 24 hours went down to not very quick saloon cars at one point, and now it's right at the top of the tree again in GT. So just enjoy the days when they're good. And also, the fact is, 30 years ago, you didn't have the ability to watch any race in the world or listen to any race in the world you wanted with streaming and so many other things. It's, it, you can really get onto it. But also, when you look at something like this, you can go to the bln.de and you get the timing screens. There is so much information to be had. And uh, I just think they're magical times. Too right. And uh, it's set to get even better, potentially, in the next few years as well. Surfing on the crest of the wave and uh, more and more manufacturers being attracted to this type of motor racing. You know, uh, Kamui Kobayashi in a Supra GT4 car and Jack Aitken in an i30 Hyundai is, is not by accident. Surely that is planning for the future when GM and when manufacturers within the Toyota family are thinking about coming here with a meaningful GT3 effort. That, I mean, that has to be the case. It can't just be sort of a weekend off and oh, where, where can we go racing? Because signatures are always tricky to get, as now, let's just go back to the matter in hand. Joel Erickson had a decision to make there again on a BMW. Do I go left or do I go right? And it cost him time. Hasn't cost him the lead quite yet. But Lawrence Fantor getting sucked back into this battle. They started the 20th lap, separated by 2.3 seconds. It's now back to that three car lengths you mentioned. Right. And that's it. It's absolutely... <laughs> He guess, do I go left or I go right? I'll go down the middle. Oh dear, the BMW's gone down the middle. Now, I talk, the car that's moved into third place, the Audi's been dropped to fourth, unless you the car yellow's gone into third place. And as that happened, incident between car three, that's uh, the car of which we speak, and car 63 under investigation. Car 633, that's 653, let's go to 633, that'd be much more informative. It's the Ford Motors Bioconcept car. It's a Porsche Cayman running the alternative technology alternative fuels class. We don't know what the incident was, but there is suddenly on a day of blue sky, a gray cloud coming in for the car that uh, was sit sitting pretty with an hour and five minutes to go, potentially with this race in its hands by small margins, but uh, margin of potentially seven or eight seconds is uh, plenty around here, not around a lap around the course of uh, the four hours, but we'll keep an eye on the screen to see if there's any punishment issued from that moment. At the moment, did it have contact? I do not know, but anyhow, certainly the uh, officials are looking at it. By the way, Lucas was just catching up with Patrick Arkenau a moment or two ago at Mantai, and uh, he was not letting too much strategy slip through, but the question was asked, what happened about your pit stop? And he said, well, we came in a lap earlier, had to stop for less time in pit road, and that's in an effort, of course, to beat the Shearer PHX Audi, which is sticking to the more traditional eight-lap stints. So we'd spotted it was seven for Mantai so far. Again, a moment where Joel Erickson has to breathe in and think, I can just about tuck in to the inside of this corner. But once more, not sure how to get by a BMW, the GT tyres BMW. I'm sure that isn't this the same car that they encountered, or some cars encountered coming out of the Vido chicane not long ago. I say that's probably about an hour or so ago. And that resulted in the positional change. This is down at Breitscheid with Bergwerk upcoming, and yet it is still the two-tone blue Falcon Motorsports car that stays in front of the two-tone Grello Porsche 
of Manti. Lights flashing again from the Swedish driver, Joel Eriksson. And thankfully, the back marker is able to see that was the clip for Cypher on Porsche, I reckon, going slightly wider than normal at Bergwerk and allows both leaders through. You know, that, that's the thing I was just thinking about. You're saying, when they look, was that the car that blocked them last time? The last time they caught a car, it could just be coincidental that it suddenly ends up in the wrong bit of track, but they'll mm. go away with the wrong image of the driver of that car. But well, it, true, you know, yes. Often a driver in front is responding to something else, but yes, you, you probably can almost mark the time, like when you get to the next ring as a candle burns down or something. But, uh, oh, the problem look. is, if it's an adrenaline car or a GT <laughs> tyres car, yes. I mean, there's about 15 each of those, so you might be sort of going, oh, you did me wrong the last time we tried yeah. to get by, so I'm going to run you off the road. You might get somebody completely different, or indeed just a different driver in the same car. Very difficult to, to tell, and you know, with each of the NLS races through the year, you're not going to get the same 113 opponents necessarily. You will learn the odd car from the rear mainly and work out perhaps general driving styles. As now, Picariello is looking to pick off a couple of back markers, and he is hotly pursued by Marcus Winkelhock. So they've broken off into two separate battles Ericsson and Vantor for the lead, Picariello, Picariello and Winkelhock for third and fourth, but actually the gap that separates these two duos is condensing as well. Yeah, it had been. I, I sort of sensed the first part of this lap, so the traffic slightly worked better for Ericsson and Van Toren. That lead duo, again, need a high shot to uh, estimate. The start of the lap, it was seven and a half seconds, first through to fourth place. Oh no, I think it is. I think you're quite right, Johnny. Look, so it's about five seconds between four, first and fourth. Two cars. Uh, between the lead duo and uh, third and fourth, and Alessio Picariello will be next to get them. He dives to the inside. The first one is seen in the second one, most notably, has not. Porsche Cayman uh, moves out of the way now. So, just as he gained a bit of an advantage over the fourth placed Audi of uh, Marcus Winkelhock, he gained with one hand, lost with the other, but they've now dispatched some clear track between them and Ericsson Van and Van Tor, who are leading this race. Now, maybe, perhaps, they'll start to close in a bit more. What have we got left on the clock? We've got an hour and one minute of this four-hour race, the opening race of 2024. Been a good one so far. Intriguing. Also intriguing to me was the fact that uh, Manti Racing had to respond. they just become a little bit frustrated uh, being blocked, or not blocked, just being delayed by uh, the Shearer Sport PHX Audi. And therefore, they brought their middle pit stop, middle of three, forward by a lap, shorter time at a standstill, able to get them out in front. And these are the decisions that Manti Racing have made so many times over the year. That's why they have so many VLN and NLS races under their belt. And if you're new to this championship, the NLS has been with us the last couple of years. But before that, it was the VLN. Same championship, different name. Oh, we do love an acronym. That's right, yeah, and it's just uh, remembering which year it was called what, basically, and making sure you get the letters in the right order. Marcus Winkelhock had a great chance there coming out of Schwabenschwanz to draw alongside Alessio Picariello. He stuck the nose in, but the problem was there was a back marker to his left as well with Picariello on his right, and it would have done well to keep both dive planes intact there because certainly there was a bit of contact, I think, on one side. Now, that's not the Grello car slowing. Or is it? No, it is a Grello car slowing because we're going into a code 60. Uh, sorry, there was another highlighter yellow car in the mix earlier on in the lap. But the problem now for the Grello car is that it's got caught in behind the 123 Porsche of Ludwig. This is the Mulner Motorsport car. And also in this queue is the 112 for K Kramer Racing. So right in the mixture of the Cup 2 battles and the Grello car is trapped, whereas the race leader was able to leapfrog these before they hit the yellow flag and Code 60 affected area. And Joel Erickson might have been waved into a bit of a lead here. I think that is a gift on a soft cushion, an absolute sitter for him. Now, the restart when they get going again is going to be very, very sharp indeed because the Porsche, two Porsche Cup 2 class cars in front of the beat have got plenty of acceleration. Then the Grello Porsche is being chased down the start finish straight as they're released. Tucked in behind is Alessio Picariello in fourth place, tucked in behind him is the Audi, Marcus Finkelhock, but that has suddenly given an advantage of about seven, 7.8 seconds between the race leader, Joel Eriksson, and Lawrence Van Tour. Lawrence was going to be about half a second down, so he's lost seven seconds in the, in the what, the, the final 16th of the lap. And now at least he's managed to 
get away on the restart. He could easily have been jumped by Alessio Picari. I'm still keeping my eye on the uh, reports from the stewards to see if there's any punishment coming the way of number three, which is Picariello's car, because there was uh, some incident with 633, one of the uh, slower class cars in this race. So if there is any penalty coming his way, you can be sure Picariello is going to want to get clear and really put yeah. in some quick laps to try and gain a bit of time that he can at least have as a buffer. Now, if we stick to the seven lap rule for Manti, do we expect, therefore, the Grello car to come in at the end of this lap, lap 21? I certainly would. And it will take them out of the heat of this situation. The problem is for Manti, they might be thinking, well, we've tried our hardest to think differently from the Audi team and pit every seven laps, as opposed to seven and then eight, or six and then eight to the finish. But it, it really hasn't worked, and it, it, it all turned for them at the end of that lap just then, heading into Antonius Bucher, Tiergarten and Hohenrein when Joel Eriksson got the jump on the clutch of Cup 2 cars, and Lawrence Vantor was given no option but to obey the double wave yellows, no overtaking, of course, and then to duck down to 60 kilometres per hour. As Joel Eriksson, I mean, he wasn't speeding through that, but he just he got ahead of all the traffic before Vantor had the opportunity to do so. And now Picariello is going to be delayed by a pretty swift Cup 3 Cayman, but it's not as fast as the GT3 car. The problem is, through the sweepers of the hats and back, there's just no way by, as the Cayman just drifts into his path, in fact. The 962 car then was suddenly aware that one of the Falcon machines wanted to get by. Well, the extraordinary thing in that moment, well, two, two moments, is one, Joel Eriksson, you know, we talked at any moment we said this race could turn on a small incident. For Joel Eriksson leading this race, being gifted a seven-second advantage over the chasing Lawrence Van Tor is one. But there, with the Porsche Cayman running in front of Alessio Picariello's third-place car, he couldn't afford. There's already a question mark about whether he's got a punishment coming his way. He couldn't be robust, but it is just so unbelievably narrow there. There was absolutely nothing he could do about putting another lap on that Porsche Cayman. So he's had to back off. And that's got him off the tail of the Manti Porsche. He may be able to get back there again. In fact, we're getting to, towards the time those final pit stops will be coming our way. Probably the end of this lap for the uh, three of the first four cars, not Picari yellow cars. So maybe he'll then get the clear track that he seeks. But uh, that was a moment he had to have caution and pop back a little bit. That was Mo Moritz Oberheim in the RVA WNS Motorsport 962 Porsche, by the way. Possibly not entirely aware that the race lead, sorry, the one of the quick cars, the Falcon car wanting to get by in a hurry. But in the end, Picariello was able to pick off Oberheim on the open section down towards Flugplatz. Yeah, it's not so Oberheim is short of experience around here. I think it really just focuses the fact that at certain points on this track, and particularly, probably almost most notably, uh, through the hats and back sweepers, it's corner after corner after corner. Go slightly wide on one. And the fact is, on the left-hand side of the track, there's no runoff. No. It's just a barrier. It's just a tyre wall and a barrier. So you don't necessarily get quite as close to that edge as you would otherwise. So I just think it's one of those unfortunate things, unfortunate for Vanessa Picari, and not so unfortunate for Lawrence Van Tour. It bought him a little bit of breathing space in second. Green flags back at Exmuller and at Bergwerk as well, as the various marshal posts that have been affected. One, two, three, one, two, four, marshal post one, two, six as well, all now clear. I would expect the the slow zone or the double wave yellows to be in place at Tiergarten probably till the finish of the race now. 55 minutes still to go. But a couple of seconds ago, Marcus Winkelhock, who was chasing down Picardi Yellow, and Picari Yellow, as I say, wanting to slice by Moritz Oberheim and couldn't do it on his right-hand side. And then, oh, there was a side-by-side -side moment, which we didn't see in the first uh, opportunity to witness that, with Marcus Winkelhock. So Picari Yellow got a side swipe. That's the side that he collided with the Elantra early on in the race. And Winkelhock was right there to get third position away. And he actually gave Oberheim a bit of a shoulder barge as he finally squirreled by the 962. It's amazing, isn't it? That must have been just after the director cut to another angle. They did manage to get it on replay and bring it back, but we didn't see that contact. And it definitely was once, if not twice, 
uh, that uh, Picariello was uh, given a bit of a, a bit of a kiss by Marcus Finkelhock. Well, didn't realise Marcus had got so far alongside. It was because, as I was describing that to you live, it, I was I was witnessing the onboard camera from Picariello looking out front. Of course, had no clue that Finkelhock was over the left shoulder of Picariello and actually making pretty stern contact with him on that left hand side. And that's how much of a delay Picariello suffered because Moritz Oberheim was taking the racing line. And you might argue, well, that's perfectly within his rights to do so. Shouldn't be making space for Picariello. It's the job of the faster car to find a way by. But Winkelhock wasn't going to uh, uh, relax at all and uh, rest on his haunches because he was stabbing that Audi down the inside as now Picariello runs very, very wide coming out of... Well, it's towards Ice Curver. Flansgarten up next. So they're now at, you know, after Brunchen. The car's... No, this is Brunchen now, the right-hander. And Flansgarten just prior to that. So three cars absolutely together. Vantor, Picariello and Winkelhock. And you wonder whether they've now kissed goodbye to any scope of winning this race. Seven, nearly eight seconds the gap to the race leader, at least at the start of the race. Could the key be the fact that Manti are probably planning to pit at the end of this lap, whereas the Porsche and the Audi behind should be staying out? Uh, or should no. they not be? Go on. No, 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 because the Audi is on the same pit sequence as the Manti Porsche. The Manti, remember, adjusted its sequence. The only one that should be staying a lap beyond this lap on the track is Picariello's uh, Porsche in third. The race leader, the sister car to Picariello, should be coming in at the end of this lap. But Winkelhock's kind of not doing seven laps, though, is he? He should be doing... Well, it depends how they want to do it, but Winkelhock can do an eighth lap. He well, pitted, he, lap he pitted at the end of lap... 14. 14. Yeah. So this will be the end of lap seven on this stint. He could do eight. Whereas I don't think Van Tor will do because Manti have decided to do sevens all the way through. We haven't yet seen a seven lap stint from the Audi. This might be it. So they may do six and eight and now seven, but that'd be a peculiar pattern. Well, Alessio Picariello, for avoidance of any doubts, is trying to put himself past the Manti Porsche. He's got uh, alongside, he's now got his nose in front and his tail in front as they go along the dotting her. And in fact, the Audi is closing as well. Is he going to make a move? No, no, of course, we've got the uh, waved yellows. They uh, get towards the end of the lap, effectively, where it stops being straight. And we've got the slight climb. There's still um, the instant up at uh, the final corner, or the penultimate corner, because it's the right of the right and left combo. Uh, so on the brakes they go. I would expect three of the top four cars to dive in the pits. The leader, number four, is only now still at a baited pace, going through that final sequence of corners. His teammate, Alessio Picariello, has made it a Falcon Lane Sport first and second, and then right on the tail, almost pushing the Grillo Manti Porsche, is uh, Marcus Winkelhorn. is always game for a laugh. He's about to push it into the pit lane. They come into the final uh, right, and there's now still an Audi safety car on the uh, edge of the circuit, but on driver's left, so they duck past that. Expect race leader, surely, Joel Eriksson to come into the pits, but who's going to go on past the Manti no, no. racing car? None of them. No, none of them at all, of course. Take your notes, Jones, and throw them in the bin. Well, that's oh, the no, end. that takes them to 21 laps. Yes, OK. Yeah, yeah, but that's the end of the pattern for Manti. Yep. They are not doing the seven laps all the way to the finish. They've decided to stick with eight for this one. Yeah, but don't, don't forget, a seven lap opening stint with that formation lap is equivalent of an eight lap stint, whereas some of the rivals came in after six laps. They came in a lap later than most of their rivals, other than the number three uh, Porsche on that opening run in the race. So they're staying out for a further lap. And of course, every lap they get close to the finish of this race, every minute they get close to the finish of this race, their pit stop time will be shorter. But still, in this group, that number three Porsche that's just moved up into second place for Falcon Motorsports, making a Falcon 1 2, has one lap more in the bag beyond this one. Would it use it? There, well, yeah. I mean, there was never a doubt in my mind that Vantor could do eight, but I thought Manti had uh, just committed to doing sevens to get to the 28-lap marker, unless they've worked out, of course, that it may be a 29-lap race. As now Winkelhock is fully off the road on the Grand Prix circuit. So coming out of... Uh, the Ravenel sequence of corners and now on towards the Vidal chicane. There's gravel on the exit of that relatively high speed left and right. And he overcooked it a tad. So the tyres will not have been at their grippiest. And that Audi again is moving around all over the road between Vidal chicane and the Sabina Schmitz curve. 
So for avoidance of doubt, Joel Eriksson did not pit then either because that is seven laps on his stint. So Eriksson's just completed seven and now will go on to an eight lap stint. Picariello's done six, could go a lap further then and would pit at the end of lap 23 potentially. Yeah. Because they did seven and then eight. And now I reckon eight again for Picariello before handing back to Raginger. Two rivals have blinked though in fifth and sixth place. They've died for the pits at the end of uh, 20. Should be 22 laps, shouldn't it? Uh, Kelvin van der Linde brings the Red Bull team Abt Lamborghini in and uh, Danny Junkadea, who'd been closing in bit by bit in the, the car that started on pole but was, was effectively denied pole on the run to the first corner by its own teammate, the sister car from uh, HRT, the Mercedes team with an ambitious start from the team boss, Hubert Howe. But uh, since then, they've worked their way back up the order. But up front, well, I reckon three of the top four will pit at the end of this lap, and one the lap afterwards. And the one is car number three. It's the Falcon Motorsport car, driven by Alessio Picariello, Martin Ragginger to finish off the race. Yeah, so in the case of Danny Junkadea, this is his first stint in the race, and that's the first time the number 14 Mercedes has actually done eight laps on a stint, because Frank Bird was in and out with the various problems. He had a slow puncture very early on in the race, you may remember, then came in after only five laps, did a six-lap stint, and then eventually handed over to Spanish driver Daniel Junkadea, who's just done eight and could go no further, so the 14 car is in. Red Bull team apt are doing what I expected Manti to have done. So it's been seven across the board. Seven as the first stint, and then Jordan Pepper did a second seven lap stint before handing over to Calvin van der Linde. And I'm assuming, oh, I was gonna say van der Linde will stay on board, but he's not. He's only gonna do one stint in this race because it's back to Jordan Pepper now to close things out. Are they entered in tomorrow's race, the 27 Lamborghini? Let me look uh, at my annotations. Uh, yes, they yes, are. Yes, they are. So maybe they'll flip it around and give van der Linde three stints and Jordan Pepper just the one tomorrow in an effort to balance things out. Time will tell. Well, keep them on their toes. Still no further news about the investigation of uh, whatever happened between number three, which is the Falco <laughs> Motorsport car in the hands now of Alessio Picariello. And uh, one of the cars from the alternative fuel class, what we say, number 633. It was a Ford Motors bioconcept car. Carl Flantz, Oliver Sprungman, and Henning Kramer. But uh, no invest no, the investigation is not yet complete, or they're not prepared to share the outcome. So that being the case, the car in second place can only do one thing, and that's press on. If there's any time penalty coming their way, they need to negate it. But in terms of track position, they're up to second. In terms of when they can make their final pit stop, they've got the advantage of coming in, should they so choose, a lap after all of their rivals. And if they can do it a lap after their rivals, in dry conditions, you would, because it means your final pit stop's going to be shorter. 45 minutes to go, the Halder Motorsport Cup 2 Porsche turning left through Sabina Schmidt's curve with uh, one of the two Halder family on board. Unfortunately, our timing screen doesn't differentiate between Mike and Michelle in the Cup 2 entered GT3 Cup car. Oh, well, Michelle's talking to Lucas Gajewski, so that rather gives me the clue, doesn't it? That's Michelle Halder, so it must be Mike, therefore, uh, currently at the wheel. Uh, it's, good when, it's good when they do that. Uh, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just suddenly twigged, <laughs> and I realised why uh, our director was finding the the 117 car on the racetrack. Carousel, concrete section, Porsches up against one another, as they have been really all race, and the Grello car still just in behind Picariello. But it is a Falcon 1 2 now. And uh, it's taken a bit of time to fashion this running order, but every credit to those involved, running the, obviously a very different tyre from everybody else. They are an event sponsor as well though, so the name Falcon evident on all the cars in the entry. Marcus Winkelhock absolutely driving the wheels off this Audi using all sorts of lines that nobody else really knows about, but they sort of work. And running a tad wide there, through the really fast sections immediately after the carousel with Flansgarten and Brunchen 
approach to come just around this corner. And that time, in fact, it was Picariello finding the very limits of the racetrack. You know, fantastic three-way three -way battle for second, but it, had it not been for the positioning of three cars as they, they approached that, uh, the double wave yellows, we'd have four cars because the number four Falker Motorsport car gained, what do we reckon, about a seven and a half second advantage as they all had to slow down. He put those three cars between him and the chasing pack. And then since then, of course, his teammate, uh, uh, Picariello has been able to pick off uh, the Manti Porsche of uh, Lawrence Van Tor. Marcus Finkelhock, as Johnny says, is uh, putting it all out there, hanging onto his Audi from the most lurid of angles. And uh, now they're bunched up against uh, one of the newcomers in uh, the top class, the Renazzo Motorsport Team Lamborghini, uh, yellow and black, and it tries its best to keep out of the way. No advantage to anyone. If anything, maybe Marcus Finkelhock closed up a bit in fourth place into third, uh, you know, getting closer to third. Again, you just can't predict where some of the slower cars are going to be, but you've just got to hope the law of averages comes your way over the course, course of a race. No, actually, you want it to come more your way than, than uh, just making it all even, but uh, they will get onto the clear run out of the Schwabenschwanz and now accelerating along the dotting hill. I presume we've still got uh, strictures up ahead where they'll have to back it off. I'm just trying to see through the intervals on this lap. Has there been an advantage for the race leading car? No, there hasn't. So the gap to Joel Eriksson, who's leading in the number four Falcon Motorsport Porsche, will be coming down. Mm. At that point, he will then dive into the pits. The car in second place, the sister car with Alessio Picariello, ought to shoot on past the pits. And, uh, they slow down as they get towards the end of the lap, as before, but uh, no advantage. But he should continue. Second will become first. He should make a pit stop the next time around. The Manti Motorsport uh, Porsche tucked behind in third place will pit. The Shearer Sport PHX Audi right under the tail of the Grello Porsche. Uh, will pit as well. The only one who will not be coming in unless something untoward has occurred or something I can't think about, it will be the car in second place, the number three Porsche. Still looking to see if there are any further messages, and there aren't, about whether any punishment is coming away, but still under investigation for an in incident uh, some while ago. So uh, clearly very easily into the final 70 minutes of this race now, so all of a sudden the time to go is the important thing, and the closer you can pit to the end of the race, the shorter your pit stop can be. That's the reason why Picariello will stay out, and indeed he does, whereas Joel Eriksson comes in because he'll have no fuel left, certainly not for a full ninth lap on the stint, and the same goes for Lawrence Fantor and Marcus Winkelhock. So shooting off into the distance there is Alessio Picariello. So he'll have road position, and he'll also have a shorter pit stop. So and it'll be by a decent chunk, won't it? It's at eight minutes. And what did you say, about two or three seconds, the well, difference between each minute on your chart? Uh, yeah, indeed, whole minutes. But in fact, you know, we, we calibrated uh, the ultimate lap in the race so far has been eight minutes flat. Their last laps were between eight minutes 40 and eight minutes 48, but it's a whole minute has to count. So it doesn't matter if you're back by 20 seconds on your, your lap time in terms of that. But uh, so what's left on the clock? We've got, uh, they, they've come in effectively with 40 minutes 40 minutes remaining means their pit stop here jot this one down at home 281 seconds let's add nine minutes now let's, let's be generous we're going the other way uh, 31 minutes uh 257 seconds so yeah you, they will potentially gain 24 seconds is the advantage uh for number three for falcon motorsports uh if no further action is coming their way. That is a very, very tidy advantage. Driver changes, uh, Marcus Wingle hop, hops out of the number 16 Shearer Sport PHX Audi and the red and white striped helmet of uh, Frank Stippler hops on board. Fresh set of rubber all around, clean the screen. Again, you don't have to hurry these pit stops. I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of that. You know, you can have slap bang, bish bash bosh and out you go, but safety is, you know, this circuit more than anywhere in the world. It's imperative that everything's screwed on properly before you head out not just for the driver's safety, but also it can really affect the race if someone is around a corner with a, a wheel having come off their car. So, you know, this is the right way of doing it. Also means you don't have to have so many um, mechanics working on the car. <laughs> Lovely shot up close of the grill of the Shearer Sport PHX Audi. That's car number 16. You can see it's been in a battle. Little bits of other colour on their car, and most notably, shades of grello, you could say. So mm, it's clearly true, some yes. contact with the... Uh, the tail end of the Grello Porsche at some stage. Remember, it got very, very busy at the end of the opening stint of the race when they were fighting over uh, the lead of the race. If you are just joining us, uh, you may be still 
wondering why there's been such a lengthy code 60 and uh, yellow flag area on the approach to Tiergarten and Hohenrein. We still haven't had full details of exactly what took place there, but it looked to be a significant off for the Hyundai Elantra, which uh, by the looks of things hit the tyres and then flipped over the fence to land in the concreted area, the the non-safe side of the barrier. And uh, we're obviously waiting news on Robbie Wickens, who we think was driving at the time. But I can see that Code 60 staying in place for the rest of this race now, um, because there'll be questions asked about the, the integrity of the Armco barrier behind those tyres and other clear-up work taking place as well. But uh, a big, big off. Obviously, if you have something fail on a car at that point, uh, you're approaching at such high speed through the kink at Antonius Bucher and into Tiergarten itself. So I'm sure that Code 60 will stay in place until four o'clock and uh, slightly beyond that, of course, because it takes a bit longer to get all the cars home to the chequered flag. It's just gone 20 past three now here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. 38 minutes remaining on the clock there, and the rest of the racetrack is clear. So it's just yellow flags at Dottinger Hall 3, the final set of mar uh, marshal points on the long straight, and then that final bit of the lap. But everywhere else you can be full speed and overtake. And for the cars in the key positions in SP9 Pro and Pro-Am, pretty much all the stops have been done now, with the exception of number six Mercedes, for Ralph Aron in his team Advan by HRT car. Just pitted. Just doing its final stop, what should be its final stop now. Oh, and Picariello, of course, yes. is the outstanding one, which we will see him do his stop at the end of this lap. And that could be as much as 14, 15 seconds quicker. 24 seconds. 24 seconds yep. quicker, you reckon? Yep. That's the difference between, a, a, what are we talking about, an eight or nine minute lap? So I push it out to nine. All right. That's so you, you, okay. You know, otherwise it's 21 seconds. So let's let's call it easily 20 seconds they're going to gain yeah. by pitting just a lap later. And, I mean, Picarella leads anyway. This is all of a sudden flipping things massively in the favour of Porsche number three. Still looking at the screens all the time, aware that uh, number three, the race, new race leader, the car that's going to make the final pit stop, a lap after the others under investigation for, for something. But a message is coming up saying, no further action for car 16, which is the Shearer Sport PHX Audi. And that was a long time ago that went on the screen. So maybe not until after the end of the race will we know if there's anything uh, untoward or, or nothing at all uh, for the car that's now into the lead of the race for Alessio Picariello. Patience is a virtue. It's not always as informative as uh, if you can have the answer here and now, but uh, well, no. patience is a virtue. But you don't necessarily need all the information all of the time. That's the beauty of live sport is that we don't quite know what is going to happen next. And in the case of Cup 2, the 148 car is certainly being driven rapidly by Tobias Muller, who's got back on board this car and is chasing the 122 of Moritz Krantz for Mulner Motorsport. Michele Di Martino is actually quite a bit further back in fifth, so it is all it's between second, third and fourth to determine who's going to finish on the podium because Nico Otto's got a big, big lead now for Max Cruiser racing in their number 100 car. There is the sky blue and white though of Mulner Motorsport with the yellow door mirrors and right in behind, you can't actually see the car that is doing the chasing. So is that actually Moritz Kratz who's got ahead of... No, that's still the Muller car, I reckon, as they now both head into the double wave yellows. So it's definitely car 122. And in behind, is that the 148? Yeah, I think it is of uh, Tobias Muller. Yeah, I think so. It looks like a black falcon livery. <laughs> I just remembered Tobias Muller's car being gold for some reason, but I think I'm getting that mixed up from uh, an early, uh, maybe a race meeting from last year. That definitely says 148 in the windscreen. So let's say that that's Muller chasing Krantz, and it's for third and fourth in Cup 2. Also, the 120 car's not too far away, which is the second-place car in Cup 2, and that's being driven by David Yarn, sharing with Tim Shearbart and Danny Blickel, who were taking part in the race a little earlier on. Cup twos, remember, can do sometimes as many as nine laps on a stint. 
and I'm not sure where we sit in terms of pit stops there. Obviously, again, the later you can pit, the better it will be. Nico Otto is five laps into a potential nine, and so he's not going to be able to get to the finish without one more stop. But the later he can leave it, the better it will be. So many things to think about when you plan a race, but I must say, it's an unusual treat to have one where the weather hasn't been an element at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. It doesn't matter if it's summer, winter, spring, autumn, it plays its hand. And Johnny, you, you and I have commentated on enough where you spend an enormous amount of time during the course of the race debating whether the clouds are getting more, or, or are they dwindling, or are they, are, they, are they rain clouds, or snow clouds, or whatever. But today it's been uniform, but you know what, that's the best way to start the championship, particularly with another race coming tomorrow. Get the mileage in, get the lap times in, work towards if you're going to be doing the qualifying events, which we will cover here on Radio Show Limited. But network of channels next weekend qualifying races for this summer's ADAC Nürburgring 24 hours a lot to play for 674 BMW into pit lane for the fourth time this is one of the 240i entries and the Teichmann racing car is in sixth position the 240i, though, that leads this class is all the way up in 36th place. Uh, and also making a stop, I noticed. That's the 650 car. And 650 is the entry from Adrenaline Motorsport, funnily enough, with main hat and wheels. And Toby Goodman's just brought that car in, sharing with Ranko Majatovic and Sven Market. I remember mentioning Sven's name, actually probably an hour, or so, hour and a half or so ago. So it feels like they've had the race lead in the 240Is for quite some time, the number 650 BMW. Our race leader in the pits, as uh, predicted. Yes. 23 laps on the board of this supercar yellow. Brings it in all on his own, so obviously on his own some in the car, but the pit lane fairly quiet because most of the front running teams, other than him, made their pit stop last time around. So uh, he's come in. We'll wait to see what the margin is when he goes back out. That's a critical moment. And then he'll have about... Well, just over half an hour to defend the lead of the race, if indeed he does come out in the lead. But uh, from our, our various looking at the uh, investigation of the uh, time you need to spend in the pits, it's shorter when you pit later. And he's pitted later than his rivals. So having got up into second place overall before the final run of pit stops, he ought, by disaster, to come out in front and then have to take it through to the end of the race. But there is still, Johnny, this question about the number three car, his car, which ought to be handed to, to Martin Raginger, having a potential penalty. It's under investigation, but under investigation for what? We know no more than that at the moment, I'm afraid. Away goes the number three Porsche. And although the other three cars in the top four are already on the dotting of Hoor, this should gain back quite a bit of time for the Picariello ragging combination. As that number three Porsche reaches the end of pit road, it's Picariello again. So ragging has only done one stint. In actual fact, Picariello starting things off. He rested for a period of time to allow the Austrian to take over and then two more stints. And, and he's the got lead. the length of about the pit straight yeah. advantage. The sister car comes through. That's in the hands of Nico Menzel. That's got an advantage of actually quite a big advantage. He's built of six seconds, nearly seven seconds over the chasing Lawrence Van Tour. So it's Falcon Motorsport first, Falcon Motorsport second. And as the number three car leaves the Mercedes arena, the number four car heads into turn one. So that gives you an idea of the advantage that Picariello has got and the beauty of leaving their pit stops slightly later in the piece. So they've gone long on every occasion. Seven laps, which is as far as they could have, get, could have got on their first stint. And then it's been eight lap stints ever since then. And the only difference is that Joel Erickson pitted after six laps rather than seven and that just hasn't quite worked for them but remember that there was the moments that really uh, separated the leader from the second third and fourth place cars and that to be honest has decided things as Picariello needed to leap on the anchors even more than he'd intended to do there to, ru to avoid running into the side of the 131 Teichmann Cup 2 entry and I'm not sure how much uh, that driver, who is Stefan Kiefer, or Marius Kiefer, or David Kiefer, there's three Kiefers, in fact, in that car. Uh, I'm not sure how much they knew about it, but uh, contact was avoided into the Sabina Schmitz curve. 
So keep it cool, keep it calm, keep it on the island, and at various points in the circuit, every single driver as they go through the hat smash, they go, I was blocked there one lap, I was blocked there another, but just remember a handful of laps ago, most notably the number three Porsche very much was blocked uh, going through there. Uh, it, was a, it was a yellow and black uh, Porsche Cayman, wasn't it? It was uh, Moritz Oberheim that uh, kept it uh, on the black stuff. That was important, but uh, looking to see exactly what his margin will be at the end of this lap. But the fact it was, as you said, Johnny, we had the visual, almost the entirety of the length of the start finish straight or from the entrance to the Mercedes arena, which is turn one through to the exit of the Mercedes arena. That, that's a good visual. And again, we love helicopter shots when we treated them. It really, on a circuit that twists around like this, it just gives you something to absolutely peg it. Because otherwise, if you say it's 12.9 seconds, what does that mean? 12.9 seconds. But if you can place it where it is on the circuit, it makes it much, much more interesting. And that time through sector two, Picariello wasn't quite as quick as his chasing teammate Nico Mensal, but we're only talking a second and a half there or thereabouts, and it's probably something like 14, 15 seconds the advantage. I was going to try and do some hand timing through as they go through the split sectors, but I wasn't quite quick enough at the end of sector two. So we've got to wait the best part of two minutes for them to appear again at the end of sector three. Again, Picariello in two minds. He's not quite as uh, clinical through the traffic, let's say, as some of the other drivers like Estra might be, for instance, like Lawrence Vantor might be. And yes, I think he's just being slightly cautious because he, be, okay. he was just their match in, in the earlier stints. But maybe, you know, it's also that, that role of driver psychology. Should I be in the lead of the race? Oh my gosh, what have I got left? I've got to, under half an hour to go in this race. Right, just be kind to the tyres. I've got to, I don't have to push too much, but maybe he just plays. I, there was one driver I know in the single-seater formula at the start of his career who, who basically every time he got into the lead of the race, he'd throw it away. Yeah. And he'd sort of decided he wasn't good enough to win the race, despite the evidence, the stopwatch, and so on and so forth. And he, he was one of the few drivers who really decided to look at the driver's psyche you know, consulted a sort of leading psychiatrist and tried to work on it. A lot of people in racing didn't even want to think about stuff like that. But, you know, full marks to him for doing that. And uh, a lot of drivers have since understood they can maximise their performance by really paying attention to how they apply themselves and uh, to the pressure and how they respond to all of that. So, uh, again, whole new job market for some people. <laughs>
Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social-Media-Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. Antaiyama, he really did look as though they had a chance in this race today, Johnny, but they're, they're settled back in third place. It just hasn't, the, sp the pace seems to have gone away from them a little bit. Lawrence Van Tour, 6.7 seconds down on second place, which is Nico Menzel, and I would think actually lost a little bit more through the course. This lap, no, he started to gain towards the end, so maybe he'll, he'll close that down. But at one point, that looked good for possible victory in this race. Then, because they've been blocked up for several laps behind the Shearer Sport PHX Audi, they decided instead of staying out and staying true to their original tactic, come in a lap early. It gave them track position because that second pit stop was shorter, but it really cost them in the end because it, it, they were the only car that were on the same sequence of laps as the car that's now leading the race, the three uh, Falker Motorsport Porsche, and it hasn't gone their way. Good to see in the top 10, easily in the top 10, is uh, Glickenhaus Racing. Entry car number 706. Of course, it's not the same class as the SP9 cars, but it's had a good, solid run. Lance David Arnold doing a double stint to take it to the end of the race. Eighth overall. However, it's only uh, four and a half seconds clear of the leading car in Cup 2, which is Max Cruz Racing, the number 100 uh, entry in that. So the Otto at the wheel at the moment, Nico Otto. However, ease with which a faster, faster car can catch is slightly curtailed at the moment by the number of slow zones and uh, there's one obviously to final sequence of corners the cars only as they come onto the start finish straight probably go 100 meters up there are they released so again if you're chasing you may not gain hang on Picariello's just come in again hasn't he that was Picariello leaving the pit lane drive through penalty it never came on the screen for us I've been looking with an eagle eye and he's come out behind the Mantai car would he also be behind I, thought my timing screen, I thought my timing screen was lagging there and still hanging over from the previous stop, but he definitely came in at the end of lap 24 and, as you say, right through the pit lane because finally a decision has been made. You've been talking about it an awful lot. And Picariello rejoining. Now, I've got to tell the difference between Menzel and the 16 car. Well, Menzel's ahead of Vantor, so that's got to be Picariello, who's slotted in to third position now, ahead of Frank Stippler, who is fourth. There is the number three car heading now through Ravenol, the left and right-handers, and down the hill towards the Vidal Chicane. So thankfully for Falcon Motorsports, they still have a car that can lead this race, but it is no longer Alessio Picariello, because now Nico Menzel leads ahead of Lawrence Vantor, up to second for Manti. He waits an age for some information. The first thing you see is a car coming out of the pits rather than going into it. So, yes, sorry, we uh, couldn't inform you before, but we were waiting. We're trying to work out what was happening. It was for forcing another car off the track, and the 633 uh, Bio Concept car was the one that was uh, judged to have been given a helping hand from probably in the race lead or possibly second place. It was Porsche Cayman. And anyhow, uh, a stop and go, but with a drive through penalty, that's why it was pretty quick. But instead of leading with what we got left, just over 20 minutes remaining in this race, it's back out into third place. And the Audi is all over its tail. Frank Stippler fancies as half a chance. He's uh, about half a second behind in fourth place. And for, Laura, uh, for Alessio Picari yellow, so we have to wait for those timing uh, intervals to come because I've just got to wait for my screen to catch up a little bit. But. Uh, the visual is that Falker Motorsport still leads the race, but they've swapped their cars over. Number four is now the new leader, and number three, with that drive through penalty, back into third position. Yeah, so first and second, no more. First and third instead for Falcon. And have, has Picariello got anything up his sleeve to take the fight to Laurence Vantor in the closing stages? Frank Stippler will fancy his chances of sneaking onto the podium to at least break this stranglehold of 911 GT3Rs that are infiltrating the podium as we speak. Jordan Pepper, a little helpless in fifth position in the number 27 Lamborghini Huracan. Uh, Stippler is able to get by the Mulner Motorsport Cup 2 Porsche. Nico Otto for Max Cruiser Racing leading Cup 2. 
And Cup 3 is in the hands of Heiko Eichenberg now for SRS Team Zorg Rensport. That's an all 718 Cayman class, remember. But the Cup 3s have done well to get up to 22nd and 23rd overall with Moritz Oberheim in the second position for Cup 3. And in SP10, which is a good mixture of GT4 cars, it's a Toyota Supra, the Toyo, the Toyo tires with ring racing car, number 170, that leads that part of the race, uh, with a few laps to go and potentially some pit stops, of course, as well. 170 is currently being driven by Andreas Gulden, the car that he shares with Tim Sandler and Mark Henerici. So, Nico Mensel leading, Bruce. Yeah, just to give you a recap, the timing screen at the moment will tell you that uh, Lesio Picariello is still leading the race, but unfortunately that was him inside the pit lane. His advantage was cut down to seven and a half seconds when he crossed the start-finish line, but obviously he'd already decelerated. So you're probably talking a, a dozen seconds was his advantage after that final round of pit stops, possibly minimum. But now he's back in third position overall, teammate Nico Mensel into the lead race and setting some very, very quick uh, times indeed. Oh, what might have been, but it was such a long wait, must have felt even longer, just waiting to find out what the punishment was. But eventually, um, for forcing another car off track, obviously uh, not something that will be forgiven uh, for Alessio Picariello and Martin Ragging. And we don't know actually um, who was at the wheel at the time. I think it was probably Picariello, um, in, just in terms of when that uh, initial message came up. It's cost them big time back into third, but uh, press on as you might. There are only 17 minutes remaining in this race. Four hours to play, four hours again tomorrow, so we'll uh, wait and see how that one unfolds. Hopefully the weather will be just as good. And certainly it's been a very fair, fair start. And there's every chance now of a grandstand finish if the top two can get close, close enough to one another, because the whole track is now clear of any incident and clear up that was taking place. Particularly, I talk about Tiergarten, well, the end of Dottinger Hall, Tiergarten itself, and Hohenrein, which has been affected by Code 60 and a significant chunk of it. But it does mean that you can now overtake if you get a good run through Antonius Bucher on the brakes into Tiergarten. So it could be a bit spicy in the closing stages if Lawrence Van Tor can get close enough to Mika Menzel. However, Menzel's just done the absolute best second sector time with a 103.1 he's charging like crazy potentially with a clear road in front of him of course now with Alessio Picariello delayed so Menzel no let up the gap between the four and the 911 Porsches at the start of the lap was six and a half seconds and it's still about the same actually as they are now in the long sector four part of the track just before the start of the race, I was just saying that, you know, some days, some weather conditions, you know, one manufacturer, tire manufacturer has an advantage at the end of the stint rather than the start. But today, you know, coolish, but sunny, bright, and certainly the Falcon Motorsport cars, their rubber seems very, very good at the end of the stint. That's why both of their drivers, uh, Lesio Picariello in second, Nico Menzel leading, have just set the fastest first, and uh, sorry, second and third sector times. So certainly looking very, very good indeed. But again, we just have to see where the traffic is going to lie, what incident might be up ahead of them, what car might drift across in their path. And that certainly just happened uh, for Frank Stippler, fourth place, still giving chase, and a driver in a, a car of a, a less high performance class has just moved into his path. And it just costs you that little bit of momentum, something you've been trying to build for a while. Momentum is everything around the, the Nordschleifer, and certainly there are very many points, most notably the hats and backs curves. If you get someone in front of you, there isn't space to pass them. Your momentum goes and then as the track opens out, all you can do is curse because you're not hitting it as fast as you had before. Another problem for a car in SP9, another punishment. A code 60 infringement uh, failed to manage code 60. So under investigation, car number seven, that's the Conrad Motorsport Danny Sufi, Torsten Kratz, Lamborghini. So possibly some punishment coming their way. So many things to look out for. And you do have to admire the performance of the uh, race officials here. We started with 114 cars. We've got 172 corners. Divide those accordingly. There's an awful lot of places and people to look at. Very good time. That time through for the dual motorsport Aston Martin, which is running in second position. And... Second position in the class. There's only 3.2 seconds between the two GT4 leaders, in fact. So Toyota Supra up against Aston Martin Vantage. 
3.2 seconds I make it at the start of this lap and Sandberg is pushing like crazy. And I've just noticed we're finally clear at that final sequence of corners. So I did we, say that. Oh, did you? Sorry, I must yeah. have had, I've been looking down at uh, how the car in 32nd position was going. I apologise <laughs> to you. I, That's you right. know, we seek the stories for you. We look here, we look there. Yeah, well, as I said, I, oh, I rather suggested that we might be code 60 till the end of the race there, but the track crews have done an incredibly good job to make it safe again. Whoa, significant those times are so much faster. There you go. They? Well, that's well, almost as a result of it, flat. isn't it? Eight minutes one for our new race leader, Nico Mental. Eight minutes uh, 1.2. That is for him. Eight minute, half a second faster. Eight minutes 0.7 seconds for Picariello in second place. Well, the, the point no, is slower. Sorry, that's of course. So the second place is the Manti car. Sorry, third place is, uh, is Picariello. Eight minutes, 18. That includes coming out of the pit lane. That's why his one is so much slower. The point I was making, though, about the clear-up having been completed is that now you can overtake into Tiergarten yeah. and Hohenrein, and we might be in a position to do that. The margins are still a bit too much at this stage as Arno Klassen has just gone quicker than the keeper Tess Audi has managed all race. Lots of absolute best times coming through. How about Jordan Pepper? Eight minutes, point zero. That's faster than anybody else in the Lamborghini Huracan. They just left it rather too late, trailing by nearly 70 seconds on the leader, Nico Mensor. You know, the drivers just have to take what's in front of them, but suddenly presented with uh, a track in perfect condition. Hopefully the cars are in perfect conditions. You know, every driver wants to show they can put in a really quick lap. Will we dip under eight minutes? I think we quite possibly could. How much time have we got left to do it? 13 minutes. So we've only effectively two more laps in which... Uh, they can manage that. We were debating whether we get to 28 laps. I think not, but maybe just. It could be with that final sequence of corners now being clear of uh, the track clear up there, the barrier repairs, the tire wall repairs. Um, now we're finally going to get some quick times in. Will it be enough to tip us onto an extra lap? Have the team put enough fuel in for an extra lap? That's always the thing. You don't want to be carrying extra fuel, but you want to be carrying enough. Yeah. And also, I worry for the teams in the other categories who cross the line just in front of the race leader and think, you're kidding me, we're going to go around all around again. Uh, when actually, I mean, the clever strategists in the pit lane, of which there are many, surely will be straight on the radio saying, the leaders on the dotting the whore behind you, just blend out of the throttle, let them by, because we can finish our race here and now, rather than having to go around for a further nearly 25 kilometres. Ralph Aron for the best lap in SP9 Pro-Am. So that team advan by HRT Mercedes that started... Um, well, started a little too early ahead of everybody else and had to take a drive through penalty because of that, but it's fought its way back to seventh position as now Nico Menzel, together with Joel Eriksson's efforts, take the number four Falcon Motorsport Porsche back onto the Nordschleifer itself. He is being caught hand over fist by Lawrence yes. Fantor. We're not trying to make artificial uh, drama here. The first two timing sectors, well, there's a second and a half has been gained by the chasing Manti EMA car. Just, uh, it's my fault. I'm saying, you know, today it just, they look good, but they've fallen away. What do I know, quite <laughs> frankly? So this is about how hard Nico Menzel wants to push in those into minds moments through traffic. Alessio Picariello has experienced plenty of them in his Falcon Motorsport Porsche. This is the sister car, remember, that hasn't actually spent much time out front. A lot of that uh, instead has been in the hands of the sister car and also um, we had a bit of time. No, I don't think the Grello car's actually ever led, has it? But the four car and the three car have taken turns in being in front. And Falcon now, it seems unlikely that they will get a 1-2 finish because of that late drive-through penalty for Picariello. But it only dropped him back to third. And he's now three seconds ahead of a truly revved up Frank Stippler. Stippler and Winkelhock, for entertainment value, uh, have certainly won awards in my mind this afternoon. It's just that the Audi's not been quite on the, the same performance level as the three Porsches ahead. But they've certainly been driving absolutely every inch uh, and every tenth of a second out of it through the course of this nearly four-hour race. We've only got 10 minutes to go. We will complete this lap and head on to one more, so that'll make it 27 laps in total. But how long can Nico Menzel comfortably stay in front? Because again, through the last sector, sector three, about a second eaten up by Lawrence Vantor, who is truly on a charge. 
Well, tight. Van Tor is absolutely making his Manti Porsche fly, but I sense uh, surely it's enough to start your penultimate lap with a, a six second advantage, but every single timing sector is coming down. And uh, I was looking to see if Alessio Picariello could match Lawrence Van Tor. Not quite. Lawrence is going a little bit faster. So three Porsches, first, second, and third. It's Falker Motorsport first and third. But the one in between, Mantai Motorsport, Lawrence Van Tor, really starting to find top form again. Will he have enough time in this race? Will he be begrudging the fact that there were a handful of laps with uh, no chance to go through the final sequence of corners at uh, the right sort of pace, the, the, the proper pace? But of course, it was the proper pace as an incident was being cleared up. And our race leader has just been a little bit obstructed. And uh, again, there is that element. Which way are they going in front of me? I'm a much faster. Co oh, no, he's coming into the middle of the track. Anyhow, so little advantage uh, being gained unless he's blocked to Lawrence Van Tour. Nico Menzel, cautious. But as you say, Johnny, how much caution do you want to have in the mix if you're trying to defend the lead of a race? And the clock is uh, ticking deep into uh, just seven and three-quarter minutes remaining until the, the flag could be waved. So this fourth and penultimate sector uh, began maybe about a minute ago, so it takes just over three minutes. They'll probably cross the line with four minutes and change left on the clock with a further eight minute lap to do. So we'll be slightly beyond time, but of course the checkered flag waits for the overall leader. And now just about in the same frame of our overhead camera from the helicopter are the two Porsches. So Menzel trying is de desperately to be out of that tight frame and Fantor wanting to be as close within it as possible as they now head into the swallow's tail, the second concreted section of the lap already through the Stefan Beloff S, therefore, and now heading for Galgenkopf on this, the penultimate lap. Uh, Vantor's not going to be anywhere close enough to pick up the toe from Nico Menzel's car, but it might be a different story in a lap's time if he continues to take this amount of time out of Menzel in the Falcon Motorsports car. So they're about the same speed, surely they are, with the same balance of performance for both Falcon and Manti down the long, long straight. And how much traffic is Nico Menzel going to encounter on this final tour of the first NLS race of the weekend? Also not very far away, a recovering Alessio Picariello, and then the headlights ablaze for Frank Stippler. So all four top four cars in the race occupy pretty much the same bit of asphalt on the Dottinger Hoor. The Dacia Logan is back. The Dacia Logan is passed by the car in second place. Manti EMA, the end of last lap, or the start of this lap, if you will. Just under 13 seconds from first. That's Nico Menzel to fourth. Frank Stipper, what's it going to be this time around? Uh, Menzel continues to lead the race. 4.1 seconds clear of Manti and Lawrence Van Tor. Third place, Alessio Picariello comes through. 9.7 seconds down and 11.8 seconds is first through to fourth place to Frank Stipper. He's two seconds down. Will these change? What's the one that's most likely to change? I think four seconds is a massive ask, but Lawrence Van Tour has got uh, 25 kilometers to see what sort of speed he can find. He's just done another lap in uh, below eight minutes and two seconds. He was the fastest in the top four last time around, so he's closing in. I think he's just not going to... I can't say that. I just In your heart of hearts, you think he surely cannot gain that time because these cars and these drivers are so well matched but then you have to go it's the Nordschleifer it's 25 kilometers there are slower class cars that could obstruct them one little bit of of un unintentional blocking through let's say hats and back and it mm. cost you one two seconds then a further incident around the track and hey presto and don't forget that this number four car was gifted a second uh, sorry an advantage of seven seconds remember it came up towards the end of the lap and then got three cars as it came into a slow newly created slow zone between itself and the chasing Manti car and that is why the advantage is still in Mensal's hands it was Joel Erickson at the wheel at the time. He took those gifts, said, thank you very much. The pit stop, the final pit stop was coming up soon. He banked those seven seconds and he's still living off them now. So 4.1, the difference between Menzel and Van Tor as they cross the line. And far less than a lap time still on the clock as they did so. So on to lap 27 and the final tour 
for Mensal Vantor. Picariello, 5.5 adrift of Vantor. And the gap third to fourth is 2.1 seconds. That's possibly the one that's more likely to change, but it's all on Stippler to at least stick with Picariello and then maybe pick him off at the end of the lap. But I think Vantor's got to now drive the, the lap of his life and he'll get one stab at it, basically, getting a good run out of Galkenkopf and down the Dottinger Hall to see if he can pick up the toe on the Mensal Porsche. He'll need to be within two seconds. Maybe even that's a, a bit too hopeful. Certainly one and a half seconds to then all of a sudden gain a lot more kilometres per hour as he's sucked along by Nico Mensel's car. And then it's a question of whether Mensel will provide in the track space. He may not be able to hold Van Tor back, but there's lots of ifs in that sentence. As yep. now Ralph Aron crosses the line again with a good time within the Pro-Am subcategory. It's 802.3 for the Mercedes that is in behind the sister car at HRT. So Danny Juncker there starting with much promise in today's race from pole position, but they're looking like a a sixth and a seventh place finish will be the best they, they can muster. As the race leader is now at Adenau Forest for the 27th time. He's just lost a little bit more momentum behind a back marker. And I was just thinking about Lawrence Van Tour. Of course he likes the challenge of trying to haul back four seconds in a lap. But you know why it's important? He's got a chat show with his brother that he's got to get bragging rights. It's a very feisty a little podcast they have. They've certainly become very entertaining indeed. But, you know, older brother needs some advantage sometimes. So that's what Lawrence is racing for right now. Not just the glory, it's the bragging rights. Yeah, well, they had uh, a, a sort of bragging right argument here at this venue, did they not? Into Didn't Tiergarten they? a few years ago when they arrived door handle to door handle. And uh, Lawrence Van Tor very much coming off worse in that in the Manti Porsche with Dries apologetic afterwards, but I bet he was sort of fist bumping the, the air as the moment was taking place, well, as long as Lawrence was okay, which thankfully he was. Now, oh. what's happening here with the, with one of the, is that the three? It's the three car of Alessio Picariello. Now, I feared that when the car came in for a pit stop uh, a little while ago that there was a slow puncture on the car. In fact, that was a drive-through penalty, but this time the three is genuinely going slowly, and surely Stippler is already through because he was only two seconds away anyway and had taken time out of this number three car. The timing is just absolutely atrocious for this to happen on the final lap. Well, at this, at this, this abated pace, that'll be third place gone. Tick, that's Frank Stipp having gone through. And fourth place as well, because uh, Jordan Pepper, who's been flying, even though he was about a minute in arrears, will, will surely overhaul him before the end of the lap. So, for Falcon Motorsport, thank goodness they had two cars in this race. They've got number four leading the race, and number three still circulating, but can we see anything wrong with the car? The answer is no, but it's now being pulled off to the edge of the circuit. It will not finish the race. So Alessio Picariello has worked out that something is not going to get him back to the pits and it's not worth taking the chance. And he's parked it off the circuit outside the white line. Yeah, it's uh, the second entry point at Brightshire, the lowest point of the circuit, just after the road bridge there. And what a peculiar incident this is and horrendous luck. I mean, they were leading the race, remember, and because they were pitting a lap later than everybody else, it seemed that they had a huge advantage to be able to easily win this race. Then there was the drive-through penalty finally attributed because of some contact with another car. And now this has happened. It didn't, it didn't seem to be down on one particular side, but if it's a slow puncture, then they, they can be difficult to pick up. And of course, the, the sensors will be going crazy inside the car and no doubt on the pit wall as well. So whether that was a message to Picariello to say, slow down, or whether it's actually a drivetrain related problem, so difficult to tell from this distance, but they're out of the race. And all of a sudden, Frank Stippler, who was hoping for a podium, looking like he will finish at least third, probably no better than that in fairness, but Shearer Sport gain third place as a result of Picariello's travails. Yeah, well, it, it stopped it being a Porsche one, two and three. At the moment, it's going to be first and second. Which order will it be? Will it still be number four? Nico Menzel for Falker Motorsport, who actually, having had a car that could have won, won the race, the sister car, drop back with that uh, drive through penalty now with a problem thank goodness they're at the front of the field for the falcon crew but uh, manti ema <sighs> no the opening part of the, every, the first the second and the third timing sectors on this lap it's all gone the way of falcon motorsport at least mm. for their number four 
uh, said Manta EMA, we did wonder if that 4.1 second margin could be uh, cut back by Lawrence Van Tour. It's not going to be so. But uh, how fickle everything can be. Now, let's look at my screen. Uh, the car that's going faster and faster is the Glickenhaus. It's just moved up uh, from 13th to 12th to 11th. Lance David Arnold's just set the fastest lap for that car, 8 minutes 10. Forker Motorsport, it's a, a garage of two sides, and it's the number four side that's smiling, because their car is leading. Nico Menzel taking it through to the finish of this race, the opening round of the NLS for 2024. The number three car, the car that looks as though it had everything in its bag until that drive through penalty, and now, until whatever made it pull off, is parked at the side of the circuit. I really think that actually at that point, uh, Nessu Picariello was just looking for the gap in the barriers, the first place he could uh, pull it off and park it. Because as you said, Johnny, the, and when I looked at it, I thought that car is four square on the track, it's not locked down on one side, but uh, who's to know? Maybe a tuppenny thruppenny bit that's uh, just gone on the car. Yeah, can often be the case. Um, we had the change, by the way, in SP10 because Sandberg's got ahead of Andreas Goulden. So Aston Martin, with just a few laps to spare, squeeze ahead of Toyota Supra. There's going to be no change in Cup 2. It looks like Nico Otto by three seconds over David Yard. But SP9 Pro and the overall win will go to Falcon Motorsports and Nico Menzel in the number four car with his teammate Joel Eriksson. Perhaps not the Falcon car we expected to win after the final set of pit stops because Alessio Picariello and Martin Raginger were so well placed because of their slightly off strategy or off kilter strategy pit stop visits and it waved them into something like a 20 second lead but then that disappeared almost as quickly as it had arrived with a drive through penalty and then retirement for the Belgian Austrian combination. So it'll be a non-finish for Porsche number three but on the flip side, Falcon still win with their number four car from Manti EMA in the number 911 Porsche to Lawrence Vantor and Kevin Estra reached the podium in the second step. And Frank Stippler, along with his teammate Marcus Winkelhock, will finish third for Shera Sport PHX to at least break some of the stranglehold that this uh, race has had around with Porsche and their 911 GT3Rs. It could have so easily have been a 1-2-3 finish for that manufacturer but Audi squeaking on there Picariello still shown fourth but of course he won't finish there and the Lamborghini Huracan of Jordan Pepper will finish fourth instead driving with Kelvin van der Linde yeah he's uh, nearly another 50 or well, just over 50 seconds back behind Stippler but again showed decent pace but uh, the number three Porsche sitting pretty in third place was the contact because uh, suddenly the car slowed can't tell you why as yet but uh Certainly, at various oh, Stippler's points already race. passed before the problem hit, and there was more contact between those two cars. That's not the first time the three and the 16 have come to blows, and it feels as if, as a result of that, that's what made Picariello limp away from the scene. Yeah, I thought it was a different moment. We'd seen it from a different angle. It was two side-by-sides. Remember, going at effectively just beyond hats and back, they were waiting for a restart, two side-by-sides, side, and it does seem as though it's been a slow puncture. If we try and join the dots on that one, eventually on the final lap, halfway round the final lap, there was uh, the number three car pulled off. And as we speak up on screen, incident between three and number 16 under investigation. So perhaps for Shearer Sport PHX, they may not be holding on to that third place. At the moment, they're there. And if anyone's going to get promoted, it'll be number 27. So we could have Porsche, Porsche, Lamborghini as the top three. We're not there yet. But what we can tell you is it's Porsche 1-2 with the number four. Falcon Motorsport car brought home by Nico Menzel. Shared with Joel Erickson. Taking victory by 3.6 seconds from uh, Lawrence Van Tour in the Manthai EMA number 9-11, which he uh, had started by Kevin Estra. So... Uh, Interest of plenty. We had the split tactics, but with the removal of car number three, first by the drive through penalty and then by possibly a slow punch that pulled it off. The car that looks that it had victory in the palm of its hand does not, but at least for Falcon Motorsport, the sister car did and took victory. So we. I'm just trying to chase back to exactly what happened in Cup 2. Just hearing that some of the leaders have, have stopped what, on the racetrack. Well, there's bodywork missing the, the front right-hand corner of one of the challenges in the Avia WNS Motorsport Porsche has certainly had contact, unless my eyes have just got so tired after four hours of fabulous battling that uh, I can't quite see straight. But it looks like that's had a little bit of a, a tattered front on it. So it's Nico Otto at the wheel of that. Well, we, we called them through the 
third sector uh, with roughly the same sort of times from both Nico Otto and David Yarn. <coughs> Tobias Muller's not really close enough to be involved in the number 148, but it's the 100 and the 120 cars that are the ones that are potentially concerning us. I don't think they've reached a point around the track yet to have tripped the beam at the end of sector four, because that is at the start of the Dottinger Hoor, isn't it? And they're much further back on the lap, in fact. Still waiting for the result in SP10. No, we can call that now because they were a couple of laps behind the overall winners. So it is Door Motorsport and, and every credit to that final stint from Oscar Sandberg. It's the Aston Martin he shares with Aaron uh, Venish and Nick Wustenhagen and they eventually got ahead of the 170 Toyo Tyres Supra for Andreas Goulden who was doing the final stint, Tim Sandler and Mark Henerici. But there's definitely been a... Is that Otto now ahead? Or is, was that the order that they started this lap in anyway? That's the Nico Otto car, the white, gold and black machine. David Yarn is behind. Yeah, OK. So that is still the same order that they crossed the line in. But Yarn is catching out of the fist. He's half a car length behind. And looking for a way by, but Nico Otto not falling for David Yarn's antics. Certainly the Arvia WNS Motorsport Porsche has been ahead at times. The first few stints were led by the, uh, the white red and black car but it's the one with the central gold band that now leads the max cruiser racing livery number 100 porsche 316.2 is a decent time in cup two for the fourth sector and otto's just gone through there now and about to head onto the dotting for the final time Actually, 316 was from uh, Balkan in the Pro Sport. Aston Martin was still waiting, therefore, for the sector times and the splits to come through. There it is, 312.8 for Otto and a 311.4. So, again, more time taken out by David Yard. And is Yard close enough to the Cup 2 race leader? to be able to be sucked along. He's certainly gaining a lot of pace here. This is for the race lead and potentially the race win. Thank goodness we've now got green flags into Tiergarten because around the outside for Arvia WNS Motorsport, it's going to be virtually a last corner overtake. They're not yet into the braking area for Tiergarten. Now they slow and Nico Otto could do very little about that. Otto trying on the inside and he's taking him out. He takes him out into Tiergarten, a do or die manoeuvre for from Otto, and that will spin the Arvia car into the barrier. Poor old David Yarn, who played it perfectly to that point, and then that was absolute desperation from Nico Otto to try and hustle the race lead back again. Cru Max Cruiser racing and Nico Otto, very naughty indeed there. Surely that will not be allowed to stand. But the sorry thing for David Yarn and for Arvia WNS Motorsport, they're not even going to finish second now because everybody else will sweep through. He's found reverse, and this is a bit of a dangerous thing to be doing, but the double wave yellows will hopefully warn anybody else about to head through Hohen Rhine to do so. And the cut two finishing order, we're still trying to get confirmation of that. Yeah, Tobias Muller's gone through into second. That might be the race win, of course, if Otto is docked places, and David Yard will finish in third position on the road. Unless my memory escapes me, I think Nico Otto was already under a warning for behaviour from his first stint. I might have imagined it, but I don't think I have in this instance. And uh, I thought the front of uh, David Yard's Avia car was damaged before. It was actually just the effect of uh, the fact he's got a... It looks like the corner of one of the front wings is missing. It's just because it's in black. Still talking about what went out on the track is Falker Motorsport and Frank Stibler, who was obviously uh, involved in the thick of the battle at the tail of that, that event. And, of course, we ended up with uh, the number three car that possibly... Well, we know it had contact, side-by-side uh, -side contact with the number 16 Shearer Sport PHX Audi, but we also know the Audi finished in third place and the number three Porsche didn't finish at all. Nico Menzel, though, we can tell you is the winner of this race, and he's down with Lucas Gajewski for a quick interview at the finish. Also just noting that that uh, contact between Picariello and Frank Stippler is unsurprisingly under investigation. That happened at Schwedenkreuz, and I think there were possibly two points of contact there. So that will be investigated from all possible angles. Again, that doesn't help 
uh, Picariello and Martin Ragginger's cause, but it might well affect who finishes third in this race because at the moment it's the Audi number 16 of Frank Stippler and Marcus Winkelhock. But if they are penalised once that incident is checked again, um, then it'll be Jordan Pepper for Red Bull team at two will be promoted to the podium. But of course, just because Picariello couldn't finish the race, that doesn't mean he wasn't the one in the wrong, if you know what I mean. No, entirely. But, and, and we've only, you and I have only had to, been treated to one view of it, which was actually from the camera on board Picariello's car. Need to really see what Frank Stippler uh, saw in that whole situation. And ideally, race control will look at cameras externally as well to try and attribute if there is any blame, it might be called a racing, racing incident, of course, but it is just simply under investigation as we speak. It doesn't sound like a particularly early night for those in race direction, and there's another race to look forward to tomorrow, of course. Yes, I was about to joke there. They could put the to take the tops back off their pens and get their notepads back out. Certainly, that isn't the only incident under investigation. An incident late in the race between uh, a couple of cars in Cup 2, 119 and 124 under investigation, and still other people <laughs> being done for speeding in the pit lane and uh, many, many more. But if you think how many uh, reports you can have in the field of 24 cars. We had 114. Let's just hear from Joel Eriksson. And uh, obviously, we maybe not fight for the ultimate win in the in the championship, but uh, the, I mean the main focus is the 24. But I mean to kick off the season like this with a win, it's, there's nothing more to to be said and to be done. So um, yeah, the car was flying today, and Nico did a, did a great job as well on track. So um, yeah, he just had a great package today, and and also to to score the fourth win here is uh, yeah, it's amazing. Really happy. Enjoy the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel and Nico. Joel, or Joel Eriksson, and his teammate Nico Menzel. Perhaps a slightly surprising win for those two drivers, but they were absolutely hard at it throughout with the hope that the race would come to them, and that's precisely what happened in the end. And Lucas Gajewski in a moment or two will also be chatting to Kevin Estra and to Laurence Vantor. Estra's German is exemplary, so uh, this will all be in the, the home language of the Nürburgring. Not sure about Laurence Vantor. Surely he speaks German as well. Being Belgian, there's be, be a Germanic element to that. No. We'll wait and see. Yeah. Because it'd be nice to hear from Laurence. Uh, it was certainly an eventful race for him as well. Let's just dive in to hear what language his questions being asked. I think that is German. It is German, isn't it? Yeah, fine. So we won't get uh, the thoughts of Laurence Van Tour. He's um, smiling. We can tell him he's smiling. Well, OK. Well, I, maybe that's just about the best that they could have managed today. We always know Manti turn up with a quick car, but it didn't seem to be quite as quick as the two Falcon machines. Yeah, but I think that I think they gambled. They took that pit stop a lap earlier than they could have done. That could have given them the, the sort of 20-second buffer at the final pit stop. But they de decided track position was key. They had yeah. to get ahead of the Shearer Sport Audi. So they might be slightly rueful. Had they not jumped at that point, had they not lost seven seconds that was gifted to the number four car that went on to win for Falcon Motorsport, they'd done enough. So they pitted at the end of seven laps. They pitted at the end of 14 laps. And then I thought, fully expected them to fit pit at the end of 21 laps, but they pushed it to 22. And like you say, that might have been the pivot point because they come in a lap earlier. You you save, what did we say? 24 seconds? 21 seconds. 21 24 seconds, later in the race. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and if puts and maybes now... But it was interesting to me that Manti would, you know, they went very different to try and um, misstep, offstep the Audi and then didn't continue that on through the race. And they almost got sucked into the race when they were stuck in traffic as well. It would have been wiser, surely, to get them out of that and try and return them to the racetrack in clear air, unless they worked out it was going to be even busier by the time the Porsche rejoined the racetrack. Yeah. I don't know. They, they came in from fourth. They could have uh, continued on for another lap and then come in from second and I think merged back in second. But, uh, you know, Manti has the experience. They decided that was the right thing. Mm -hmm. No weather effect today. So, again, that simplifies your your hand. But it's still just so many choices you can potentially make. But I think that's one that got away from Manti. But then again, you think how many races they've won over the years. So it comes good sometimes. Today, not for them. Today, Falcon Motorsport could have had a one-two, got a victory. and still waiting to find out what exactly happened. No further action. Con uh, the incident between 3 and 16, that's the, uh, just heard from Frank Stippler, who's driving the number 16 Audi. Uh, so he's all smiles. So is his teammate, Marcus Finkelhock. But uh, for number 3, uh, Porsche for Falcon Motorsport, could have won the race, didn't win the race, will have to be towed back to the pits. So uh, 
happy on one side of the camp, not on the other. But no further action. So, uh, as you were, and for Jordan Pepper, don't head for the podium. You are not yes. being promoted to third place. It certainly seems that way, uh, but there are still many talking points, including what happened at the sharp end of Cup 2 for the final run through Tiergarten on that closing lap. And that, I'm sure, will be investigated for a few more hours yet. And they'll want to, in race direction, get the viewpoints of both Nico Otto and uh, the other driver involved. David Yarn. Uh, David Yarn, thank you, who was left stranded. Uh, off on the grass there. Having just got himself into the lead. Uh, yeah. that, that slipstream down along the dotting of her. Job done. Got a full car length and a half. Pulled across in front. That was fine. But then diving up the inside into the penultimate corner, unfortunately, I think Nick Awata got a little bit greedy there. So that is it for the first of two Nürburgring Langstrecken series races of the weekend. The ADAC ACAS Cup is in the books, but tomorrow we can look forward to the 63rd edition of the ADAC. Reinoldus, Langstrecken, Renan, it's the same timetable pretty much. So we're on air at 11.15 local time for a midday start, four hours through till four o'clock. And if today is anything to go by, you'll want to hurry back to get more of NLS for 2024. We'll see you then.